everything is bigger in Texas, and that is certainly the case here in Austin as the biggest collection of the strongest and fittest athletes in the world are set to showcase their talents over the next three days. Welcome to the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Dread it, run from it, destiny arrives all the same. Diamond in Round Rock, Texas is usually the home of the Round Rock Express, the AAA affiliate of the Texas Rangers. The bases are gone, the infield dirt has been covered, and this venue has been transformed to showcase the strongest and the fittest athletes on the planet. The Wheel of Pain is here, the Zeus Ring is here, there's even a hill out in center field. Thanks for joining us today, everybody, here on the Iron Game. I am Sean Woodland. It's going to be a fun three days here just outside of Austin, Texas, as we showcase the best in the sport of strongman and the best in the sport of CrossFit. Here's what is on tap for you over the next three days of competition. The strongman will face five events on Friday and on Saturday. The CrossFit athletes will face seven events over three days, and we also have the road record breakers and the legend competitions taking place as well. Being joined on the desk now by Dr. Bill Crawford, China Cho, and Pat Sherwood. There is so much going on over the next three days, it's hard to pick just one thing, so I'm not going to do that. I will make you three do that. We'll start with you, Dr. Bill. What are you the most excited to see here over this weekend? This is a really stacked field, and we've got the last three World Strongest Man winners here. I'm really excited. China, what about you? I'm excited about a lot of things, but watching the Legends competition, they are some of the most iconic athletes in our sport, and they're going to put on a show. I've never been in the same physical location as the Strongmen. They are massive. I can't wait to see them do what they do. But for the CrossFit side of the house, Vellner versus Maderos, for sure. Yeah, we'll have more on that in just a second. But we have two events for the Strongmen today, two events for the CrossFit, CrossFit athletes, pardon me. And the Strongmen will kick things off with one of the best events to watch in the Strongmen competition. That is the Rogue Elephant Bar Max Deadlift. That's the kids going in about an hour. The CrossFit athletes take over after that. They will have the Go Ruck event, and then the Legends will be on the field. We'll have the road record breakers, and then the Strongmen conclude their day of competition with the Sear Bell Ladder, and then the CrossFit athletes at 7.05 Central Time with the Bella Complex. It's been a while since we have been able to talk about Strongmen with our audience. What's the biggest story for that competition coming in here to the Rogue Invitational? Well, that's one of them. It's just been a long layoff. Some athletes have been able to be cons uh, consistently busy this past year. I think that this is something that's going to affect the, several of the athletes. But also, this is the first time that the Strongmen have been in the Rogue Invitational. So how do they respond to that format? And I think another story that's looming in the background is injuries. Injuries may have, a have an effect on the results. Talk more about that later in the show. But let's turn our attention now to the CrossFit side of things. Pat, you mentioned you know, the Vellner Maderos matchup that people will get to see here. I think that's going to have uh, the undivided attention of all the fans. It, it certainly has mine, no doubt about it. So, Pat Vellner is an amazing athlete. He's the, the defending champion from the 2020 Rogue Invitational. This is his third appearance at a Rogue Invitational. He is one of the best in the sport. And he's one of the individuals also that on the men's side of the house at the CrossFit Games is always talked about somebody who should win, but he's fallen just a bit short. Justin Medeiros, at 22 years old, is the current reigning fittest man on earth from the Games. He's podiumed every time that he's been there, but this is his first appearance at the Rogue Invitational, so it's Vellner's territory. Over on the women's side, this is another chance for us to watch just the dominance that has been Tia Toomey. Yes, she is the champ. She is the two times Rogue Invitational champ. She is fresh off a CrossFit Games win, her fifth if you're actually keeping count. And she is here to add another win to her already impressive resume. If you've never seen her compete live, huh, you're in for a treat. Now, Tia Toomey has dominated the women's side of the CrossFit competition for the last five years. She is the two-time defending Rogue Invitational champion, and she is the five-time fittest woman on earth. She is as close to a sure thing as you can possibly have in all of sports. And when she is in the field, the rest of the competitors know they're gunning for second place. 
Dominance defined, history made, legacy left for the fifth straight time. Tia Toomey is the fittest woman on earth. I believe that it's inevitable that I'm always going to be stronger than what I was the previous year. I'm always going to be fitter. The undisputed champ Tia Toomey is back as she looks to defend her Rogue Invitational win from last year. One rep to go for Toomey, and that'll do it. 100 points to start the competition. Toomey is done, and she will win the 2020 Rogue Invitational. Her third event win in a row. Tia Toomey, who so far has made this competition look easy. I think what's significantly changed is the confidence in my ability and, and how much I'm capable of doing certain things now. Tia Toomey looking to be the fifth woman to move past 190. Yeah. She will make that. It is incredible what we are seeing right now. Tia has been competing with herself since the very first event. Tia Toomey has put together one impressive resume during her career, not only with what she's accomplished on the competition floor in CrossFit, but she's also a former summer Olympian and now on track to compete on the Australian bobsled team in the Winter Olympics. Welcome Chase Ingram to the desk now and Chase will be providing live commentary for us during the CrossFit competition and it's rare in any sport to find someone who is great at that sport but also really good at other stuff as well. Think about it in three different things. You have the CrossFit Games which is nearly impossible to get to let alone win five times and get second twice mind you. That wasn't even on the ground. Right. <laughs> to compete at the Summer Olympics which athletes spend a lifetime doing. Possibly going to compete in the Winter Olympics in a space of just seven years. This is unbelievable. Tia Toomey may be one of the best athletes we've seen in sports. Yeah, she's an absolute weapon. Yeah. And Tia does get a lot of the attention whenever she's at a CrossFit competition, and rightfully so. But let's not forget, this is one of the most talented fields in the competition that we have seen. There are also three other fittest women on earth who are here in the field. You have Annie Thoris' daughter and Katherine Davis' daughter, who have both won the CrossFit Games two times. Sam Briggs, she was the fittest woman on earth in 2013. All of the top 10 finishers from the CrossFit Games back in August are here, as well as two of the top five finishers from the 2020 Rogue Invitational. That's Tia Toomey and Laura Horvath. And speaking of Laura Horvath, she regained some momentum with her second place finish at the game. She's done very well here at the Rogue Invitational, looking to continue that now uh, in the 2021 edition of the Rogue Invitational. Yeah, she is a two-time Rogue Invitational competitor. She finished 19th in 2020 and fifth, or 19th in 2019 and fifth in 2020. She's looking to get on the podium at this Invitational, and I think she has a really good shot at it. She's been training with 2015 CrossFit Games men champ Ben Smith, and she's riding high from her second place finish at the CrossFit Games. I think the workouts this weekend suit her very well, and I'm excited to see what she can do. Annie Thoris' daughter, we mentioned her, she's in the field, and she finished a third the last time we saw her on the competition floor. And given what she's been through this entire year, I think it's safe to say what she did in Madison may have been the most impressive thing that we saw at the games. Hands down, she is an incredible athlete and an icon of the sport. So this will be her second appearance at the Rogue Invitational. She took third back in 2019. We didn't see her last year, as you kind of alluded to, because in 2020, she had a baby girl born in August and following her on social media, it appeared to be a, a challenging pregnancy in delivery, one that would, you'd be happy just to come back from. But she didn't just come back, she qualified for the CrossFit Games, goes there and just doesn't do well. She podiums again. She's phenomenal. That was her 11th appearance at the CrossFit Games. She's a two-time former champion. And so when she is on the field, she is always dangerous. And Annie Thoris' daughter has competed at the CrossFit Games in three different Unbelievable. decades. That is mind-blowing <laughs> to think yes. about. She is one of the veterans of the sport, but there is a new guard coming up behind her, and three of them are here in the women's field. You have Mal O'Brien, 
Emma Carey, and Haley Adams. O'Brien and Carey are just 17. Haley Adams is 20. They have already put up some pretty incredible performances in this past CrossFit Games season. Now the question is, when can they take the next step? When will they be ready to maybe push Tia Toomey or just push for one of those top spots? Honestly, I think Haley has already proven herself multiple times. She's had three consecutive individual appearances at the CrossFit Games, and she's always finished inside the top six. Before that, she was a three-time team competitor, so she's no unknown in this situation. She hasn't beat Tia in an event yet, but that doesn't mean that couldn't happen this weekend. I think she is going to push her all weekend, and it's going to be great. Let me preface what I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> All of these young women are incredible. Haley, Emma, Mal, for sure. But, but getting back to your original question, Sean, if they're going to push Tia, yes, sometime in the future. This weekend, no, sir. I, I don't believe so. They're amazing, but Tia, I believe, is right now in a league of her own. Absolutely. And uh, Tia actually mentioned this on uh, her social media a couple weeks ago about what her legacy is with the athletes of the sport currently, and especially with the new guard coming in. And you look at Mal O'Brien and Emma Carey, who have beaten Tia Toomey in an event at the mm -hmm. CrossFit Games and won to an event, actually, as event number four uh, last year. But I think it's not necessarily these athletes pushing Tia because I'm with Pat. That's impossible. It's not going to happen. But what she is actually doing is the opposite. She is pushing this younger generation of athletes to be better, showcasing what it takes to be the best. And I feel like that's going to be very influential for the new athletes we have coming into the sport. We're seeing the next generation right. before our eyes. We used to say, well, you know, people who were, we watched compete got into CrossFit in their 20s, in their early 30s, whatever it happened to be. Now, we're like, well, imagine when the kids start, when somebody started <laughs> at, at 10 or 12. Well, that's what happened with Emma, Emma yeah. and Mel. So they are the future, without question. Yeah, and one of these youngsters may one day fill the shoes of another very accomplished American CrossFit athlete, and that's Carrie Pierce, a seven-time games qualifier, is calling it a career. She made that announcement uh, last week on social media. She finished on the CrossFit Games podium in 2020, ending a long drought for American women as far as the podium is concerned, and she had some very incredible performances during her career, and she's hoping to come up with one more here in her final competition at the Rogue Invitational. Unbelievable for Carrie Pierce, who looks like she's going to do this unbroken. Carrie Pierce, that's what you want to see when you have proficiency in a particular move. Anytime you're an athlete and you're a competitor, you want to be the best that you can be, and ultimately making the podium was a big box for me to check. I think just last year took a lot out of me mentally, emotionally, everything, and it ended on such a high that I was like, I'm good with what I've done in the sport. Congratulations to Carrie Pierce. Carrie is the first American woman to podium since 2014. It was it was a hard decision, um, especially not being able to compete at the CrossFit Games. But the more I sat and thought about it, I'm like, the Rogue Invitational is just such a special event. It's going to have the top athletes. It'll be amazing to get out on the floor one last time. And just for me to have closure for my CrossFit career. And I'm ready for the next chapter of my life. Glad we get to give Carrie Pierce a send off that she deserves. I, I will ask another question that might be a little easier to answer than the last one. Is she the greatest American female crossfitter of all time? That is a, a kind and gentle question. And for me, it's an easy yes. She's Same. amazing. She's going to leave a void in, in the sport. And you, I mean, after six appearances at the games, five top 10 finishes. That hands down is unbelievable. It's, it's an easy yes, but I feel like it's not a casual yes. Absolutely. Because think of the other athletes she has in the, the running for greatest female. Like we have the legends, Annie Sakamoto's, the Becca Voigt's, the right. Val Volberl's, the Chris Fouché. Clevers, Julie Fouché. Yep. We're going to see some of these athletes competing later on this weekend, but it's, it's not a casual yes. What she has done in her career as the greatest American female crossfitter, I think, is, is no question. But it, it's not as, as simple as just... Yes, mm -hmm, for sure. And what's so awesome is she's so sweet and humble and unassuming, I mean, until you have to compete with her. <laughs> and then she just lays Different a whooping story. on you. Yeah. I know that firsthand multiple times that's <laughs> happened to me. So she's amazing. Yeah, and some people forget that when she first showed up at the games in 2015, she only had six months of experience under her belt. That's not fair. No, not that, fair is, that is, uh, what is what would you say? It's a, a, a 
offensive enough to be criminal? Yes, yeah, some people are just born different. She's one of them. Mm -hmm. well, let's go over to the men's side of the competition where Pat Vellner returns to defend his championship. He is the defending Rogue Invitational champion. He is also a three-time Rogue Invitational competitor. He's not only looking to defend his title, but he's also looking to get a second crack at the man who beat him the last time that we were at a competition, and that is Justin Medeiros. Get to the sandbag before anyone else is even off the ski. Pat Velder is looking to gain some ground. We've been talking the past couple of days that a couple things that Pat Vellner tends to not like are nowhere in sight here in Texas. No, and then, you know, Pat Vellner is the king of the north, but what he is not is Aquaman. And there are no <laughs> large bodies of water to derail him. And there's no Matt Fraser, which yeah. basically was his competition kryptonite. And he is the reigning 2020 uh, Rogue Invitational champion. He got second to Justin Medeiros last year because of a slip up in event number one. But now you put him in a scene that has you know, classic events, very different tests across the board, things that he excels at, plus a little redemption factor from the CrossFit Games in, in 2021. I'm very excited to see what Vellner comes into this competition with, with that chip on his shoulder, but chasing the carrot that is Justin Medeiros. Absolutely, and, and Medeiros is not gonna make it easy, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, and Medeiros is a guy who's coming off that big win at the at CrossFit Games, just 20, two years old he seems to be poised to be you know the next guy in this sport uh, all the talk is about Medeiros right now I mean again 22 years young so he's about a decade younger than Vellner who is an amazing tremendous athlete and as you mentioned you know if he didn't have a slip up we might be talking about Vellner as the reigning fittest man on earth but that's not what happened so <laughs> We've got Justin Medeiros with the gold medal around his neck from the games last year. And I was very curious to see how he would do because his initial appearance in 2020 as a rookie, third place, amazing. But did you want to know some people focus and some people fold under pressure? What would happen the next year? Could he back it up? Bang, gold medal. But this is his first appearance at a Rogue Invitational. A lot of eyes on him, but he's strong, he's fit, he's hungry, and he can do it. Yeah, a lot of people will be watching those two, Justin Medeiros and Pat Vellner. But let's remember there are 18 other very fit, very talented individuals here at the Rogue Invitational. Seven of the top 10 finishers from the CrossFit Games are here. And four of the top five from last year's Rogue Invitational that was held virtually. Ben Smith is also here. He was crowned the fittest man on earth in 2015. And a lot of talented veterans in the sport like Travis Mayer, Cole Sager, and then South Africa's Jason Smith. There's also a guy that exploded onto the scene, I think, uh, at the last CrossFit Games. That's Kim Hayeros out of Brazil. I know they're very excited about him in South America. He is a blast to watch. Yes, he is. And even though this is his first Rogue Invitational appearance, he is no stranger to competition. He's qualified for the Games three times, twice as an individual and once as a teen athlete. He's only 21 years old, making him the youngest guy in this field this weekend. Um, he had a great finish this year, took seventh, and he's definitely taking the right step to keep climbing up that leaderboard. He just moved from Brazil to Cookville, Tennessee. And if you know anything about <laughs> Cookville, Tennessee, you know that he now has training partners in Mr. Rich Froning and Haley Adams. But on top of all of that, he has the entire Mayhem Nation standing behind his back. I know what that feels like. I was a part of Team Mayhem Freedom, and that is electric. He is definitely in good hands. Yeah, he is a fan favorite, especially down in South America. Another fan favorite 
favorite. I know people are looking forward to watching us here, and that's Chandler Smith. Oh, absolutely. You said this is Guy's first Rogue Invitational. This is Chandler Smith's third Rogue Invitational. In fact, this was the event that gave him his first individual bid to the games back in 2019. He had a phenomenal performance there in Columbus, Ohio. Did well in the virtual version back in 2020. And for Chandler, he's one of those athletes that he, if he's comfortable and he's confident, he's a very, very dangerous competitor. Being familiar with his competition, being confident coming in with maybe the events that he has laying in, for, uh, in front of him, I think this could be a very good event or good three days of competition for Chandler Smith. Saxon Panchik is here, but his older brother is not. Of course, Scott Panchik, who's been a fixture in this sport since 2012, has called it the career of the CrossFit Games. That was his last competition. We had that conversation about Carrie Pierce, about being you know, the best American female, but Scott Panchik has got to at least be in the conversation for one of the best Americans of all time. With Without a doubt, and a former Rogue Invitational competitor himself, but Scott went to the games nine times as a competitor. He had four top five finishes, and in those nine appearances, he never finished worse than 11th. He was amazingly consistent, just hung out in the top 10. In 2021, he won the spirit of the games, and quite frankly, for good reason. He's most likely going to beat you if you're going head to head against him, but he'll be doing it with a smile. He'll help you up afterwards, give you his last sip of water. He is one of the kindest, most genuine competitors out there. He's got a, a new baby girl, so I think you know the future is bright for him, but Scott will absolutely be missed. Yeah, we will talk more about the CrossFit competition later on in the show, but coming up next, Dr. Bill Crawford and former Europe's strongest man, Lawrence Chalet, will join me to get you ready for what we're going to see in the strongman competition. Nisakov just incredibly fast there. Always with that incredible speed. Just a little beyond what he can do. Oh no! That is just extraordinary. Here comes the big man, the albatross, Tom Stolman. Pain, one of the most impressive implements ever built for strongman competition awaits. As this is the first time at the Rogue Invitational, we have had the strongman athletes and we are looking forward to seeing them kick things off with the one rep max elephant bar deadlift. More on that in a second, but this is what has taken place since we last talked to you here on the Iron Game about the strongman world. We've had two world strongest man competitions, Alexei Novikov and Tom Stoltman both won those, and then also two Shaw Classics, Brian Shaw winning the first and Trey Mitchell winning the second. Joined now on the desk by Dr. Bill Crawford and former Europe's strongest man, Lawrence Chalet. Bill, Who's had the best year so far coming into the 2021 Rogue Invitational? That would be Alexei Novikov. He's been very consistent in international competition. He took that momentum from the 2020 World's Strongest Man win. And he's been on the podium for a lot of different competitions, but he's also brought up his lifts. He's had a thousand pound deadlift. He had a training dumbbell press of 337 pounds. And he's very good at the static events now. And he also has great strength endurance. When he comes, he comes to compete. And he's a gamer. Lawrence, what about you? Who do you think has a lot of momentum coming in? Yeah, Alexis had a great year, but for me, you have to be watching Tom Stoltman. He is the current world's strongest man. A week ago, he won Britain's Strongest Man, and if he's recovered and fully fresh from that show, he's going to cause these guys a lot of problems. You can't overlook um, Luke Stoltman as well. Europe's strongest man this year. He's won other international shows. He's looking strong, and I think, of course, Brian Shaw. Yeah. Never count him out. Of the five events that we're going to face over the next two days, what do you think the Stoltman brothers really like here? I think the main strength for the Stoltmans is their consistency, particularly Tom. I mean, he's really brought up weaknesses. There was a time his deadlift wasn't so good, his pressing wasn't so good. In the last year, that's really come up. And then the things like the Stones, that man loves those events. If he's in a strong position going into the Stones, he's going to win this show. Yeah, there are five 
events that will take place uh, over the next few days. We showed you the Wheel of Pain. That will be event number one on Saturday. Can't wait to watch that. Two events today, and we are going to kick things off with a crowd favorite, the One Rep Max Elephant Bar Deadlift. If you have never seen that, you've got to watch what's going to happen there. Huge weights are going to go up. We close things out with the Sear Dumbbell Ladder. Then on Saturday, once again, the Wheel of Pain. That is always a crowd favorite. And then two more events to close out the Strongman competition on Saturday. What do you expect to see happen for athletes who need to be successful over these five events? What's it going to take for them? Well, you start with the deadlift. There's going to have to be a hot start in the deadlift. You don't want to find yourself in a hole and then work up from there. You got your next event's a static event, but a good deadlift is uh, primary for this competition. For me, consistency. Yeah. You've got so many incredible athletes this week. I mean, 10 of the absolute best in the world. I don't think you can have a weakness. If you have a weak event, it's going to be game over. You need that consistency. I think we're going to see the scoring chop and change after each event. It's going to come really close on this. For me, there's five guys that could win. Yeah, and the 10 men who are here is probably the most loaded strongman field that we've seen ever. You have Mateusz Kalaszkowski, J.F. Corone. He's going to be one to watch uh, on the deadlift. Rob Kearney is great on, on log presses. Martins Leeds, he's coming off an injury. More on that in a second. Alexei Novikov, uh, we mentioned uh, him and how impressive he's been. Jerry Pritchett, you know, eight-time Arnold Strongman Classic competitor. Brian Shaw, Mikhail Shivlikov, Luke Stolman, and Tom Stolman. And we talked about injuries. Now, Mateusz Kalaszkowski is coming off one of those. What do you expect to see from him here? Well, he had a great run from 2018 to 2020. He was on the podium from all the great competitions in Strongman. And in 2020, he won four of six events at the Arnold Strongman Classic. Really a dominant performance. But, you know, he's had this physical health issue that's gone on. And, it, you know, mentally he's got to get back into competition. But I talked to him yesterday, and he's confident. Martins Leeds is another guy coming off an injury, but he has not competed in a while. How's he feeling coming into the Invitational? Martins is the kind of guy that doesn't just turn up to make up numbers. If he's put his name down to do this, I believe he's in great shape. He's a very confident man. He understands how to peak for events. And again, he doesn't have big weaknesses. So if he can perform at his best, is he a little bit ring rusty? We'll soon see, but I think it's going to be an amazing performance from the former World's Strongest Man. Yeah, Tom Stolman is coming in with a bit of a target on his back. He is the defending World's Strongest Man, and he defeated a lot of the men that he will be facing here in that competition. He's looking to continue that momentum and establish himself as a dominant force in the sport. Here comes the big man, the albatross, Tom Stolman. It kind of just came natural to me. I mean, my granddad was a really strong man. My dad did a lot of farming. Strength was a background in our family, so all quite giants. Stoltman pulling rep number four. He's already on to five. Tom Stoltman here in this rogue record breaker. Right off the ground. Six. Wow. Oh, wow. oh my goodness. Gotta find bigger stones. Look how quickly he's going. Tom. He will one motion through as many as he can. Using that power belly to his advantage, just hoist him on. And Tom Stockman is racking through these. The strongmen will be kicking things off at 12 noon local time. Let's turn our attention back to the CrossFit competition and a man who, to our community, this CrossFit community needs no introduction, a legend of the sport, Chris Spieler. Thanks so much for being here, man. How you doing? Of course. Great. It's awesome to be here. You and Rich Froning helped program this competition. What was it like programming for, for a competition when you're usually programming for classes? Yeah, you know, it's uh, honestly uh, a really collaborative team effort working with Bill and Katie. And one thing I, I love about the outlook is just this passion to keep it very classic, make sure that it's a great event for the athlete and it's uh, something that they can walk away feeling challenged from but not beat up. And then also just giving a little bit of flavor, a little change along the way. Yeah, two very different challenges that the CrossFit athletes will be facing today. What stands out to you about those first two events? You know, one is kind of like the grunt work, go ruck event where I think it sort of boils down to uh, more of that mental grind where the other one is 
obviously, you know, going to be a great spectator event to watch kind of that heavy lift and display the strength. But I think the rest of the weekend is going to fill in the gaps really nicely. What are your favorite parts about the events we're going to see today? Uh, today, um, I'm a sucker for that over-under on the log. <laughs> I love it. It's kind of, you know, from the wrestling days. So I think it's going to be a fun one to watch with the pack. Well, not only did you get to program this competition, you are going to be competing in the Legends competition. What's it like to be back out here in a competitive atmosphere? I hesitate to say competitive. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, such a privilege. It's super fun to be with the, the athletes and the people that we get to work with and just, the, you know, see your friends and really just throw down. That's what makes it great. And the, the Paris division is going to be a, a total blast. Yeah, there's a hill in center field. What's it like having you know, something like that to play with as you're as you're programming this event. I, it's funny. I really had to rely on Rich for that. I was like, I don't know how long a baseball field is. Like, how, how, you know. <laughs> um, but it's really cool to be able to have that kind of variety. And again, that's I think the little stuff that sets it apart and creates a uh, an unknown for the athletes out there. Who's the person you're looking forward to the most, uh, either competing with or against here in the, in the Legends competition? With? Well, I get to compete with Dan and, and Annie, I think. Those All are right. kind of projected as of now, and it's it's going to be pretty classic to watch uh, Annie and I try to tackle the bike. It's not not wheelhouse, but we'll, we'll give it all we got. It's an interesting pairing. Yeah, put the two tag together team the one. bike. We'll both ride at the same time. <laughs> well, Chris, thanks so much for taking the time to stop by. Best of luck in the Legends competition. My pleasure. Really looking forward to uh, to watching you compete. You know, there is a lot of stuff here uh, on the field that you know you usually don't see in a baseball park. You got Zeus. You got the Wheel of Pain. There's barbells. Well, there's also a hill. A, the Rogue Invitational crew, they know how to make all that other stuff, but this is the very first time that they've ever had to construct an actual hill. We're looking through the events, we see this hill run, and we're thinking, we're like, dude, there's like no hills out here. So we're trying to figure out what they're gonna be like. Maybe it's like a stadium stair run, but they're calling it a hill run. And then we get here and we look out there and they've literally made a, like a man-made turf hill out there. It's pretty cool, like, I was like, it's totally different. It's pretty cool, it's something innovative. It looks steep, that hill. We'll burn a little bit. It's gonna be spicy. I like it. Everybody will probably be thrown off and not really know what's happening. When you look at it, it's just kind of like, well, that's deceiving because you think it's probably not gonna be that bad, but knowing in the middle of the workout, it's actually probably gonna be just as bad as you think it is. <laughs> Mayor probably said it the best. It is deceiving. That incline is aggressive, and uh, I think it's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. Certainly looking forward to seeing that come into play uh, in event number one. Joined back on the desk now by uh, China Cho and Pat Sherwood. Let's dive in to event number one. It is called Go Rock. It's basically an up and back chipper. That hill is going to come into play. There are some sandbags that are involved, and it's really that that middle portion that's the crux of this event. Absolutely. The meat and potatoes of this event are the rope climbs and the sandbag hill runs. The two things that are going to eat up the most time. Having the ruck on your back going up and down the rope, having to control your descent, are going to make this challenging movement even more difficult than it already is. And that hill, just like everyone said, it is steep. The videos, the pictures, the comments do not do it justice. <laughs> I am not jealous that they are running up it, and I'm not. Yeah, I didn't even want to walk up that thing. It, 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 equipment between the team has been lugging stuff up and down uh -huh. uh, and it does not look fun who do you think the man to beat in this event is Pat? oh you know I, I i wrestled with this one a bit i'm gonna go with cole sager he's just so good at these events that involve some rope climbs some runs some sandbag work some grunt work if you will and the hill i think is going to play to his strengths as well because just it's a little bit of that unknown china and i got to experience the hill the other day you know and it we was walked. like yeah we walked it <laughs> steeper than expected for sure and and cole's such a capable individual this is his third rogue invitational appearance he's been to the crossfit games eight times so back in 2019 at the invitational there was event number one Go Ruck event, somewhat similar, not exactly, but some similar elements. He was first place in that, so I think he's a solid pick. What about on the women's side? I'm going to have to go with Laura Horvath. Um, she has a rock climbing background, meaning her grip strength is really, really good. And whenever there's a rope involved, she typically does very, very well. Um, and she's one of the stronger athletes in the field. So I think having that ruck um, on her back throughout the entire workout isn't going to affect her as much as it is the other athletes. 
Yeah, what do you think uh, Laura Horvath is going to, and the rest of the athletes, how are they going to handle that ruck? Because that thing does make a difference when you're climbing a rope. It does. I mean, you cannot lean back the way that you normally would to get your knees up and pull. It really just, oh, forces you back. So you're going to have to keep a tight pull, maybe add an extra pull going up. If you normally do two, you'll probably have to do three, which takes up more time and more energy. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, if most of us have done Murph, right? You get the body armor on. Well, you want it loose so that you can breathe, mm -hmm. but then that doesn't work well. You want to mm -hmm. cinch it down, and then it's uncomfortable. It's going to be very much the same deal with the ruck. you got to keep it snug or it's going to become an enemy. Yeah, Go Ruck is the first event for the CrossFit athletes. That'll be a little bit later in the day. We'll have a lot more from China and Pat here on the desk with you throughout the competition. The strongmen will be kicking things off first with that one rep max elephant bar deadlift. And a man to watch in that event is Brian Shaw, and he spoke with Kiki Dixon earlier today. And in U.S. history, how do you draw on those past experiences when coming into a new competition? Well, I do have a lot of experience to draw on, and I think at every single contest I've tried to learn something through my career, and you know, this is uh, always something yeah. where the strongman contest you have to do is a challenge, right? So the events are new, they're different, they're always changing. It's one of the things that's kept me really interested in the sport and it keeps me excited to come out and, and perform at events like this. So those experiences are things that um, I draw on and I use uh, coming into big events like this. Speaking of big events, the Rogue Invitational putting up the most money ever up for grabs at a strongman event. What does that mean to you to have Rogue support your sport that way? Well, Rogue is incredible. I mean, this this event, having Strongman here, uh, this is the first time we've ever done it with high-level CrossFit, which is incredible. And then putting up that kind of money is, is just moving the sport forward. And uh, it's awesome. It's just awesome. I mean, there's nothing else you can really say other than all of the guys, myself included, appreciate it very much. And uh, it's really cool for me, especially being in the sport so long, to see where it started or where I started and where we're at now. It's incredible. Thanks, Ryan. We look forward to seeing you out there today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kiki. Dr. Bill Crawford now back on the desk. And for a lot of these athletes, it's, this is the first time in a while that they have competed. What's going through their heads right now as they warm up and get set for that first event? Well, it is a long layoff for a lot of these athletes, but it's containing your nervous energy and taking that nervous energy and putting it into the competition. Sometimes, though, when you're too nervous and you start to overthink, and if you start to overthink, you don't attack the events. You want to attack the events. And I think some of these are very, very attack worthy events because you've got to move from one event to one uh, implement to the next. Right. We have two strongman events today. We're going to kick things off with the one rep max elephant bar deadlift. And then later on uh, this evening, it's the Sear Bell Ladder, the one rep max deadlift presented by U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Visit GoArmy.com to find out. And, and starting with that one rep max deadlift, it's kind of like starting with the home run derby. Why is that such a good test? This is red meat for strongman fans. I mean, this is putting the bar on the floor. It's very relatable to anybody that, that actually lifts weights. And I mean, who deadlifts 900 pounds? Who deadlifts 1,000 pounds? These so that's guys. why it's so exciting. <laughs> and it will be uh, fun to watch. And it's just three chances to get your one rep max. There is some strategy involved here that makes it a fun event to watch some gamesmanship that goes on as well. Let's once again look at the 10 men who will be competing here at the first ever Rogue Invitational Strongman Competition. They'll have that for you. But look, it's a who's who of strongman competitors. JF Carone at the top of that list, a guy that you're going to want to watch very closely here in the deadlift. We also heard from Brian Shaw. He does very well with this. And Jerry Pritchett uh, has a history of, of doing well with that uh, elephant bar uh, deadlift. Knowing what you know about those, you know, the, the competitors here and knowing the first two events, who do you think sits on top of the overall leaderboard at the end of day one? Well, we talk about consistency, and I think Alexi has been really consistent this year, so I'd have to give him the nod. But JF's got a big deadlift, and I talked with him yesterday. He's really confident about that deadlift. But this is a stacked field. Yeah. I mean, who do you really pick? There are several men who could win this and who actually shows up. They're all known quantities as athletes and strong men, but who's just going to have a better day? Yeah. One rep max deadlift will kick off the action here. You're definitely going to want to watch that. We have CrossFit action. We have the Rogue Record Breakers and the Legends. Stay with us, everybody. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll be back with the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
In Texas, size matters, and we are about to go big. Ten of the best strongman athletes in the world are here to kick things off at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Dread it, run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas, just outside of Austin, usually plays host to baseball, but over the next two days, it will play host to 10 of the best strongman athletes on the planet. For the first time ever, a strongman competition at the Rogue Invitational. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I am Sean Woodland with former Europe's Strongest Man, Lawrence Chalet. And Lawrence, we're going to start things off with a bang here, a crowd favorite, the one rep max elephant bar deadlift. We are starting with all about static strength. The deadlift, it's the, the lift that everyone talks about. Who can lift the most weight from the floor to a standing position? These guys need a good start to this contest. We've got a long, grueling five events for the guys to challenge themselves. But the deadlift is the showstopper. I want to see some big thousand pound pulls today. And it's very likely that we will see that event number one, the Elephant Bar One Rep Max Deadlift presented by the U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Visit GoArmy.com to find out. Three chances to establish a one rep max. There is some strategy and some gamesmanship that will come into play here. More on that in a second. But that is the elephant bar. That is just one of the five challenges that await these athletes. For more, for more on what is ahead over the next two days, let's send it down to Kiki Dixon. Guys, most of the action for the strawmen are going to happen right here at home plate. We've got everything set up for the elephant bar deadlift. I mean.
Being a thousand pounds pulled. We also have another familiar event with that glorious wheel of pain. However, we do have a new apparatus for these guys to get after. It's going to be amazing. Sean, what are you looking forward to the most? Thank you, Kiki. I cannot wait to see that thing in action, the Wheel of Pain, one of the most impressive implements ever built for a strongman competition. But before we can deal with that, we have to deal with the Elephant Bar. And the 10 men who will be taking part in this event are getting set. There are some guys here, we talk about 1,000 pounds, who can easily hit that mark here today. Yeah, for me, we've got to be looking at J.F. Caron to start with. This guy is built to deadlift. Mm -hmm. He's pulled some huge numbers in the past. He's yes, done some yes. big numbers on this particular bar. And from talking to him recently, he says his training's gone very well. He feels rested. He feels in good shape. So I'm expecting to see big numbers from the strongest man in camp. Jerry Pritchett on the right, standing up behind the bench, is another man who has a lot of experience with the elephant bar deadlift. Yeah, Jerry, Jerry has not had a good year this year. He's kind of suffered a number of injuries, but if he is fresh, if he's fully recovered, we've seen what he's done in the past. He's pulled some of the biggest numbers on this bar. He's a monster deadlifter. And here we are starting with the Polish sensation returning from injury. Never the best deadlifter. This is always the event that costs him a lot. Mateusz Kieliszkowski was 781 on the bar. Strapped in. Doesn't look like a... He really committed to that. He's even strapped in again. 781 is an open. I mean, this is the lightest weight we're going to see today. So we're almost up at 800 pounds to start with. It is crazy, but it shows the standard that we're at right now in this sport. And Kaylor Koski is going to not make an attempt here. He's going to exit the platform. You saw him sort of pat his right lat there. You can see the big scar on his, his arm there. He's, he's an unfortunate athlete who's suffered a number of injuries recently. I saw him compete very recently in Dubai. It was his first contest back, and he looked very nervous. He's still so exceptionally good. He, he, you know, he's so dynamic. He's got four events to come in this contest where he can really excel. But the deadlift has notoriously never been his strongest event. Perhaps he's felt a little a niggle there and, and just doesn't want to risk aggravating anything, knowing there's better events to come. Tom Stoltman will be up next, 796 pounds on the bar. And if you're someone who has not watched a strongman competition with the deadlift, it works a little differently than what you might be used to. They all have to declare their opening weight. The, bar on the, the weight on the bar will never go down. And then after round one is really where the strategy starts to come in. Absolutely. It's a very interesting concept because the tactics become more important. Often in strongman, it just everyone lifts the same weight and the bar goes up. Where they get to, to, to choose their weights after each lift, it favors guys that are, that are experienced, such as maybe a, a Brian Shaw. I think he'll be very meticulous with his numbers that he picks. I'm surprised seeing Tom Stoltman start as one of the, the lighter guys. His deadlift improved a lot. He did have a, a brutal deadlift event last weekend, and he, he performed exceptionally well. Maybe he just wants to get a good safe lift in the bag and then take some bigger jumps. And you'll see that with guys. Some guys will take smaller jumps. Some guys will take bigger jumps. They're trying to save energy. It's um, an interesting physical as well as mental battle. 796 pounds on the bar for Tom Stoltman. So I'm expecting a good, comfortable pull here. And look at that, nice and easy, solidly locked out. That'll settle the nerves, gets him used to the bar. And this is something we haven't seen. Tom has not ever lifted on this bar before. A lot of the guys have experience. He'll feel a lot better after feeling that first weight. And now he'll have a good idea of what to go for in his second lift. You mentioned nerves, and we were talking before we came on here. You could see some of the guys down there as they got ready, sort of trying to just calm themselves before this competition started. What's that like being in that setting? Well, this is such a big event, you know. The, people have spoken about this being the biggest event of the year. Rogue have put the biggest amount of prize money into a strongman show. So all these guys want to perform well. They've all had, you know, some have had a tough year in terms of lots of competitions condensed into a small period. Others are coming back from injury. You know, it, it, there's a lot of questions that need answering. And this first event is going to show us who's in shape. It's going to show us who's up for this. And here's the current Europe's strongest man, Luke Stoltman, another guy that's had a great year. He's won a few internationals. And as I just mentioned, he won Europe's strongest man. Deadlift is probably his weakest lift of the, the contest. So he'll want to be doing damage control here. Anything where he can place... Anything other than last, to be honest, is going to be good for him. He does have some great events to come, and he needs to be smart and select the right numbers so that maybe the people that take the risks 
he can then sneak in behind them if they if the risk is too much. 801 pounds on the bar for Luke Stoltman. He is the older of the two Stoltman brothers. He's 36. His younger brother, Tom, who we just saw, just 27. And that is no problem. Good solid for Luke. 800 pound pull there. Now, something to point out to, to fans watching. In this contest, no super suits are allowed and no figure of eight straps. So you can't extend the bar. Sometimes with a figure of eight straps, you can kind of let the bar slip down into your fingers. With the normal straps, you've got to hold on, keep some pressure. This is a real pure test of deadlifting power. Jerry Pritchett will be up next at 8.06. Lexi Novikov on the left is getting his belt situated. And now Jerry Pritchett will step up for her, his first attempt. Jerry's a huge deadlifter, one of the top deadlifters on the planet. 2020 had an incredible year. Unfortunately, we've not seen the same performances in 2021. I hope he's fully recovered because when this guy is on fire, he's a monster deadlifter. 8.06 for Pritchett, his first attempt. Jerry is a thousand pound plus deadlifter. He's one of the biggest deadlifters on the planet when he's in top shape. I'm interested to see how this moves because I haven't seen too many videos from him recently. Normally when he's focused and feeling good, we see a lot of confidence coming from his social media. He wants to show people what he's capable of. He's been quiet. We know he's coming back from injury. Has he had enough time to get himself in shape? 806 pounds. It wasn't bad, but it didn't convince me. I've got to be honest. You know, I've seen him pull those like their speed reps before. I'm not convinced we're going to see the best of Jerry today after seeing that. I hope he proves me wrong but I think normally he pulls that kind of weight much easier. Every time I've seen him deadlifted, regardless of the weight, he always has just the same technique, the same tempo. He is so technically good. He's got an interesting technique. He's someone that stands very, very wide. He gets a lot of, he gets squat down low, a lot of leg drive into the movement. And normally when he's, when he's at his strongest, he explodes up off the floor with, with great ferocity. For me, I don't see that confidence in him at the moment. It's sad because, like I said, in his best, when he's fresh, he's just a pleasure to watch deadlifting. And that will bring up Alexei Novikov, one of the young up-and-comers in the sport, 821 pounds for his opening lift. Now, Alexei has had an incredible year. He's probably been the most consistent performer other than World's Strongest Man, he's been on the podium in every single show he's done, and he was the World's Strongest Man winner in 2020. It, I think that loss at World's Strongest Man kind of <laughs> really motivated him, and I've seen great improvement in his static strength over the last year. Deadlift wasn't his strongest lift a couple of years back. He's pulled 1,000 pounds in a contest this year. That's wearing the super suit and the figure of eight straps. Let's see what he's like out of the suit. 821 is good for Novikov. Excellent lift there. I was kind of worried then because he dropped it. Obviously, some rules are different in contests, and you're not always allowed to drop the bar, but he's got the good lift, and it looked, it looked very solid. He's got beautiful technique. Look how he squats down, drives hard off the floor, and then th powers those hips through at the locker. His, his top end strength on his deadlift is exceptionally good, and I think this bar could suit him. It's, there's a little bit of flex in there. It allows him to get, you, know, you don't get the full weight till it's up a little higher, closer to the knees. And we've seen him in the past do some huge numbers on partial lifts. So good start there for the 2020 World's Strongest Man. Now we'll bring up Martins Lietzis. His opening lift at 856 pounds. And we talked about this uh, earlier in the day, but he's another guy coming off an injury. Exactly that, and, and the in, you know he suffered with his hip recently. Um, so the deadlift, if your hip's not firing, isn't always the best lift. Lee Cease is an incredible deadlifter. He, he's better for reps, I'd say, than for top-end maximum strength. But this is going to answer the questions because it's been a long time since we've seen this man. He is an incredible competitor. He's not someone that likes to turn up if he's not in shape. So let's see how good he's looking today. You see the wheel of pain in the background, and that is an implement that Martins has done very well on the last two years. He won it the first time that the event was at the Arnold Strongman Classic. That was back in 2019, and then finished second in 2020. So that's a, on Saturday, he will face that. He can score some points there. So now we're going to have an athlete change, as it looks like a weight may have changed. And that means that Luke Stoltman will be the next man to lift. Because remember, the 
Weight on the bar can never go down, so that means that Luke Stoltman's second declared lift was less than what Leeds was going to open with. Yeah, it's an interesting element to this deadlift champion, uh, this deadlift contest because some athletes are going to get much longer rest periods than others. The, the guys that are starting later, they don't want to cool down too much. They need to make sure they stay warm. Uh, and guys like Luke here who are jumping in quicker, he's going to get less recovery time between each lift. So interesting. It's, it's just a different twist on the, the elements that we're, we're seeing today. You can see he's chalking his hands up there. He wants them to be as dry as possible so that when he grips onto the bar, everything is secure. 846 pounds, this will be Luke Stoltman's second of three lifts. Stoltmans are such popular athletes. They've really blown up the last couple of years. They're, they're lovely guys as well, but their performances back up that popularity. Winning multiple major shows this year between the two of them, their father, Ben Stoltman, I'm sure he's watching, is an extremely proud man of his, his sons. He goes Luke at 846. And he is able to stand that up and make gets, it count. Gets the good lift. Luke has exceptionally powerful quad. You see he gets good speed off the floor. It's once that bar goes over the knees, he's not quite getting the, the position to shoot those hips through as quick as he'd like. So one more look at the second lift, lift for Luke Stolman. Nice thing. She has to push the knees forward to try and stop it sliding back down. That's kind of known as a hitch. So in strongman, absolutely fine. Gets it solidly locked out and gets the good balance. Just one lift remaining for Luke Stolman, who is now your leader so far. 846 pounds, the heaviest lift that we have seen. Now that will bring up Martins Leitzis, who is going to open at 856. Luke Stoltman currently our biggest lifter, but he's already done his second lift. And now we have Martinez Lissas, the 2019 World's Strongest Man, back in action. I'm extremely excited to see how, what kind of shape he's in. He's a great character, an incredible athlete, someone that really knows how to bring his best to competition day. You don't always see the big lifts from, from him in the, in the gym. His training, you can look at his training and just think, oh, this guy's not too bad, but you don't look at him as the biggest lifter. And then when it comes to competition, he does some incredible things. So opening lift for the Dragon. It's a good, solid lift. I think he knows his deadlift's not at his best, but he's happy to be back in competition. Big kiss to the crowd, he gets the down signal, a good opening lift. Martins Leeds, he's now with the heaviest lift we have seen at 856 pounds. He has two more attempts for me. Look how low he squats down. He gets plenty of leg drive whilst pulling hard with the glutes and hamstrings and lower back. You can see that's an F, that's a lot of effort into that lift for a first lift. Normally I'd like to see it move a little faster, but he's got the lift in the bag. I don't think we're gonna see a huge jump from him though. Six men have lifted, four remain here. And remember, Luke Stoltman has made two attempts. Now Jerry Pritchett is back. This will be his second attempt. Jerry also going for 856 pounds. Now this shows me that Jerry's not in, not in his best shape. And I hate saying that because Jerry is such a huge deadlifter and a great athlete. He's just not back to his best. And saying that, I think that lift was better than his first. He looks like he's getting fired up. He's happy about it. It's good to see some hunger from Jerry, trying to get some good points on the board in this first event, the elephant bar deadlift. And the second lift is good for 8.56, time in the first yeah, yeah. You can see the standing on the left side of the screen if he was lifted in what weight so far. Still four men have yet to head to the platform. It looks like Alexei Novikov will now be coming back up to the platform for his second attempt. And the names that you would expect to be the guys who are putting up the big numbers are the ones who have yet to step out there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think most people will, will be confident in looking at Brian Shaw and JF Caron to come out on top of this battle, particularly looking at, at Jerry's not only his best. Normally, Jerry's up in that battle, uh, unfortunately not back to his best currently. But JF Caron and Brian Shaw have pulled monstrous weights on this bar. 
And it's interesting to see nothing yet from Shiblikov. Shiblikov's pulled some huge weights on this. He is another athlete that has suffered with injuries this year. So I'm interested to see. He must be feeling confident to not yet come in and lift. Here's Novikov now with his second lift, 861 pounds. It's always interesting watching the guys, the different stances, different techniques. He has a very narrow stance there, toes pointing forward. He's going to drive hard through the floor. Chest will come up. Plenty of drive with the quads, and then his hips come through nicely. Very easy lift there. 861 as good as Mikhail Shiblikov. I mean, he's still waiting for his turn. He, he's such a, a crowd favorite. Always gives 100%. One more look at Novikov's second lift at 861. See, just that little fraction hard, hard off the floor, and then suddenly, once he's over his knees, he gets tremendous power through his glutes. That will bring, bring out Rob Kearney for the first time. 876 pounds for Kearney. There's no colors in the mohawk today. He's normally more colorful than this. He's got the color in the, in the leggings and the shades. He's feeling confident. So 876 on the bar for Kearney, making his first appearance here in the opening event. Three attempts for each athlete. So that stuff he's sniffing there is ammonia. It's, it clears your head. It's nothing more than that, it kind of wakes you up. Um, Certainly gets you fired up to lift. Now he's strapping onto the bar. Kearney trained by the legendary Derek Poundstone. Definitely copies Derek's deadlifting technique. You often see him drive hard with the quads over the knees and then he kind of pitches up just like that. He's mastered that movement. It works out well for him as 876 is good. Rob Kearney, your new leader after his first attempt. Three men have yet to lift. J.F. Caron, Brian Shaw, and Mikhail Shivlikov. So watching here again, you see him drive hard off the floor, and then what he does, he pushes his knees forwards, makes the bar stop on the quads, and then drives again. Now, I don't advise this as a coach, you don't teach people to do it, but he's mastered it, and it works for him. Now, the first appearance for Brian Shaw, as Rob Kearney confirms his score, eight, 81 is the big former four-time World's Strongest Man winner. Winner of the Arnold's multiple times. One of the absolute greatest strong men on the planet. He's had a good steady year. He's been probably the best year he's had com competition-wise in, in, in a while. But he wants to win a major again, and this is a show I know he's fired up for. I think he's got a great chance looking at the events. He's going to be a contender, and I think he, he's going to enjoy the deadlift. Brian Shaw has been in strongman competition since 2005 when he started career, his career winning Denver's Strongest Man without any formal training. 881 for him on the barbell. Big solid weight to start with. And a good solid pull there. 881 pounds puts him into first place. 400 kilos. Opening on 400 kilos. 881 pounds. Good solid lift. Again, Brian. Not convincing me that he's at his best. I haven't seen his best deadlifting in the last few years, but still massive weights. He's one of those guys that you can just never count out of a contest. He's too dangerous. He's too experienced. Nice and chilled. He's going to have a game plan. He's not one of these guys that just comes in and he's like hoping for the best. He has a game plan. He knows exactly what numbers he wants to lift. He knows how many reps he wants to do. He's someone that just methodically thinks about every single aspect. And I think sometimes it costs him against some of the younger athletes that just go for broke on, on more of the, the speed and quicker events. But this is all about who can lift the most. Tom Stolman is now up for his second lift. He will attempt 881 pounds to tie Brian Shaw. Another huge man. Six foot nine. Good solid lift there. Tom's going to be happy with that. 881 in the bag for the defending world's strongest man, and that still leaves two men left who have yet to make the first attempts, J.F. Corona and Mikhail Shivlikov. This shows Shivlikov must be feeling confident. He's not come in light, you know. He's suffered a few injuries this year, but he has, he finally took some time off to recover. 
if we can see Shivlikov in top shape, he's a very dangerous man. And I hope he is in top shape because for the fans watching, he's always entertaining. You could expect nosebleeds with this man. <laughs> he just goes and goes and goes and gives 100% every single time he steps on the stage. Luke Stoltman will be up for his third and final lift, 886 pounds to put himself on top of the standings here. So this is a smart number for Luke to go. It's, a, it's a, certainly a possible weight for him. He knows other guys are gonna take bigger jumps. What he's trying to do here is get a lift which will beat other athletes second lift. He knows he's not the biggest deadlifter. He's gonna hope that some of the other guys go for big numbers and make mistakes. Yeah, there's really two sets of athletes here and two sets of uh, approaches. One's damage control, get the points. The other is what do I need to do to you know, outfox exactly my other competitors and actually win this event. Third and final attempt for Luke Stoltman, 886 pounds on that elephant bar. Getting strapped in. Take a big deep breath. He needs this. This, like I said, if he can get this, he could potentially score some decent points for him on the deadlift. Good power. He needs to get it over those knees. He couldn't quite do it. You saw it just slow down. It was worth the effort. He knew if he got that, he could have potentially scored some bigger points than maybe he was predicted. 886 will be no good for Luke Stolman. His best lift, 846 pounds, and he is now done for the remainder of this event. And that will bring up the Siberian force, Mikhail Shivlikov, for the first time for his opening lift, 891 pounds on the barbell. I love this guy. He's just such a character. He's got muscles that are torn off. He doesn't ever give up. I've seen him do some incredible, he, he broke the Masters deadlift world record last year. And it was one of the hardest reps I've ever seen in my life. But he just refused to be beat. 41 years old now, competing in the Masters, but still competing with the absolute best on the planet. Started strong man back in 2007. Former Russian Marine. He's missing his beret today. He normally wears that. So different technique. Look how his feet are pointing out to the side. Different to some of the other guys we saw earlier, such as Novikov. Every athlete is built differently. And this is one now. He's going to use more hamstring and glute power rather than the quad power that you see from like the Brian Shores. Shivlikov feeling a, a little bit of a, looks like a strain in the, the hamstring there, hamstring so that lift up. will not. You can see the hamstring looks like it's kind of taped up. His calves are taped up. I can see some white tape under there. I've been, I've, I've been worried about him. I, I thought maybe he's come back and is feeling good, but he has had a, so many injuries this year. And really, I know from experience, you have to take the time off and let the body recover. He is an incredible strong man. But you can't keep going to this level and pushing all the time. JF Caron is the only man who has yet to lift. Now Alexei Novikov will be up next at 896, and that will be his third and final lift. So looking like this is going to develop into maybe a two-man battle between that man, JF Caron, and then Brian Shaw, who currently sits atop the overall leaderboard tied with uh, Tom Stoltman. The two of them have cleared 881 pounds, but Shaw has two lifts remaining. Stoltman has just one, and now Novikov making his way to the platform for the third and final time. 896 pounds. Alexei Novikov, you know, not just all brawn, has tons of brains. He has a master's degree in international economics and has worked as a business and financial advisor when he's not training and competing. He's a very smart young man. He's only 25 years old. He's already won the world's strongest man. And you can see that smarts when he's approaching events. He's very good at figuring events out and understanding what he needs to do. I've seen him compete in other shows this year where they do mystery events where the athletes didn't get to see what they should be doing and he was the best at figuring things out quickly. 896 for Novikov. And then he's got to get it over those knees. And no. just can't get it past that sticking point. 
And that's, that could cost him. You know, there's still some big lifters to come. He's currently in fourth, but with the likes of Lissis, Pritchett, and Caron to come. I don't think he's going to be too happy with that. He's got some great events. Later on, we're going to see him in the dumbbell. He's done some fabulous things recently in training on that. He's one of the best in the last two years to really dominate the dumbbell events. But he wants more out of the deadlift tonight. And JF Caron is now finally coming up to the platform for his opening lift at 906 pounds. Opening on over 900 pounds. Mikhail Shilakopi. Looks like Nopkop talking some things over there. Nine-time Canada's strongest man, J.F. Caron, making his way to the platform. Dominated the Canadian scene over the last 10 years. Actually, this year he didn't win Canada's strongest man, and he wasn't the highest placed Canadian at World's strongest man. So he wants to be proving again that he is the number one Canadian. In 2015, he broke a Guinness Book of Records mark for turning a Volkswagen 13 times. Did that in China. The prior record was 10. Tremendous backstrap. I'm excited to see this lift. He's opening on 906. He feels confident. I spoke to him recently, and he said he felt fresh. He felt like training had gone really well. That's always a good sign with someone like JF. 906 pounds, Corone hits this. He is your new leader and still has two lifts remaining. And that was wow, no look at this. problem. He is confident, he's pulling powerfully. What a lift. I've not seen anyone do an opener that easy and he opened on 906 pounds. That has sent a message to the rest of the field here that you better have your A game if you have any chance of beating him <laughs> here in this opening event. I love how confident and laid back he is. He's not one of these guys that cares too much about the equipment that he's lifting on. He said, it's a deadlift, it's a deadlift. I'll lift on anything and look at the power. Look at the speed. What a lift. And the serious look there. He's like, yes, I'm the daddy when it comes to deadlifting. <laughs> Martins Leetzies will now step back up and try to just hit the weight that JF Caron made look like an empty barbell. 906 pounds still on the bars. Leetzies gets set up. This would tie him for the top spot in this event with JF Caron. This is big for Lises. He needs this. I think if he can pull this, he's going to put himself in a very good position for the rest of the show. Big brace, nice and tight. He needs it over the knees, and he's going to get it. Now, Lises Excellent. is good at 9.06. That's huge for Lises. It's going to give him good points on the deadlift. He's been so worried about this event. It's the only event he felt he could lose a lot of points on. He's confident with the four events to come. This is big, big news for the return of the former World's Strongest Man champion. Interesting starting position that we don't see for a lot of athletes, starting from his yeah, knees. Yeah, he's to just get getting strapped in, and while he's on his knees, it allows him to breathe a little easier. Then you see the big squat down, lots of leg power, driving hard, he got it over the knees, he's maintained positioning, and then the glutes fire through, and look at the nod of approval. He is extremely happy with that lift. It's good to see him back in action. It's been a long time. He's always one of the most exciting athletes on the tour. Great to see him pull a big deadlift today. Here comes Jerry Pritchett to try and go for 9.06 to tie him with Carone and Leetes. But remember, Carone still has two lifts remaining. I've been harsh on Jerry, you know, saying he's not in his best shape. And I stand by that. He's, he's normally a thousand pound puller. He's someone that has tremendous back strength, but he's fighting hard. He doesn't want to give up. He's the iron outlaw, and look at this, he's going for it. Not today. It's always worth trying. One more attempt, and it's just not going to happen for Jerry Pritchett. <laughs> that leaves J.F. Caron and Martins Litis as the only two men have, who have lifted above 900 pounds. Pritchett will settle for a score of 856 pounds. Right now, good enough for seventh place. And Rob Kearney, for his second lift, trying to become the new leader and set the new mark to beat at 911 pounds. So with Rob, it's all about whether he has the power to get it up to those knees. If he can get it over his knees, he has his, his hitching technique dialed down. He was taught by the best. Derek Poundstone was really a, a 
prominent user of, of that technique. And he's passed it on to his student. So he's got the colorful leggings there. They do help the bar slide a little easier than they would against the, the skin. Currently the American record holder in the log lift at 475.75 pounds. So he's strapped in. He's one of the smallest athletes here today, but he's extremely powerful. 9-11 for Rob. Can he get it over the knees? No, not quite. Not quite. He's gonna, you know what, he's gonna have another go, but he's not gonna do it. When you give that, that type of effort, on the first guy, uh, first try. He's taking a deep breath, but honestly, if he gets this, I will be shocked. It's a crowd trying to get behind him here, and it won't go for Rob Kearney. So 876 will be what he is settling for. Still good points for Rob. Five, fifth at, at the moment on the on the deadlift. He'll be pleased with that, and he has some very good events to come. His dumbbells extremely good. He's very, very good. Look out for him on the super yoke. His super yoke is absolutely electric. Brian Shaw now back up for his second attempt at 911 pounds. He's looking to become the new leader here. Brian Shaw's always so consistent. One of the reasons he's been one of the most dominant forces ever in strongman. I think you said earlier, he started strongman 2005. I remember my first World Strongest Man, we were in the same group. And he's just it's been a pleasure to watch his career over the years. 911 pounds for Brian Shaw. And this to become the new leader in the event. Look at the wide stance of Brian. Such a huge mountain of a man. You compare that stance to, say, you know, a Shivlikov, or some of the other guys. Completely different, but still effective. Shaw cannot get 911, okay. so this seems to be the, okay. the stopping point here is Shaw will exit the platform. Looks like he's okay, not one, limping. One thing I will say, this has been an exceptionally busy year. It's, it, the, the whole season has been condensed into a short period of time. A lot of the athletes are, are, are tireder than they'd like to be for this type of event. It's one of the questions that I, I was waiting to see how athletes were performing. For me, <laughs> JF Karam with his opening lift is the only athlete that looks in top deadlifting form today. J.F. Caron, who is still your leader with Martins lead seats at 906 pounds, but 906 was Caron's opening lift. He still has two attempts to go as Tom Stoltman is now back up to the barbell, and he's going to try 911 pounds. Now, a lot of people said I was crazy because they said I think Tom Stoltman can win this event, uh, this, this whole contest. I mean, he is the world's strongest man, but he competed last week, and people still think he has some weaknesses. His deadlift has improved a lot, and look, there we see it. 911 pounds. He's getting stronger every time we see him compete. He's going to be over the moon with that lift. Puts him into first place. That's going to be big points on the deadlift. And trust me, he's got some exceptional events to come. That looked, I don't want to say easy, but looked like he may have a little bit more in the tank. But 911 pounds for Stoltman puts him in the lead right now. Look at that. You can see it on his face. He's happy with that one. He had to work for it. You know, he's not fresh. He, he put in a huge performance on the deadlift just a week ago. But he's going to be over the moon with that lift. And now we have. J.F. Caron coming in with 926 pounds. I believe he's capable of a lot more. I'm sure he's trying to save, save as much energy as he can for, for the later events. Well, as easy as 906 looked, hard to think that he's going to have a problem with this one. You can't see it, can you? 20-pound jump. You never know, but he, he's a very strong deadlifter. I'm expecting this to move exceptionally well still. He looks like he's here and capable of well over a 1,000 pounds today. Second of three lifts for J.F. Carone, and this to retake the lead that he just surrendered to Tom Stoltman. And let's remember, this is still his second lift. Oh, 
9.26 for J.F. Perot. Straps into the bar. He'll sit back. Deep breath. And Let me just get out of geez. here. That is too easy for J.F. Perone. <laughs> and he's looking to take the opening event here, the 2021 Rogue Invitational. He is just laying the smack down on these guys <laughs> on the deadlift. The confidence in his face. He is clearly in a class by himself right now. Right now, no one's touching him on the deadlift today. Look at this. Such a strong guy. He's done so well the last few years. He just He's one of those athletes that just improved year after year. He's closing in on 40 and just getting better all the time. And that may be it. Corone may not have to make a third attempt as he is Brian Shar talking some things over. You see Jerry Pridgett in the background as well. But Corone only made two attempts. 9.26, the best score that we've seen. We saw a handful of athletes fail at 911 pounds. A couple yep. athletes fail at 911. I think, does Tom Stockman? No, Tom Stockman just had his third lift. Is he going to go? That's it then. Our winner of the deadlift, JF Caron, 926 pounds. And let's be honest, he didn't even get out of third gear. It's not uh, unexpected. Coming into this event, we had him pegged as one of the men to watch, and man, did he put on a show. Absolutely. The, the big score for me there is Tom Stoltman getting second place, and Liss is getting third, both ahead of Brian Shaw. That's going gonna, gonna to really set the presence of today's contest. We've got the dumbbell coming up later. And speaking of that, that's an event that plays into the strengths of Mateusz Kaloszkowski, who did not post a score here in this event, but he can certainly do some damage later on this evening when they take on the Sear Dumbbell Ladder. So one more look at the winning lift from J.F. Carone at 926 pounds, and he looked like he was just warming up. That was a pleasure to watch. I mean, I would have liked to have seen him pushed because he looked capable of some monstrous weights today, but it's enough for the win. With four grueling events still to come, he's saving his energy. Dumbbell later on today, perfect start for J.F. Carone. Let's go down to the field where Kiki Dixon is with your event one winner. Congratulations on winning the Elephant Bar deadlift, 926, no joke. How are you able to mentally and physically get that weight up? Oh, you know, deadlift is a good event for me. You know, it's my favorite event too. I was prepared for over 1,000 pool here this weekend. But I think it's the first time in my career I don't need to fight so hard to win deadlift event. But I know uh, everybody got a hard season. 926 is good. You know, I pulled 100 pounds more than that in 2018 to uh, came second. <laughs> then well, I... the guys, looks like they're giving you a little bit of a break here. Obviously, still 926 pounds is an immense amount of weight. How do you begin to recover for the next event? Uh, you know, now we have almost five hours to the next one. I go eat, maybe two times, rest a little bit to prepare for dumbbell. But uh, the good thing, I push maybe 80%, then I'm total fresh. He's got more in the bag. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Unfortunately, we do not get to see a 1,000-pound lift, but it was not necessary for J.F. Corone. 926 is the winning lift, and as you heard him say, he's going to go rest, recover, get some food, and attack the second event later on today. A much different challenge that we're going to see here uh, with the elephant bar. Absolutely. It's a perfect start for him, but we all expected him to, to really put in a good performance on the deadlift. He wasn't pushed in the end. We've seen much, much tougher deadlift contests in the past. He's got a big smile on his face. He's got maximum points. He's going to go and rest, as he said. But I don't think that would have taken too much out of him. He was capable of 100 pounds more. J.F. Carone exiting Dell Diamond here in Round Rock, Texas. As the strongmen are done until this evening, we're going to go from the strongest to the fittest. The CrossFit athletes are up next as they kick things off with their opening event. 926 pounds is your winning weight for the elephant bar, and it belongs to Canada's J.F. Carone. Much more to come here from the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
Welcome back to the 2021 Rogue Invitational at the Dell Diamond Stadium here in Round Rock, Texas. A gorgeous day. The sun's out. The wind is also out just outside of Austin. I'm Pat Sherwood, joined at the desk by Dr. Bill, our all-knowing, all-encompassing wealth of knowledge on strongman activity. Dr. Bill, I know that we've got one event down. You were extremely excited that the day started off with the deadlift for the strongman. Did it live up to your expectations? I thought we'd have more 900-pound deadlifts. <laughs> I, lo I love that that's a thing, that we needed more 900-pound deadlifts. But, we, you know, you saw the competition. There's always that gamesmanship where they're trying to play inside of who's going to take what attempt. And sometimes that doesn't really play itself out, but sometimes it actually creates other people to maybe make a mistake. Well, with one event down, J.F. Carone lifted 926 pounds. Tom Stoltman still over 900 with 911. Martins Litsis 906. We had Brian Shaw occupying fourth, Rob Kearney in fifth, Alexei Novikov in sixth. An absolute amazing amount of weight heading up there. The overall standings, again, after one event, one event two coming up later in the day for the strongmen. Jeff Carone sits in first place, Tom Stoltman second, Brian uh, Martin Leeds is third, Brian Shaw fourth, Rob Kearney rounding out the top five. An amazing showing thus far, only half the events down, again event two coming up later on in the day. With the deadlift now in the rear view mirror, Dr. Bill, what stood out to you? Well, number one was Jeff Carone. It's not how much he lifted at 926, it was how he lifted it. Everyone in the stadium could see that he overpowered the weight. Wow. That ball was moving fast for over 900 pounds. I think he had seven, 75 to 85, 90 pounds more in the tank. He has pulled over 1,000 pounds with this elephant bar, and this was a great lift. It really showed his dominance on this event. I mean, at the end of the lift, he said, hey, I was ready to pull maybe another 100 pounds if need be, so he showed up ready to lift. No doubt about it. Jeff Carone was a standout. Another individual you had your eye on coming into event one was Tom Stoltman. Well, Tom has been very consistent. He's got a good deadlift. And, you know, could he have deadlifted a little more weight? He probably could have. He had very solid attempts and finished in second place. But what he did do was he acquiesced and said, you know what? I know that JF's got a bigger deadlift. I'm just going to step away now. And, you know, JF had so much left in the tank that he probably feels like a second place finish in this event was very good. It seemed like JF Caron was not somebody you wanted to chase today. No, because that just uses up energy. I don't think JF really wanted to have to put in the work to do another <laughs> right. big deadlift because he wins the event and saves some more energy for the second event today. And Mateusz was a big name coming in as well, excited to see what he was going to put on the board for the deadlift, but unfortunately he didn't even get a, a lift on the board. What happened with him? Well, it appears that he had felt something in his lat and didn't want to pull any more than he did because if he has an injury in the first event, and he didn't feel like he was probably going to place that high in this event anyway, so he just lives to fight another day. He wanted to save his energy and maybe make up points later. Will he be able to fight another day, particularly on in this competition over today and tomorrow? Does that one bad event put him out, or is he still in the fight? He's in the fight for possibly a placement. It would take a lot of movement because this is the first event. Another individual who didn't lift the most weight out there was Martins Litsis, but you said you've, you've got to keep your eye on him. Doesn't matter that he's not occupying first place. Now, why is that? Well, he's just a, he's just a bad penny. He just doesn't go away. <laughs> he's like a Wolverine. He keeps coming, he keeps coming, he keeps coming. Just like last year in the Santa Monica show in 2020 for the Arnold Starman Classic Series, he didn't go away. He left himself in striking distance. And at the last event, he had a dramatic win. And he's got a big motor. What does that mean? The last events that have more strength endurance are going to be events that do favor him. So I think he finds himself in really good shape. He's in the top three right now. At the end of day one, you know, they've got the event two coming up the bell. Will he still be in the top three in your estimation? Probably so. I think that uh, he, it, he could have a really good uh, dumbbell showing and possibly find himself in first or second, but at the very least in the top three or four. And so the overall placement, that would put him in the top three. 
What about Alexei Novikov, former world's strongest man? It, what are his chances at the end of today? Because right now he's not occupying a top three position. Well, he's in sixth place, and there's a, there's a little bit of uh, space that he could make up. And if he finds himself having a good dumbbell day, which he's had very good training with dumbbells, as we talked about earlier, he had a 337 training attempt that was successful. You know, how, how well does he do with this? He can make up points, he can make up space, and he's he's very consistent. He doesn't he doesn't have a lot of weaknesses like uh, Lawrence was talking about. We've got some fantastic strongman left, a lot more coming up and enjoying it so far. We haven't even kicked off the CrossFit events yet. Event one is coming up, that is the Go Ruck. There's some interesting implements that will be used by the athletes, and Kiki Dixon's gonna give us more information down on the field. The first element that the athletes have to get after is the wheelbarrow. Now this is actually the dog sled with the rogue conversion kit for the wheelbarrow. It's 420 pounds for the guys, 325 for the ladies. And as you can see, we use in a weight for the wheel. Very ingenious indeed, but that's what we've come to expect from rogue. Event one coming up on the CrossFit side of the house. Can you can you feel the energy? Are you getting excited yet? Oh, I am pumped. I am ready for event one. Is it time yet? It is time. All it right. Is time for event one is the GORUCK event. The athletes are going to face a unique test. Wheelbarrow pull to Zeus. Some over under logs on Zeus. We haven't seen that happen yet in a competition. They've got some rope climbs, some sandbags to take up the hill, and then they're going to go back through it one more time. The ropes, the over unders, and back to the wheelbarrow pull to the finish. I can't wait to see how those over unders on the Zeus happen again. It's it's just so cool that in 2021, there's yet a new movement that we haven't seen come out. For this event, what do you see as the keys? So the keys to the event, don't come out too hot. This is a long event. You're gonna be uncomfortable. You're wearing a, a ruck. It's not gonna be pleasant. Um, keep your breathing under control. Pushing the pace on the second half is really, really, really going to be important. You're on the back half. A lot of the hard work has been done. The hill has been climbed. The sandbags have been brought to the top. You just need to send it on those 10 over-unders and push like your life depends on it at the end. Just send it and just push. So yep, second half, second <laughs> for, half. For the men's side, who do you expect to send it on this event? You know, I really expect Sam Quant to send oh, it. Oh, I like that he pick. He is a four-times CrossFit Games competitor. This is his first time at the Rogue Invitational, but he is no stranger. He is 2020's second fittest man, and he even beat out Justin Medeiros, who was this year's champion. I'm excited to see what he can do. Um, we haven't seen him compete since the MAC, where he took 14th, but he revealed to us that he has been dealing with some forms of chronic illness, but he has a great crew with Comp Train. He has teammates like Katrin David's daughter, Absolutely. Amanda Barnhart, Chandler Smith, so you know he's being pushed daily. The training environment is fantastic. I, I can't wait to see what Quant can do after having such a, a great podium finish previously at the Games. There's a lot of hype around his name as well. I mentioned previously that I'm very excited to see if Cole Sayer can throw down on this. But on the women's side of the house, who's capturing your attention? Samantha Briggs. Oh, yeah, great call the as well. The engine. And when you think of a workout with a 30-minute time cap, how do you not think, <laughs> I need an engine for this? You need to get down. You need to be ready to grind. And she is that person. And and how is she doing it? Now, I'm a master's athlete myself. Same. Right? I okay, am now, so, too. So, but at, so I just have to preface that before I say at her age because she's amazing. But how is she? I mean, some of the women on the field are 20 years younger than her, but she's still one of the women we're expecting to crush the event. How is she still doing that? She has a good time no matter what, whether she's winning, losing, suffering, lifting. It doesn't matter. She does it with a smile on her face. She makes everyone around her happy. And that's obviously given her so much longevity in this sport. She's, you know, we talked about Scott Panchik earlier in the day that he'll, he'll beat you and he'll beat you with a smile on totally. his face. It's kind of the same deal with Sam Briggs. Absolutely ferocious but she's gonna do it with a smile and your friends afterwards. Event number one coming up at 2.05. You are not gonna to wanna to miss that. One event down for the strongman, one coming up and two on the docket today for CrossFit.
2021 Rogue Invitational is brought to you by Bear Performance Nutrition, providing you with effective health and performance supplements you can trust. BTWB, the workout tracker built for people who take their gains seriously. Concept 2, innovative, high performance training equipment since 1976.
40 of the fittest athletes in the world have descended upon Round Rock, Texas to face seven unique challenges over the next three days. This is the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Dread it, run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. Park in name only for the next three days. It will be home of the 40 fittest men and women on earth as they compete here at the Rogue Invitational. Event one for the individuals is up next, and it will be one of the longer tests that we face this entire weekend. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. There's a hill that they built <laughs> out in center field, and that's going to come into play here in event number one. True Rogue fashion, you have three implements that we've really never seen before. They built a hill in the middle of a baseball stadium. You have logs on the Zeus rigs, and now we have a modified dog sled that is now a wheelbarrow. This is the most Rogue event we could have possibly started with. Event number one is Go Ruck, presented by Go Ruck. Go Ruck believes our way of life in America depends on those who serve. And the more we support them, the stronger our foundation as a country will be. That's why GORUCK donates 1% of annual top line revenue to various nonprofit partners who support veterans and first responders. And the crux of this event, right in the middle. You can see in the background the Zeus rig, one of the most classic implements we've ever had in competition. And they have it here in Round Rock, Texas, in the middle of a baseball field. But what they have in store is something very unique. You have a wheelbarrow pull to that rig, 10 over-unders over the logs. We've never seen that before. Five rope climbs, and then in the back, looming on the right side of your screen, you can see that hill that Rogue made in just a couple of days. And then you work your way back, all wearing a 30-pound ruck pack. Kiki Dixon is the third member of our broadcast team as she is down on the competition field. Guys, who builds a hill in the middle of a baseball field? Rogue. Now getting up this thing with the Go Ruck pack and a sandbag is only half the battle. Getting down with a little bit of grace is the other half. Thanks. Thank you, Kiki. And that hill is deceptively steep as you take a look at the 2015 CrossFit Games champion, Ben Smith. Well, it's crazy here. This is really the first time we've seen Ben in live competition since 2019, being nearly two years removed of the games. Chandler Smith, another athlete in this opening heat. He has finished in the top five both times he's been here at the Rogue Invitational. You got a ruck, you got some odd object implements, a lot of grunt work out there. That, to me, screams Chandler Smith. Ten seconds before the start here. 41 total reps in this event. Keep an eye on the left of your screen for the updated scores for each athlete as they progress through event number one, Go Ruck. And we are underway. They first have to pull that wheelbarrow to the Zeus rig loaded with 275 pounds. There are 41 total scored repetitions in this event. And in lane number five, it's Andre Uday who is in the lead and he will be the first man to the log. And a lot of this is just things outside of things that are normally tested at say obviously in your affiliate but even with these ruck packs what i thought was really cool in the athlete briefing yesterday is that go ruck talked about how they redesigned this pack after the 2019 game so i should say, I should say the carnage of the 2019 ruck and they they redesigned it they listened to the athletes and now this is actually a brand new pack that none of these athletes have used before there was a lot of friction on the lower back for some of those athletes, a lot of raw spots, and Go Ruck took that feedback and has made that pack much more manageable. Still 30 pounds on this. Now, this is where we're going to see how it really affects the athletes as Andre Uday 
and Sam Quant, Heinrich Hapalainen as well, onto the rope lines. Hapalainen is in the red shirt, and that is Andre Uday. Now, if you're not used to the ruck pack, a lot of times you'll see weighted rope climbs with a vest. That means an evenly distributed weight between the front and the back. The unique challenge that these packs offer is that usually in a rope climb, you lean really far back to tuck your knees and get a big pull. You can't exactly do that, and you definitely can't do it comfortably with a 30-pound pack on your back. So it actually changes the way you climb the rope as well as add the weight to it. Five total rope climbs here after this. It is on to Modder Hill that was constructed here, here named after the crew chief of the Rogue Equipment team and his daughter, Katie Modder Henniger. And your leaders are right in the middle of the field in lane six at Heinrich Kapolainen and in lane five, that's Andre Uday, two talented Europeans who made their first ever appearances at the CrossFit Games and their first ever appearance here at the Rogue Invitational as Will Morad works his way down. He has two rope climbs remaining of his five. This is, this is the event. These rope climbs, because they're going to come back to it. So this, this is your fir first five. We saw the time caps 30 minutes, and we had the question of how, where. Where are athletes really going to get slowed down to, to warrant a time cap like that? And it's going to come down to these rope climbs. Now we have the hill. An athlete's got an opportunity to play with this, but not with the sandbags themselves. And we, we had a pleasure of walking up that. And it's not the uphill that's the most challenging part, but it's deceptively steep when you turn around and come back down. Heinrich Hapalainen will be the first man to Modder Hill, and he has three sandbags he has to carry up that incline. And again, it is deceptively steep. I mean, you got to go up and down it a little bit yesterday, and it was not easy. It, it, it wasn't easy, and I was just, <laughs> I didn't have a ruck on. I wasn't carrying a sandbag. I wasn't fatigued going into it. And it's very steep. You see Chandler Smith is in tow behind Hapalainen, but this is where you not necessarily run away with the event, but where you could lose a lot of time. There's a lot of time and steepness to feel sorry for yourself <laughs> in the middle of this, right? This is nearly the halfway point of this event because once they go back, they're gonna have to walk their way back to the rope climbs, over-unders, and then back to the wheelbarrow. Chandler Smith is on the left of your screen. He currently sits in second place. Hapalainen is ready to deposit his second of three sandbags. Sam Quant is on to Modder Hill. He's in the white shirt. And Jason Hopper is also on top of the hill. He's working his way down in the black shirt. Andre Uday, who was battling with Hapalainen for the lead, fell way back in this heat as he was not very fast on the rope, and that cost him. And we're going to see after this first heat plays out, athletes are going to look at where is the most time dedicated to this specific event, and it is on the rope climbs. The wheelbarrow took maybe 10 seconds, the over-under is another 20, but you're looking at over a minute close to two on just the rope climbs themselves, and you have to do that twice. Chandler Smith coming down to grab his last bag. He currently sits in second place in this heat with Heinrich Hapalainen, the man in the red shirt who is on the right side of your screen, in the lead. O opening heat here, first of two for the men. In event number one of the Rogue Invitation. And Hapalainen's already done and making his way to the rope. And we see a lot of different strategies, some holding the sandbag, some just resting on your shoulder like Hapalainen did. And what that allows you to do is that if you can let your arms relax, you're going to need them a lot more than, say, a traditional rope climb because of the weight. Usually when you think about adding your legs to a rope climb, it's really a leg climb more than anything else, especially for a legless, obviously. But with that pack, since it's so top heavy, is that you do need to save your arms somewhat going into the rope climbs. Chandler Smith and Jason Hopper are both done. Smith is in the white top. Jason Hopper making his first appearance in the Rogue Invitational right behind him. Your top three, Hapalainen, Chandler Smith, and Jason Hopper as Heinrich Hapalainen has already knocked out one of his last five ascents up that rope. Hapalainen working on his second rep. You know, what they said is all he needs to do is hit above the rope somewhere on the shackle or the beam. It's up to them. But we talked about the difference that this ruck make, and it's not just where the weight is placed, but how they start the ascents. As you see, he's taking a big break after that second climb. But what also takes away from it was what you'll see with the no pack is You'll try to shorten the distance you need to climb, and that's usually with a big jump. Look at Hapalainen. 
all he's able to do is just to lift his feet off of the mat. So this is a drastically different climb than a lot of these are used to if they don't use this element. Six men are on their second and final set of rope climbs. Uldis Utniks is on the left side of your screen chalking up his hands. He's in that group. Chandler Smith, Jason Hopper, Heinrich Hapolainen, Will Morad, and Sam Quant. See that dead stop climb from Chandler Smith. Now what Chandler has to an advantage is like he's just so strong. He's an athlete, you know, he's an ex-wrestler. Those athletes can handle constant movement under massive fatigue and stress. And that's why I thought this event in particular, where it's just a grind it out type event. It's, it's not high skill, it's not heavy weight. That plays into at least Chandler's background from wrestling. And Chandler Smith is trying to challenge Heinrich Hapalainen for the lead in this heat. Chandler Smith with two rope climbs remaining and he is looking to knock that number down to one halfway up now on his fourth climb. And if you look about two thirds way down the rope, you see a black line where Chandler Smith has to have his hands controlled at because of the packs. They're not allowing these athletes to drop just from the top. Yes, there's a crash pad for safety, but with the added weight, they felt like it was more appropriate to make sure the athletes showed a little bit of control before they just descended off the rope. Heinrich Hapalainen has fallen off the lead pace, and it looks like Chandler Smith has overtaken him. One final rope climb to go. Jason Hopper also with one rope climb to go. Hopper was the third man to his second set of five rope climbs, and now he sits in a tie for the lead with Chandler Smith, and Hopper is going to be the first man to try and make his final ascent. And here goes Chandler Smith. And what you see a lot is just a lot of a lot of nothing, a lot of athletes just sitting there. And what it is is that your lungs are on fire, your arms are completely smoked. It's not, it's very rare to feel like your arms are going to failure on a rope climb where you get to use your legs on. Jason Hopper is now in the lead. He is one rep ahead of Chandler Smith as they have 10 up and overs on that log. Jason Hopper has overtaken both Hapalainen and Smith for the lead in this first of two heats. And the small advantage Hopper has is that he's watching Chandler's movement, where Hopper is behind Chandler. Sure, he can see him out of his peripheral vision, but Hopper gets to see the pace at which Chandler has, and he's actually gained a rep on Chandler Smith, so Hopper is moving much faster than Chandler. And Hopper will be done first, back to the wheelbarrow. Now he has to push it to the finish line. And it looks like Jason Hopper is going to take the win here in heat number one as Chandler Smith is now just picking up his wheelbarrow. Hopper is done, and he will take the opening heat of Go Ruck here at the Rogue Invitational. Here comes Chandler Smith looking to lock up second place, and Chandler Smith is in, and we'll have to wait on the official times, but it's Jason Hopper who did it the fastest making his move on that second set of rope climbs and able to hang on to that lead on that wheelbarrow. And now Will Morad and Sam Quant. Sam Quant in the white, Morad in the black. They are on to their final set of 10 up and over the log. Over the log, pardon me. And then it's Heinrich Hapalainen in that red shirt still working on that set of five rope climbs. He was your leader after the sandbag portion of this event. Now he got to the sandbag portion because he was so fast on the first set of five climbs. But these rope climbs, as we said before, is that it can't be overstated how much a 30 pound pack adds to the difficulty of a rope climb. It's no longer, oh, have a good foot grab and I just stand my way up the rope. You are actively pulling yourself. These rope climbs are more fatiguing than even, I would say, a legless rope climb by itself without the pack. That's Uldis Utniks just going through his rope climbs as Will Morad is looking to lock up a third place finish in this opening heat, and Morad is in. Morad did not need to push his wheelbarrow that far, but chose to get the job done anyway, <laughs> and he will finish in third place. And now Sam Quant sits in fourth. I feel like this is just a really good visual of how fatiguing this event has done to these athletes because 
you're like, you're like, okay, whale barrel over under some rope climbs and a hill climb. And we just see the devastation so far in heat number one. And if I'm an athlete in heat two, I have immediately changed my initial thoughts on how this event is going to unfold after watching these athletes go. Sam Quant will take fourth place in the opening heat. Six men remain. Only two are on the log right now, and it's Ben Smith on the top of your screen and Heinrich Hapalainen, who at one time led this heat, and his pace has slowed significantly. Just absolute fatigue, and even if you watch his arms on the log, Hapalainen on the left, they're just resting there. They're not even supporting him as he goes under. We see Ben Smith where he can place his hands, manipulate his body over the log by doing so, and that just shows you how wasted his upper body is from the rope lines. Ben Smith is onto the wheelbarrow, and he is going to lock up fifth place in this opening heat. Smith is in, and the crowd salutes the 2015 <laughs> fittest man on earth. And he goes right to the water bottle and has a well-deserved sit on top of that cooler. And what you saw him is you saw him shaking his hands out, how blown up his upper body is. And here comes Heinrich Hapalainen, who really struggled in the back half of this event. And he's going to take sixth place. Four men remain on the field. A 30-minute time cap. So plenty of time for all these athletes to finish up. Uldis Upniks, Andre Uday, Alexander Carone, and Jason Smith are the four men still working as there is Alexander Carone. And this is one of those failure movements because of the pack. It's not just the pulling with the arms, but it's the endurance of the grip. And Sean, once the grip goes with this 30 pound pack, there's a, there's a little element of fear up there. It's different if you have no pack and you can just drop to the ground, but that's not really something you can do at all, if at all, safely with this additional weight. So there's just a lot of just sit there in hopes that it'll come back. Alexander Caron making his second appearance here at the Rogue Invitational. He was eighth last year in the virtual competition. Now, obviously, Caron has a lot more intensity on these up and overs than other athletes because when we say grip fatigue and failure, all that makes you do is sit there and rest. So you're actively recovering because you physically can't hold on to the rope. So clearly he has a lot of energy built up after not being able to do any of the climbs. Alexander Corona is in and he will take seventh place in this opening heat. Three men left on the field. Jason Smith, Andre Uday, and Uldis Upniks. And there is Jason Smith, 37 years old. His first ever appearance at the Rogue Invitational, but has been competing in this sport for about 10 years now. And one of the top athletes out of South Africa. Andre Uday and Uldis Upniks are the two men on the log. And Upniks has about a two or three rep lead on Uday. Upniks in the white has to go under and over one final time, and then he can get to the wheelbarrow. And Andre Uday in the middle of your screen trying to catch up to him. Upniks on the wheelbarrow looking to lock up eighth place in the heat. And here comes Andre Uday, but I don't think he's going to have enough time to catch Upniks. Upniks is in. He will take eighth. And here comes Andre Uday, and that leaves Jason Smith as the last man on the competition floor, and he is just sitting on the edge of his crash pad as Uday comes across the finish line. Yeah, since that last rope climb, he has yet to even get off the pad. Two remaining for Jason Smith. And here's where you start to see why the time cap is in there. It's, it's not the fact that athletes needed that much time to finish. But I think it's a sneaky fact that it's going to make them 
do more work. Whereas if we had, say, a 15-minute time cap, which would have been plenty for an event like this with the caliber of athletes that you have, okay, well, I didn't do the last five row climbs, and look at how difficult one climb will be. That's why we have a 30-minute time cap, because you must actively continue to compete throughout the event. So what this is doing is that it's forcing everyone to get the work done, whether you did it in 15 or you did it in 30, as opposed to say that you couldn't even get through the rope climbs and you decided, I'll just take the time cap. So what this does is it doesn't actually hurt those that finished the event, and it's forcing those that didn't to keep trying through this. Jason Smith just failed the rope climb as Jason Hopper, the man who won this heat, looks on. And, and this is the difference that the pack makes, 30 pounds in that pack. It's not like Jason Smith doesn't know how to climb a rope. No, but just think about it. Think about putting 30 pounds on your body and just walking around with that. Put a weight vest on. Think about it. We've all done Murph in some form or fashion. If you've worn a vest, for the men it's typically 20, for the women it's 14. And if you just walked around with that, it would get extremely fatiguing and you start to feel the shoulders and it digging into your traps. Now think about holding, just hold on to a pull-up bar for 15 seconds without weight. And think of the grip fatigue that goes into that. Now we throw a 30-pound pack on you. You carried a wheelbarrow. You went over and under. You've already done five of these. And what I think a lot of these athletes did is that, like I said before, most of them train with the vest, which is 30% lighter, and it's not on the back, which puts way more stress on the arms is that they probably ap approach the first five rope climbs like they've always approached the first five rope climbs. Well, these are not your regular run-of-the-mill rope climb, even if you wore a vest. That 30-pound pack, if you went too hard by just a little bit on the first half of this event, there is absolutely no recovery left in this. And you can see his grip, that elbow bend, when you don't see the arms straight, that is a classic sign of grip fatigue, which you think would almost be the opposite way. But that's what it is. And I think a lot of these athletes in this first heat, we probably won't see the same mistake in the second one, went too hard too soon, and there was not enough time on the sandbags to recover for the next set of five. The crowd really tried to get Jason Smith to the top of that rope climb, and he failed yet again. You saw Jason Hopper, he is the winner of this heat unofficially. His time was around nine minutes and nine seconds. So that's how much time is still remaining. The official time is being kept on the field right now. We will let you know when that 30 minute time cap hits, but nine minutes, nine seconds unofficially for Jason Hopper. And that's where the, the time cap for this comes in for the exact reasons that was, we were just talking about, is that it's making sure all the athletes get an appropriate dose of what this event is supposed to feel like. That you can't get away and maybe just skip. The hardest part, the oh, really, this is the event. These 10 rope climbs are the whole event. Everything else was smoke and mirrors. Like, oh look, a cool adaptive dog sled. I can make a wheelbarrow. That sounds like fun. We built a hill. Oh, look at that. And you're like, oh, by the way, I'm showing you all these sleight of hand moves. And in the meantime, I have these 10 rope climbs that you've just looked past. Rich Froning and Chris Spieler, the two men responsible for programming these events. And the crowd is trying to get Jason Smith the energy that he needs to get to the top of that rope. He's got to do it two more times, then he still has to get up and over that log 10 times and then push his wheelbarrow to the finish line. It's just a terrible feeling. It honestly is because this, for Jason, is not a fitness problem. It's he cannot hold on to that rope anymore. And he'll do whatever he can because he's a warrior out there and he's been in the game for a long time and he came here to compete, but he just can't do it. He could probably go out and run 20 miles in that pack right now but he can no longer hold on to that rope. And once that happens, there is nothing, absolutely nothing you can do. The crowd can't help you. You can't shake it out. There's nothing else that you can do but just sit there. And, you know, to his credit, he's continue, continuing to try, but he's done. He's, he's not going to get another rope climb. A, there's not enough time, and his grip is completely gone. 
30-minute time cap on this event. One man is left on the field. That is Jason Smith. And that is the horn. So they're going to call it an event. Is Jason Smith the only man in the opening heat not to finish, but he gave it a valiant effort, and the crowd really tried to help him get to the top, and Jason Smith salutes him for that. But it was Jason Hopper who wins heat number one unofficially, a time of nine minutes and nine seconds. And this is what we thought we would see when we first read this event on paper. You see the battle between Hopper and Chandler Smith is Hopper. Now, this is what I think. This is going to be very good and very dangerous for the rest of the field because Hopper at the Mid-Atlantic Challenge put on a show. Did not see that at the games this year. I think Hopper rides that emotional wave just like we see in other athletes do. So an event one or heat one win for Hopper might be good for setting him up for the rest of the weekend. And Jason Hopper will see if his top time will stick with one heat remaining and he is with Kiki Dixon. Jason, you're the very first athlete to come across the Fisher sign for the 2021 Invitational. What ways do the emotions change from the anticipation of getting things started to finally having your first crack at an event? Such a release of just nervousness, adrenaline. The fans are awesome. Uh, it was awesome. It's just, it's good to get that first event out of the way. This event has the go ruck. In what ways were you adjusting to your approach as you went through the different elements as a result of the go ruck? Yeah, I knew it was going to be heavy. The first five rope climbs were going to be bait, and I knew the, it was going to be on the, the back end of the workout where it mattered the most. And so pacing the first uh, half of it and then push the pace on the end. How are those forearms feeling? So lit up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Jason Hopper with the win in heat number one. One heat remains. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with the second heat of Go Ruck, the opening event here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
Until he starts to drop. Day one of the 2021 Rogue Invitational continues as heat number two for the men and the opening event is set. Thanks for being with us today, everybody from Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I am Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. 
Event number one is brought to you by GORUCK. GORUCK believes our way of life in America depends on those who serve. And the more we support them, the stronger our foundation as a country will be. That's why GORUCK donates 1% of annual top line revenue to various nonprofit partners who support veterans and first responders. And Chase, as we thought, <laughs> right in the middle of this event, that is the sticking point. It should be Rope Climbs presented by Ro Go Ruck <laughs> for event number one. And it all comes down to that. 10 total rope climbs at right about 16 feet that we saw was the major separator in this chipper. Yes, we have the wheelbarrow, we have the over-unders, you have that beautiful hill that Rogue made at the backside, but it's all coming down to how athletes navigate the first five and hang on for the last. Jason Hopper has the time to beat at 9.09, unofficially 10 men in the second and final heat. And Cole Sager has done very well at the Rogue Invitational and has done extremely if, well at events like this. If there's a ruck, if there's a vest, and it's a chipper style obstacle course like this, Cole Sager not only does well, but he wins this. He won 2019 Go Ruck. He won Event 5 Battleground at the 2018 CrossFit Games. He is poised to do very well, but he has to unseat your 2020 Rogue Invitational Champion and runner-up at the Games, Pat Vellner, who also fares pretty well in odd events such as this. And we are underway. It looks like Justin Medeiros may not have heard the starting beep. He is right in the middle of your screen, right next to Pat Velder. 275 pounds on those wheelbarrows as they pull them down the field, and then it is 10 up and overs on the log into the five rope climbs, and just about every athlete getting to that log at the same time. And really in the, the wheelbarrow, it's like, just don't fall over. Just don't fall over and become an Instagram highlight reel. <laughs> on the up and overs, you're not gonna beat everybody at the on the event here. Get to the ropes with enough energy and wind that you can move through the rope climbs fairly well. You see Cole Sager taking a little pause at the top. Gather himself, we're not gonna jack up our heart rates, we're just gonna get over this 10 times and then go to where the event really starts. And that's these five rope climbs in the middle. 30 pounds in those ruck packs is Justin Medeiros and Pat Vellner move to the rope at the same time. Cole Sager is there as well, and in lane eight, it's Alex Vino who's on the lead pace. But remember, in the last heat, the men who led at this point were not the men who crossed the finish line first. And they led because they went out too fast. And here's where you look at an event a little bit differently as an athlete. You're not afraid of it. You're not afraid of how difficult it's going to be. You're afraid that what if I hopped up too soon didn't know it, and then my grip goes, and then it's over. We saw what happened to Jason Smith, Andre Uday, and Uldis Upenix in heat number one. So that becomes the scary part of the event, not necessarily fa the fatigue overall as far as the test is concerned. you got to manage your work here for these five rope climbs. There is Cole Sager, who is making his third appearance at the Rogue Invitational. He was third in 2019, 11th in 2020 and has one event win here at this competition. Justin Medeiros in lane five though, is your leader right now in the heat as we have passed the two minute mark. The unofficial time to beat belongs to Jason Hopper at nine minutes, nine seconds. One rope climb remains on this initial set of five for Justin Medeiros making his first ever appearance here at the Rogue Invitational, but he is the man who comes in with the momentum after winning the CrossFit Games in August. And here's one thing that's interesting. We said it's a 16-foot rope. For most people, most games athletes, that's two points. That's if you can jump. Now with the dead stop, it becomes four. Pat Vellner has overtaken Medeiros for the lead as Vellner will be the first man to Modder Hill. Three sandbags that weigh 50 pounds. He's got a tote up that incline. Justin Medeiros is right behind him. And now the battle that many people wanted to see here is playing out early in event number one. And this is where you try to, you, you don't get a break, but there's really not a lot of intensity in the middle portion. Make sure we get down the hill safely. We pick up our ruck right away and we make our way up. You can't exactly outrace people on the hillside unless you're willing to sacrifice some of that 
that work capacity, that, that VO2 lungs in the middle part once they get back to the road. Cole Sager on his first sandbag. Saxon Panchik in the orange shorts is fighting with him for third place right now in this heat as Pat Vellner is right next to Saxon Panchik. Vellner drops his second of three bags and Vellner starting to open up a little bit of a lead now on Justin Medeiros making his second trip up Modder Hill. Keep your eye on Cole Sager just a little bit on the outside. He said, you said he's sitting in third. What Cole does in events like this is he's a hard closer. So you won't see Cole Sager come out hot, try to hang on. Cole chases people down. He's the comeback kid for a reason. It's We've seen that at the finals at the regional level. We've seen the overall weekends at the CrossFit Games, and we will see it again in an event like this with the Ruck. Pat Vellner making his final trip back down, and now he will move with some urgency to the second set of five rope climbs. The defending Rogue Invitational Champion at a cross at Nanaimo in British Columbia. Now, what Pat Vellner has, as far as an athletic background to lean on, is that gymnastics background. Pat Vellner has a lot of upper body endurance, which is what you need here. It's not about strength, it's about technique. But if you don't have the endurance and the grip strength to back it up, you're not going to fare well here on the rope lines. Vellner is through one. Justin Medeiros has now just gotten to the rope. And here comes Bjorgman Carl Gumanson on the left of your screen doing what he does and just lurking in one of those top three positions. 41 total scored repetitions in this event. Pat Vellner is through 24 of them. Bjorgman Carl Gumanson in lane number four is in third place. Justin Medeiros in lane five is in second. And now Saxon Panchik and Cole Sager are working on their second sets of five rope climbs. And Jeff Adler is making his way back to the Zeus ring. Now for this one, you can't be sloppy with your foot ground. You can get away with that in a regular rope climb. Oh, my feet slipped. I'll just grip on a little bit harder and I'll get my feet back. With this 30 pound ruck, it taxes you in ways that you've never trained for unless you have one of the, like who would think of just throwing a 30 pack on and let's just do 10 row climbs for time in my training today? You don't do that. Most of these athletes opt for the harder version in their training, which is usually legless. Well, the leg grab is a skill that I think a lot of people may under appreciate and that is evident when you look at these weighted rope climbs. There's Cole Sager working his way up the rope. He's trying to keep pace with Pat Vellner and Justin Medeiros. Vellner about a rep ahead of Medeiros on these rope climbs. Vellner is in lane six. Medeiros is in lane five. There's Guy Mahiros with no shirt and the pink shorts. He was the last man to get back to the rope. He's a rising star out of South America. See Medeiros on the right. He, last time he went up there, he tried to do four climbs, but he came a couple inches short, so he had to do a complete extra grab and pull. And Pat Vellner is the first man done with his five rope climbs, and he will get to work on his final set of ten. Up and over that log. Medeiros is taking a sizable break here, and he has one rope climb remaining. So Pat Vellner looking to track down Jason Hopper's top time unofficially of nine minutes, nine seconds, and rack up an early event win here and start off his title defense with 100 points in his pocket. And it's not a time that he knows the clocks weren't working on the field in heat one, so Pat has no idea what the time to beat is. Here comes Justin Medeiros in second place, but right behind him is Cole Sager, and now Bjorgen Carl Gumanson on the left side of your screen as we have a three-way battle for second place. Pat Veller all by himself as he is back to the wheelbarrow and looking to lock up an event win here. Now, Veller may get the win, but Sager at the top right is watching Medeiros and BKG. Here comes Pat Veller, and your defending Rogue Invitational Champion starts off with 100 points and an event win. 8.04.17 seconds for Velder. 
And now the battle for second place between Sager, Medeiros, and Bjorven Carl Gumitsen. Gumitsen and Medeiros at the wheelbarrow at the same time. Gumitsen trying to gain ground on Medeiros, and it looks like he's going to run out of real estate. Medeiros' is, wheelbarrow is down. He is in in second. Gumitsen will take third, and here comes Cole Sager in fourth. Five point difference between each spot in the standings here. So 100 points for Vellner, 95 for Medeiros. As those two are neck and neck, just separated by five points after one event. And Sager try to close hard at the end like we thought he might be able to, but just a, a little too late. Saw him on the ropes just a few seconds behind them and just couldn't close on the over-unders. What a race for second and fourth. That's Kima Heros on the right of your screen. Lazar Zhukic is on the left. Still plenty of time to go here in this event as Saxon Panchik is on the wheelbarrow and Saxon Panchik will be the fifth man in this heat across the finish line. Lazar Zhukic and Guy Mayeros now fighting for six. Zhukic is swerving all over his lane. Mayeros may have caught up to him, and Mayeros did not drop the wheelbarrow. Yes. May have cost him as Zhukic gets in about a second and a half ahead of the youngster from Brazil. And that's tough. And if you know, this is such a deep field here at the Rogue Invitational, is that towards the end of the weekend you start seeing where those little places start to add up. You can't have that if you're trying to get in the top three. Here comes Travis Mayer. He is in. And that leaves a pair of Canadians, Jeff Adler and Alex Vigno left out on the field. Vigno is still on his rope climbs. He has one remaining, and that man, Jeff Adler, needs to finish up these 10 reps and then get back to the wheelbarrow. And for Vigno, Vigno's a lot like Jason Smith. It's, they're one of the bigger athletes in the field, and when you start adding weight on top of the body weight that you're already carrying, is that it does have an impact if you don't have the stamina in your grip to sustain that. And here comes Jeff Adler. His first appearance here at the Rogue Invitational, and he is across the finish line. Look, leaves Alex Vino as the only man left. Vino is the biggest athlete in this heat at 208 pounds, as Vellner Mayer and Cole Sager recap their events. Now operating at 240 <laughs> with a 30-pound ruck pack. And we talked earlier about the pack having a massive impact on being able to lean back. That lean back or that layback is what usually allows an athlete not to overuse their arms because they can extend them and then just tuck the knees. When you don't have the ability to do that, it forces your arms to be used much more than you really do in your normal everyday training. And you can either adapt to that or it can catch you by surprise. And we've, we've seen that happen a few times with some athletes here this, today. Yima Heroes, Cole Sager, and Justin Medeiros have worked their way back down the field to help Alex Vino get across the finish line. And Cole Sager, as he often does in competitions like this, was the first man there. And he's trying to pump up the crowd here at Dell Diamond to get Alex Vino across the finish line. He has plenty of time to do it. 30 minute time cap here. And now final up and over for Vino. And he gets back to the wheelbarrow. Alex Vino, many people forget, back in 2016 when Matt Fraser started his run at the CrossFit Games, Matt Vino was the only other man that year to sit atop the overall leaderboard. He was on top after two events, and it was all Matt Fraser after that, as Alex Vino is in, and that will do it for event number one. But it's Pat Vellner.
who takes the victory, locks up 100 points as he looks to defend his Rogue Invitational title here at Dell Diamond. When I left from Valner, it's just how consistent he was from start to finish. He never really went out too fast on the first climbs, never slowed down on the second, and all by himself at the end of the event. This is the start Velner needs if he wants to regain or keep that title of Rogue Invitational Champion. And another solid performance for that man, Cole Sager. Guim Hayeros is able to make some ground up there late in the event. But it is Pat Velner who wins the heat, takes the event, and he is with Kiki Dixon. Pat, congratulations on this event win. You're the defending champion coming into the Rogue Invitational. How hungry are you for that title this year? I mean, I'd love to grab it. I think right now it's sort of the tale of two champions right now, right? So I think a lot of people have painted the weekend as seeing how Justin and I stack up. And it's going to be a fun show all weekend. We just kind of showed it. So I think we're for sure keeping an eye on each other. And it's going to be exciting all week long. We look forward to keeping an eye on the action as well. With the go ruck, it seemed to impact the rope climbs the most. Where did you feel it? Yeah, that's exactly it. I think everybody, as we finished, you could hear everybody screaming about the last two reps on the rope climb, how it really all piled up, and those last two reps could take anywhere from a minute to three or four minutes, depending on how well you strategize the workout. So it was really won and lost in the rope climbs, and it kind of showed who had that upper body endurance today. You had it today. Congratulations. Thanks, Pat. It's my pleasure. I hope it lasts into tonight. Pat Valner, 804.17 seconds, wins. Go Ruck locks up 100 points and starts his title defense off extremely well. It's 100 points and a good bicep pump. <laughs> two, two things I'm all about. <laughs> little bicep pump never hurt anybody. The men are done. Stick around, everybody. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, the women will be up next as they take on event number one, Go Ruck, here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas, as day one of the 2021 Rogue Invitational continues here. The women are up next for their opening event. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I am Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. We saw the Ruck Pack create a little bit of havoc for the men in event number one. Just a little bit, and it's right there in the middle of that big Zeus rig. 10 total rope climbs with that 20 pound pack that the women will be wearing. We have the wheelbarrow pull, we have the over-unders, we have that wonderful hill climb that Rogue built at the back end as we make our way here. But as we saw for the men, we will see the same thing for the women, if not even more prominent, is how they're gonna navigate those 10 total rope climbs from start to finish. Event one is presented by Go Ruck. Go Ruck believes our way of life in America depends on those who serve, and the more we support them, the stronger our foundation as a country will be. That's why Go Ruck donates 1% of annual top line revenue to various nonprofit partners who support veterans and first responders. Carrie Pierce making her final appearance at a competition. She is retiring after the Rogue Invitational, and when it comes to upper body pulling, there might not be anybody better than her. No, and there's not a lot of bicep envy I have, but this is definitely <laughs> one of them. Carrie Pierce is an athlete that didn't get her chance at the games this year after having such a great performance last year. And this, like you said, Sean, is going to be her final hurrah from the individual scene. But the woman to her left in lane number nine, Sam Briggs, the ageless wonder, the engine from England. And by the way, is a bit of a bicep prowess herself when it comes to upper body endurance. So these are two acts that I think will fare very well in this first heat of women. Opening heat is underway, and looks like some athletes got a little bit of a jump there as they get to their wheelbarrow drag down the field. 175 pounds on that implement. After this, it is to the log for 10 up and overs. And what we have here is just a buy-in to the first five rope climbs. Now, what I love here is that the only real difference in this event between the men and the women is the weight on the sled and the weight in the packs. But after that, it's all the same. They're doing the same number of road climbs. It's the same height. So it's gonna be really important to manage your work early because as we said on the men's side, it's about grip fatigue and upper body endurance. So really getting to the ropes faster isn't necessarily that important at the beginning of this event, but how you navigate the rope climbs. And a lot of times is that these athletes are so fit and they'll feel so good, they'll start too fast. And it's one of those that you have to force yourself to take some breaks in between the climbs as not to blow up too soon in the first half of this event. Carolyn Prevo and Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Emma McQuaid were three of the first women to their first set of five row climbs, 20 pounds in that ruck pack that they are wearing. And we've talked about it a lot. That thing makes a huge difference when it comes to climbing a rope. Absolutely, and it has to do with the lean back. If you look at Carrie Pierce, what a lot of athletes will do is that they'll hold onto the rope tuck their knees into their chest and lean back. But Kerry has a very short pull. Now, I can't really determine if that's good for her relative to what I would actually encourage other athletes to do. And with that layback, having 20 pounds behind you is gonna put on way more stress. And a lot of it is gonna take away from your confidence to lean back with straight arms. That might really throw some athletes for a loop. So the, the, the difference between the pack and say the vest, since it's so uneven, will throw a lot of athletes off if they're not used to training with this. There is Jacqueline Dahlstrom. Trains out of Spain. And she is on the lead pace here. At the 19 rep mark is when the women will leave the rope and move on to the sandbags that they have to move up Modder Hill. Named for the crew chief here, the rogue equipment team, Rick Modder. They did a heck of a job of building that thing that you see looming in the back. 41 total repetitions in this event, and we are approaching the three minute mark of the first of these two heats. You look at the field, it's, it's really hard to determine 
just by looking at an athlete who's going to do well at the rope climbs. A lot of times you would say, okay, the taller athletes, because they can go less pulls, but not with the pack. Or the gymnastics athlete, You're like, yes, of course, but not necessarily with the pack. And a lot of this has to do with how is your grip strength and grip endurance? How efficient are you at using your legs to save the arms for the pulls? And Turi Helgadotter will be the first woman done with her initial set of five rope climbs. Jacqueline Dahlstrom is behind her, and Carrie Pierce is also off the rope. Terry Helgadotter making her first trip up the hill, followed by Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Pardon me, that was not Carey Pierce. I, that might be Emma Carey in lane eight. Well, Emma Carey, the youngster, on the lead pace there. The 17-year-old making her way down. As Turi Helgadotter and Jacqueline Dahlstrom are battling for the lead. Danielle Brandon is in the middle of your screen. She's reaching the top of the hill on her first sandbag carry. Next to her is Turi Helgadotter on her second. Brandon went up the hill fairly quickly, quicker than we've seen anyone do, but Helgadotter still in the lead. And you know, while Helgadotter is going into her last one, and she's one of the most underappreciated athletes, I think, in the field, just because of having a daughter last name. But you know, she's been around this sport forever. I could date all the way back to nearly 2012 that she's been here, and she keeps returning. She keeps getting better. She just you know, got a couple daughters in the field that tend to take away from the namesake as far as Turi's concerned. She and Jacqueline Dahlstrom continue to lead here. At the 22 rep mark, they will go back to the rope. And this is where we've seen some lead changes uh, with the men, at least, as Helga Dotter is now done and heading back to the rope for five more rope climbs. All by herself right now in first place. You saw this on the men's side, is that if you're off first, then the question remains is, how'd you get there? Did you get there the right way? Did you go a little bit too hard too soon? Usually the answer was yes <laughs> in the last two heats that we saw on the men, but I'm curious to see how Turi hangs on. And as you said earlier, Sean, what the sneaky teenager that is Emma Carey. Emma Carey right now fighting with Jacqueline Dahlstrom for second place in this heat. Danielle Brandon is heading back to the rig. She's taking her time. She's at a walking pace right now. She spent a lot of energy on Modder Hill. Terry Helgadotter with four reps remaining on the rope, and here comes Carrie Pierce. We talk a lot about the difficulty of the pull. Are you using your legs appropriately? How much is that pack interfering with your grip strength? And one of the things that I feel like doesn't get trained is actually how to appropriately descend down the rope. You see a lot of athletes that do so well, but I think the thing we see here is that we say we, there's a black line about a third of the way up on the rope that the athletes have to control too. And what that's doing is maybe an unforeseen element that a lot of these athletes aren't prepared for because everybody does a good job of descending with no weight. And the fact that you have to stop right before the bottom is slowing them down to a point that's actually extending the intensity on the grip that these athletes probably didn't plan for. Turi Helgadotter is trying to stay ahead of Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Emma McQuaid. Also, Emma Carey on the lead pace as well, but Helgadotter about a half a rep ahead of them right now on the second and final set of five rope climbs. First of two heats for the women here, the first of seven events that they will face throughout this weekend. There goes Emma Carey, just 17 years old. And she has a bright future ahead of her in this sport. I like what Emma Carey is doing is she'll wrap her feet and then tuck her heels right underneath her hips. And that allows her to have a lot more aggressive of a pinch with the feet and utilization of the legs to help save the arms a little bit on the way up. See Helga Daughter doing the same thing, but a lot faster as a transition from grab to stand. One rope climb remains for Turi Helgadotter. And then she will move back to the log for her over-unders. 
We heard Pat Vellner talking about what the real hardest part was, and it was these last two when you're at your ultimate near failure of your grip, fatigue of the arms, your heart rate's jacked, and these last two are a lot of maybe reps. Maybe I should start now. Maybe it's too soon. Maybe I'll make it. And when it comes to that, it, it, it takes away from the confidence as you climb 20 feet in the air. Terry Helgenauter back to the log. 10 over-unders for her. And then one final push of the wheelbarrow across the finish line. And she will look to lock up the win here in a heat number one. Emma Carey and Jacqueline Dahlstrom fighting for second. And it's Danielle Brandon and Emma McQuaid in a battle for third. At the 37 rep mark is when Helga Dotter will move back to that wheelbarrow loaded. With 180 pounds. Emma Carey is now done. Carey has moved by herself into second place as Turi Helgadon. <laughs> is in and Turi Helgadon will take heat number one of Goruck. Just a great, consistent performance from Turi from start to finish. She was able to keep the pace on her rope climbs relatively quick from the first five to the last five. I was very impressed with the pace she could sustain through those climbs. Emma Carey has now separated herself from Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Emma McQuaid, although the two of them are also on they're over-unders along with Carey, but Carey will be done first, and she will move back to the wheelbarrow for the final time for the 17-year-old with an impressive opening performance here in event number one. And she's looking at a second-place finish here in the opening heat. A great time, right about the 10-and-a-half-minute mark is when she'll be done in the cap of 30. We didn't see a lot of athletes on the men's side finish even around the 10 minute mark. Amazing job. Here comes Emma McQuaid. And McQuaid is across in third place in the heat. Now Jacqueline Dahlstrom will finish up. Sam Briggs, Carrie Pierce, and Danielle Brandon are on their over-unders. Pearson Briggs in the middle of your screen. Briggs is in the red top. Pierce is in lane number 10. Briggs got they are neck little, and neck. Briggs got there a little earlier than Brandon, but Pierce is moving a bit quicker. And Brandon is, and she actually caught up to Briggs. And now a race to the finish. This will be for fifth place in the heat. Sam Briggs just ahead of Carrie Pierce, who is swerving a little bit more. Briggs is done. She is in, and Carrie Pierce will come across in sixth place in heat number one. That's the one thing about the wheelbarrow that if you've never pushed one of those is that it, you have to have a very focused intensity when it comes to the wheelbarrow. It's not just one of those... You see a lot of athletes do this on an assault bike. They'll throw their body side to side, and it's actually a very linear movement. So you got to be careful, and that's what happened to Pierce, weaving in and out. Danielle Brandon is across. Leaves Emily Rolf, Ariel Lowen, and Carolyn Prevo still on the field. 30-minute time cap, so plenty of time here. That is Emily Rolf in lane number three. Her mother was a former Olympian for Canada. She threw the javelin. See what Rolf is doing is she'll, she'll wrap her feet, reach her hands up, and then flare her elbows out to the side. And what that's trying to do is relieve a little bit of tension from her grip. So it's not necessarily a technique to climb with, but it's a technique where she's trying to give her hands a break. So she's locking her feet in so much, barely holding on with her fingertips to try to give her arms a little bit of a rest as she gets up the rope. And Rolf making her first appearance here at the Rogue Invitational. 
been to the CrossFit Games twice as an individual. And that is Carolyn Prevo. Prevo continues to work on her rope climbs. Carolyn Prevo has won 11 national championships in four different <laughs> sports. I mean, we, we talked earlier in the beginning of the show this morning about Tia's athletic prowess across multiple sports, but it cannot be understated about Prevo's performance and, and elite level performance in those as, to boot. Carolyn Prebo finishing just outside the top five last year at the Rogue Invitational, the event that was held virtually. We approach the 14 minute mark. Three athletes left on the field Carolyn Prevo, Ariel Wellen, and Emily Rolf. Looks like Prevo has two, Rolf has one more to go. Lowen won as well. And that last climb's the, the, <laughs> the sketchiest one because you know you need to finish, but it's a long climb. Ariel Lowen, you saw her competing here in her home state. She's out of Midland, Texas. See Rolf still opting to try to give her hands a little bit of a break. And when she locks in, what she'll do is she'll drive her elbows closer together, and that's how you want to climb. So she flares her elbows out, tries to give her hands a break, and then drives the elbows in to start her pull again. Rolf has made the touch, and she is done. And she will head to the log for her over-unders. Ariel Lowen is also on the log. So Carolyn Prevo, the only woman left on the rope climbs. 37 is the mark that both Rolf and Lowen need to hit before they return to the wheelbarrow one final time. Final rep for Rolf. She took a look down the field to see where Lowen is, and Rolf is going to be first in the wheelbarrow, but Lowen is right behind her. And it's going to be Emily Rolf who wins this race. She will take eighth place in the heat. Ariel Lowen will lock up ninth, and it's Carolyn Prevo who still has one rope climb to go. Talked about those 11 national championships in four different sports. Two of those came in ice hockey with the University of Wisconsin program. And this is the waiting game. Waiting for your grip to come back. When do you feel confident enough that you'll make the climb? And again, with this 20 pound pack, you have a dead stop. You, you don't get any jump. You don't get any momentum off the pad. And what usually takes two pulls is now taking upwards to five and maybe six. And you're doing that with grip that you can't trust with just effort. Prevo has made the touch and she is done. And she will have plenty of time to close out her event here. Remember, one heat remains. So her to there. Yeah, like she just turned. 10 over-unders for Carolyn Prevo. And you're in the second heat looking on. You start thinking about just the map. How, what's the fastest time we've seen? We, we can look to the men for that. Turi pulled up right about a 9.30, or, or right under 10 minutes for her time. How long did it take her on the rope climbs? And then you start playing the math game. Okay, what do I need to do? Okay, shave off five seconds every rest break. Maybe that will get me ahead. Because again, it's it's not necessarily fitness dependent when it comes to the climbs. And Carolyn Prevo is in, and with that, every woman gets fine. in inside that 30-minute time cap. And it's Turi yeah, Helgadotter on the left of your like screen who demolishes this event. Nine minutes, 32 seconds her time. And she will wait around to see if that will 
last with one more heat to go. <laughs> you see the, the collection the athletes talking about how sketchy the last touch is, is to remove one hand from the rope <laughs> and then try to hit the shackle sitting on the Zeus rig. But Turi Helgadotter, we, the question is, if you're out first, can you finish first? And Turi Helgadotter, who was done with the sandbags well ahead of the rest of the field because of how fast she was on the first five climbs, wasted no time. Now that doesn't mean to say she raced, she wasted no time. She had the perfect pacing, she had good smooth climbs, locking in her feet, being very efficient with her movement. That is going to be the key to being successful in this event. Can you utilize your feet and your technique and maximize your grip strength and stamina to get through the fa as fast of the climbs as you can? Because there's a big difference when this particular movement between you and other people's ability. It's not just based off effort. Let's go down to the field where Kiki Dixon is with Turi Helgedown. Turi, this event comes all down to those weighted rope climbs. What was your approach to pacing on those? Uh, so after watching the men's heats before, uh, I decided to take a little bit, like one more shake than I wanted to in the first five, and then just see how I feel on the way back. And luckily, my grip didn't die, so I survived. You certainly did survive. Last year, you were a part of the Invitational online. How big of a difference is it from that to this? Uh, wow, well, this is obviously a lot more fun. <laughs> um, online, it was it was almost like you were training alone. Nobody was up allowed to cheer for you or anything, and no music. So this is a whole another experience. I like it a lot. <laughs> Us too. We're happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Terry Helgadotter with the time to beat at nine minutes thirty-two seconds with one. Heat remaining. Emma Carey, second place at 10.28. And then it's Emma McQuaid, followed by Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Samantha Briggs, rounding out the top five. Carey Pierce just two seconds back of Briggs. Take a quick break. When we come back, heat number two for the women of Go Rock here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
Ten seconds. Stand by. I think we did it. I think we did it. All right. Big round of applause for you, audience. I don't think we could have done it if it wasn't for you guys. I appreciate your quietness during the, the 10 seconds. Speaking of, we're going to bring our athletes here momentarily, our female athletes. Heat number two. We're talking some superstars in this next heat. And then, of course, we have our legends. They'll be joining us a little after that. We're not even halfway done. we got a whole evening full of activities. Record breakers, our strong men will return. And then our evening under the bright lights. Event number two, so much action, and this is just day one. Beaver side one. Beaver side one.
Opening day of the 2021 Rogue Invitational continues here from Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas. Thank you for staying with us today, everybody. I am Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. The first heat for the women in their opening event has just taken place, and it's Turi Helgadotter who has the top time as we have one heat remaining in Go Ruck. And the word of the day is rope climbs. Well, it's two <laughs> words, but you guys know what I'm saying. If you've been watching along with both the men and the women as far as heat one, it is about those rope climbs in the middle. However, we have an out and back chipper. It starts with that wheel barrel you see in the front of your screens. We'll go to Zeus, 10 over unders, but the 10 total climbs, five in the front half, five on the back half of those 16 foot weighted climbs with that 20 pound go rock. We have that nice hill that Rogue made just for this event, but it's going to come down to the rope on Zeus. And Turi Helgadotter did what we thought other athletes should do, is watch the previous heats, adapt the plan to your skill set, and then use that on the competition field. And she has the time to be coming into the second heat. Catherine Davis out of the former two-time fittest woman on earth taking the field. Ten women in the second and final heat. Two women to watch are right in the middle of the field, starting with Laura Horvath, who comes in with some momentum after finishing second at the CrossFit Games. And better momentum than she did the first time she finished second at the CrossFit Games, which was in 2018. And Laura Horvath is an athlete that excels in events like this, and more so with events that require massive amounts of grip, upper body strength. We know her Achilles heel has always been a handstand push-up, but that doesn't mean she has a strong upper body. She has a wonderful pulling athlete, and she has that grip strength from her background as a rock climber. And then you have the greatest athlete to ever grace the competition floor, and that is Tia Toomey, who won the Go Ruck in the 2019 Rogue Invitational. So first, second from the games, first place coming to defend her title from last year's Rogue Invitational. I think we're in for quite a show between these two athletes all weekend long. All these women will be trying to chase down Turi Helgadotter, who put up a time of nine minutes, 32 seconds, in the first of these two heats. Ten seconds. Stand by. Second and final heat underway. And we begin with that wheelbarrow pull down the field. 180 pounds on that apparatus, and it is Laura Horvath who is out front early, right in the middle of your screen. Sean, you said earlier that she's having a great training offseason since coming off the games, and that's not what she had two years ago after the 18 games, where she just couldn't seem to find a rhythm. She had some injuries, but Laura Horvath had one of the best performances ever at the cross against for an in individual. Unfortunately, she's doing it at the time where we have the greatest athlete competing in the sport, and that is Tia Claire Toomey. And Tia Toomey methodically working her way through these over-unders. Five rope climbs after this, 41 total repetitions. You can see that in the black box on the left side in our scoring readout. And this is the pace you want to see to start things off. Tia Toomey so chill. So relaxed. They all got there within five seconds of each other. Now, this is where I want to see athletes' technique coming in. You'll see it change as they get tired, but you actually want a very straight arm position as you tuck those knees to your chest. And I feel like Laura Horvath does a very good job of that because that's very reminiscent of what rope climbing, or not rope climbing, rock climbing is. is the, the misconception is you keep your arms close to your body and you don't overextend. And that's actually quite the opposite of what you're supposed to do. And Horvath is doing that. Watch, she'll reach up, completely straighten her arms and let her legs tuck up and then reach up again. So she's never in a contracted, compromised position when it comes to the climb. At the 19 rep mark, the athletes will move on to the sandbags that they have to carry up to the top of the hill that Rogue has constructed here in center field. 
Laura Horvath is through 17 of her 41 reps. Annie Thorostoner and Gabriella Magala are there as well as you take a look at uh, Tia Toomey. Toomey had a little bit of a misstep or a missed tag on her last climb. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that's detrimental, but you have enough of those where it adds an extra climb, an extra five seconds to the climb. It does add up if you can't clean that up. Now, I'm pretty sure she will because then you realize, okay, on my next climb, I have to reach a little bit higher on my second to last pull to make sure I get those four inches I need for the final one. Haley Evans is also on the lead pace as Laura Horvath is now done with her first set of five, and she will be the first woman to move on to the sandbags. Time to beat belongs to Turi Helgadotter. Nine minutes, 32 seconds for her unofficially. Now, Turi was off the rope at 3.25 when she set her time. Poor Bath is over 40 seconds ahead of that pace. And I was like, okay, where is Horvath going to give up some ground? Nowhere. There's nothing in this event that's bad for Laurel Horvath. In fact, as we work our way through this, now that we're on the Sandbag Hill, this is actually very good for her because if you look at the battleground in 2018 where she won, it had things like a weighted run. It was a vest. It had rope climbs and dummy carries, and she destroyed that event. So unless Laura mispaces her rope climbs, I really don't see anyone in this field that's going to take her. Four women are on the sandbags, make it five women. Laura Horvath is in the lead. Tia Toomey and Annie Thoris daughter are fighting for second. Haley Adams is on the hill as well, and Gabriella Magala. Amanda Barnhart just getting there on the bottom left of your screen. You just saw the shadow. You can see her now on the left side. She just hoisted her bag up, and that's her first ascent up the hill as Laura Horvath is on her third and final bag. This really is a place where you can push the pace a little bit. And yes, it's going to jack up your heart rate and get you out of breath a little bit. But since you have to rest so much on the rope climbs, you can actually afford a little bit more intensity than you may think because it is just going to tax your legs and your lungs to a certain extent, but you will get that back on the rope climbs. Laura Horvath is done. Annie Thor's daughter is done. And Tia Toomey is finished as well. So the three of them working their way back to Zeus for five more rope climbs. 9.32 unofficially the time to beat, and they are all shaking out those arms <laughs> on the way back. As they should, because this is where the event lies. It's the second five rope climbs. Your overall leader, leader Turi Helga daughter, she got back to the ropes at about 5.33. So again, these athletes are still maintaining about a 30 or 40 second lead on the time to beat. But now we have a race on the rope, and unfortunately, this all comes down to how well you can pace out your breaks. There's only so much energy or effort you can put in to where you set yourself up for a big mistake one, as you get towards that fifth climb. Gabriella Magala is also onto the rope for the final time. She is the athlete on towards the bottom, was on the bottom of your screen. She just passed out of view. Haley Adams is back as well. So now five women on their final set of rope climbs. Mal O'Brien is working her way back to Zeus, as is Christy Aramo O'Connell, Annie Thorsutter, Tia Toomey, and Laura Horvath, all through 24 of the 41 total repetitions at the 27 rep mark is when they will move back to the log for their over-unders. I think Tia just overtook Laura Horvath as she got up for her third climb before with Annie on the right, so Horvath had a big break after the second climb, and Tia took advantage of that. Tia Toomey is now your new leader in this heat, 9.32. That is the unofficial time to beat. Belongs to Turi Helgadotter. Six minutes and 19 seconds and counting have gone by in this second and final heat of this opening event here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Lead changes again with Annie Thoris' daughter just to the right in lane number four, middle of your screen. She's got up ahead of Tia Toomey. Thoris daughter is now through four of her second five rope climbs. Tia Toomey sits in second place, and it's Laura Horvath in third. You start to think about maybe Horvath's pace in the first five was just a little too quick, 
because a lot of times you don't feel bad. She probably felt great the whole time, and it doesn't hit you until about two reps later. Horvath is now through her fourth rope climb, and there goes Annie Thoris' daughter in the black pants with a white stripe on the side. Tia Toomey right next to her, so it looks like the two of them will move to the log at about the same time, but Thoris' daughter now starting to open up a bit of a lead on Toomey as Toomey took a little break there in the middle of her final ascent, and now 10 over-unders for Annie Thoris' daughter. Now you gotta go. You're not gonna fail the wheelbarrow, but you can lose time on the logs. Annie Thoris' daughter making her second appearance here at the Rogue Invitational. Her last was in 2019 when she finished in third place overall. And Tia Toomey has joined her on the log. And now Laura Horvath is done with her rope climbs and she is moving on to the log. She is back now in fifth place as both Gabriella Magala and Haley Adams have moved ahead of her. Thoris' daughter is done. Now to the wheelbarrow. One final push to the finish line and Annie Thoris' daughter looking to lock up an event win here. And Annie Thoris' daughter continues her incredible year with an event win to start her 2021 Rogue Invitational. Gabriella Magala has passed Tia Toomey. Magala looking to lock up second place. She is in, and now Tia Toomey will take third. She will earn 90 points. Haley Adams is on the wheelbarrow. Looking to come in in fourth place as Turi Helgadotter now sits in fifth place in the event. She had the top time in the opening heat. Adams is across. Here comes Laura Horvath. And Laura Horvath, as we said, is like I thought she wasn't going to yield anything to anybody, but I think the biggest battle was the pace that she had on her first five climbs, and that ended up blowing her up on the second five. Fifth place in the heat will be good enough for fifth place in the event for Laura Horvath, who had the lead for a good portion of that event, but surrendered it on the rope climbs as we take a look at Mal O'Brien, who is right now your leader on the field. 17-year-old Phenom making her first ever appearance here at the Rogue Invitational. And now O'Brien back to the wheelbarrow. Mal O'Brien is done. And she will take sixth place in this heat, 9.52.33 seconds. Four athletes left on the competition floor. Kristen Holta, Chrissy Aramo O'Connell, Amanda Barnhart, and Katrin David's daughter. And David's daughter's on the right side of your screen, stretching out. She just left the view, but she is still on her rope climbs. It's honestly not that much of a surprise to see David's daughter in that position. I mean, if you know her history with rope climbs, that was more legless. That kept her out of the games in 2014, but created the competitor that we have now from that. But it's still, Katrin David's daughter's, one of her biggest weaknesses is upper body pulling endurance. Everybody knows that. Now, if this were inverted on her hands, completely different story. Almost a tale of two athletes between her and Laura Horvath. Christy Aramo O'Connell just ahead of Kristen Holta on the wheelbarrow. Aramo O'Connell is going to hang on to that lead and she will cross to finish in seventh place. Kristen Holta right behind her takes eighth. Amanda Barnhart and Katrin David's daughter left on the floor. Two athletes that have very similar weaknesses in upper body pulling endurance. You see that with high volume muscle ups. You see that a lot with, you know, high volume rope climbs. That they're, they're good at rope climbs and even legless, but as we said before, the pack changes the rope. And the other thing that changes it is that pad. That pad to the left, we said, deadens your ability to jump to the rope. And the pack only makes it less, or I say more impactful of your ability not to be able to do something like that. Catherine Davis' daughter closing out her event here in her third appearance at the Rogue Invitational. Her best finish was fourth in 2019, the event that was held in Columbus, Ohio. And now Amanda Barnhart will be the final woman across the finish line as all 10 women in this heat get in well inside 
That 30 minute time gap, Amanda Barnhart, 11.46.81 seconds to close things out, but it's Annie Thoris' daughter. Eight minutes, 14.91 seconds, her second career event win at the Rogue Invitational. And a full body competition outfit, I feel like that's what I'm looking at right now, which is about perfect if you're actually thinking about a rock and rope climbs. That's the perfect <laughs> outfit for something like this. But the question was, where did Annie Thor's daughter come from? She was sitting in about third place in it. Watch her rope climb technique. Annie is one of the only people to do this. She does the natural foot grab about right through the middle, but then she results to a very old school technique is where she would use to use a Spanish climb. You didn't see it on that clip, but the, the old one where you would wrap the rope around your leg almost in a spiral. And what that allows her to do is have a much bigger grab with her legs on the rope. And Annie is so old school that she's probably the only athlete to use that technique ever. The, the side climb that you saw that Annie did is for speed. The Spanish wrap is for strength. And Annie leaned on her past competition days, and that's what's got her the win. Annie Thoros daughter, 100 points, and she is with Kiki Dixon. Annie, there was a bit of a battle going over at the rope climbs, but you had the winning strategy and technique. What was it? Well, I was trying to pace myself on the way out. We are seen on the male side, like, you could go hard, uh, but I was one on the second set of rope climbs. And even on the way back on the rope climbs, I'm like, I feel surprisingly good. Maybe I should go faster. And then as soon as I finish the third one, I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> My grip might be failing right now. Um, and then I saw the three of us all have one rope climb left. And I don't know, I'm here to take chances. So I just took a chance and thankfully it paid off. <laughs> Speaking of chances, this onesie, as a fellow fan of a onesie, what was the inspiration behind it? Well, actually, like, I have burns since 2015 when I got my heat stroke. I got, like, severe burns in my back, and I still have the scars from it. So I had this onesie when I was pregnant, and it was perfect throughout my pregnancy. And then I was like, oh, we have the rock. I am going to wear this so I don't get burns on my back. So that's the reason why. <laughs> I like it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Annie Thoris' daughter, her second career event win here at the Rogue Invitational. A fan favorite, and she takes the time to acknowledge the crowd and almost forgot to bring her rucksack with her. <laughs> Little consolation prize for a first place finish. Good crowd on hand here at Dell Diamond in the opening day of the 2021 Rogue Invitational. We'll take a look at the top five finishers from that last heat are unofficially the top five in this event. Annie Thorosauter, 814.91 seconds. Again, the top five in the final heat, the top five uh, in the event, Gabriella Magala, 832.81 seconds. And it's Tia Toomey who finishes third, followed by Haley Adams and then Laura Horbath. A lot more action to come today. We're going to take a quick break, head over to the Rogue Iron Game desk and Pat Sherwood and company, but stick around as the CrossFit action will continue. If you miss watching guys like Rich Froning and Chris Spieler and women like Annie Sakamoto and Julie Fouché and Tanya Wagner will stick around because they're coming up next. The legends take the field when we return to action here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
Welcome back to the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas, home of the 2021 Rogue Invitational and the Rogue Iron Game. I am Pat Sherwood, joined at the desk by China Cho, former Rogue Invitational competitor and seven-time CrossFit Games athlete. And we also have a special guest, Chris Henshaw from Aerobic Capacity. Chris, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Pat. That's nice to be here. We finally get to see those that are eager for some CrossFit competition. Event one is now in the books. How did it feel to see some of your favorites back out there on the floor? It was amazing to watch, and I was actually a little surprised that no one tumbled down the hill. I know. <laughs> that, was, that was a genuine concern. I almost fell down the hill with no backpack. Yes, that was, that hill is steeper than it looks. Chris, have you got a chance to play on the hill? No, but it's actually looking very appealing to me. I think that I need to hit that up later tonight. There you go. Yep. Perfect. Well, the athletes did not, well, I shouldn't say they didn't struggle, but at least they didn't fall down the hill. At the end of event number one on the men's side of the house, your overall standings after one event, Pat Vellner occupies the top position, followed by Justin Medeiros, two names, of course, that we expected to see all weekend long. BKG in third place doing what he does. Cole Sager in fourth, and Jason Hopper rounds out the top five. China, this was a, a fantastic event. Now that it's in the rearview mirror, what grabs your attention? Dude, Pat Vellner made a statement. He wants everyone to know that he is here to win. He led the event from start to finish. He paced it so well, making his 10th rope climb look exactly like his first rope climb. And he's showing us that he has some new tools in his arsenal. Dad he, strength, yes, husband yes. <laughs> strength. It's working. That's absolutely right. And he's somebody that, you know, hey, this was his event from last year. And he's so far holding on to the reins. Chris, looking at how Vellner did, you know, what would you say were the keys to his success? Like China said, it was his consistency, his pacing. It was really remarkable what he was able to do on those rope climbs. I'd put a watch on him because it was really fascinating to see him actually consistently hit the same amount of time climbing up the rope for all the repetitions. Not one athlete was able to maintain that kind of consistency. 
I'm glad that you brought that up because I was going to say you're, you're you're your coach and legitimately you've got the old school track stopwatch there and I saw you looking Love at the it. athletes in the field, looking at the watch, back to the athletes, back to the watch. You're like this guy is not messing around. So I was going to ask you what you were doing, but that answers my question. But China, back to you. There was also somebody else that we said you've got to keep your eye on BKG. Dude. He is like a sniper. Oh, yeah. I don't even know where he came from. All of a sudden, he's like in the running with Medeiros and Sager for second place. He's always so impressive and so underrated. He's, he is an athlete that in the past at the CrossFit Games made a fool out of me because we didn't have our eyes on him. He was just outside of the spotlight, but, but in great position after every event, and he made his move on the final day, so we're not going to let that happen again. Nope. And Cole Sager was another one that was in, incredibly impressive. Chris, thoughts on both athletes for you, both BKG and Cole Sager? Look, they're both very seasoned athletes, and, and the thing that they both have in common is their ability to assess a workout and to come up with a game plan. But more importantly, their, their maturity as athletes, they're able to make real-time adjustments within a workout. And that's what we saw out there is that these two, they want to win, but they couldn't just stick with that strategy because Pat Vellner and Medeiros were taken off, so they had to make a move. So have a plan, but don't be afraid to throw the plan out the window. You have to take risk. Love it. And there was somebody who said she was willing to take a risk out there. We'll get to her in a second, but it was it was one of the women who made us look a little silly. We didn't have our eye on her, but the, the women's competition was equally as exciting as the men. And after event one was in the books, Annie Thor's daughter occupying the top spot. Unbelievable. We've got Magal in second. Tia Claire Toomey, of course, still no worries. Third place position right now. Haley Adams in fourth. And Laura Horvath round up the top five. And Helga daughter took first place, but that was in the initial heat. And then she got beat as the second heat came up. Ah, we... We've been hashing this event out, talking about who we're going to cover, who's going to crush it. We celebrated Annie Thor's daughter yeah. for being amazing, but she wasn't in our discussions about winning this event. Not at all, but the Queen of Iceland is not going anywhere. Her third place finish at the Games, that was not a fluke, not even close. She starts this competition off with a bang and that infectious smile the entire time. What an amazing performance. Her rope climbed so steady throughout the whole thing. She didn't lead until the 10th one, and then she ran away with it. This, I mean, Annie Thor's daughter, she has been around forever. Her longevity in the sport is incredible. Chris, you've worked water with her. Tell us a bit about Annie. I mean, the thing about it is, Annie, we all thought she peaked years ago. Right. And then she comes, she has a child, and now we realize we all have a second chance in life. We all can peak once and then come back and do it again. The difference with Annie now is she's having a great time. Yep. Mm, yes, and, and, and she's been so much fun to watch. And now you think, maybe I'm going to get to watch her for years Not from now. She's just, yeah, she doesn't look like she's slowing down at all. Another woman, again, that we did not give credit due walking into this event was Megala, who ends up in the top five. I am actually so surprised with that because in 2019, Gabby got cut on the first event, which had legless rope climbs in it. And she's obviously proven to all of us and herself that she's worked on her weaknesses and now she's crushing it. She took six at the games last year and she's well on her way to have a great weekend. And that was something that you and I were talking about offline watching the event. Is anybody who's you know, some athletes struggled on the rope. Yeah. And we've all seen former games athletes, rogue invitational athletes struggle on something, and then which one of those go home, work on it, and you never see them struggle again. I, I think that's going to be the case with some of these athletes this weekend. But there were some astonishing performances, but we have to talk about the woman that everyone has their eyes on, Tia Claire Toomey, in third place. Just, just for giggles, I'm going to say, does she have anything be concerned about she didn't win the first event she's the talk of the town what's going through Tia's mind right now I had the opportunity to work with Tia before she won her first CrossFit Games and what really was appealing to me about Tia was this this unrelenting drive this desire to win and when she capitalized on victory it fueled her and she's let's face it a dominating threat right now because she doesn't lose she doesn't and let's face it Getting third place, she's not even near losing. Not this all. is a, a woman that wants to go out and establish her dominance, and right now in third place, she's sitting safe. She's in a position to still win. 
people should be worried. <laughs> Third is not bad at all. Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh oh. Because yeah, you work with a tremendous amount of very capable athletes, and there's a lot of talk about uh, some of the young women, the up and comers. Are they ready to push the champ around and really give her a run for your money? Have you seen any that have captured your attention? If so, who are they? Without a doubt, you've got to throw Haley Adams in that mix. You Great. have to. Um, here is a, a woman that that loves this sport and was bullied in high school and had to be homeschooled, and that wasn't a deterrent. She then goes to Rich Froning and goes one-on-one -on -one with him. That wasn't a deterrent. This girl's not afraid. She's willing to throw down, and at the age, she's not even 21 yet, at the age of 20, she is willing to go one-on-one -on -one against Atia. And she's incredibly fun to watch. You, you can just see that she's a fierce, determined athlete, and she doesn't care how much she has to suffer. She's going to pour her heart and soul into something. And you mentioned somebody that she trains with, Rich Froning. He not only had a hand in the programming, but he's involved in the Legends competition as well, which is the next event coming up. Some of the most iconic names in the sport on both the men's and the women's side are going to put on one heck of a show for us. Legends event number one, we've got six rope climbs, 36 clean and jerks, six more rope climbs, 30 clean and jerks, six final rope climbs, and then 24 clean and jerks, and the weight goes up each time. We're doing this in pairs, male-male and female-female. And this is going to be not so much a competition as just a showcase of what these athletes can do and to kind of celebrate them. Both of you know a lot of the people, if not everyone competing out there on the Legends floor. What are you most excited about, China? Well, I'm excited that Rogue has gotten out of the box. They're not yes. just doing a traditional competition. They're mm -hmm. doing pairs. We see partner workouts in our normal affiliates like Every Saturday at my gym, we do a partner workout. And now we get to see that live with this caliber of athlete. It's going to be so exciting and so fun. And I'm totally excited to watch the girls crush the guys. I mean, who hey, else is no excited No doubt, no doubt. I mean, these are the icons of the sport, right? The individuals that actually created the sport and why we are all here. And the fact that we get to see them, maybe not all of them in their prime, but certainly, you get to see right. a Rich Froning, who is truly a man in his prime right now, get after it. It's going to be an absolute an honor. It's going to be a fantastic event. And just so you fully understand how it works, those pairs don't need to split up the work evenly. It, it can be a 50-50 kind of deal. If I was out there competing with China, I'd make her do the lion's share <laughs> of the work. I'd do like one rope climb, sprint across the finish line, get all the, the accolades. But that's it. It's going to be great. The best in the sport out there. Don't go anywhere. Legends event number one coming up. The 2021 Rogue Invitational is brought to you by GORUCK, the rucking company building the toughest gear for rucking and training. Mayhem Athlete, train like a champion. Ram Trucks, Motor Trends Truck of the Year for the third year in a row.
Big Invitational continues here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas, as we are set for the first event of the Legends competition. I'm Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. Thanks so much for being with us today, everybody. And we get a chance now, Chase, to see some people who are, you heard earlier on the Iron Game show, these are the people who help put this sport on the map. They built this sport. Yeah, if you, if you had a wasp of Bengay and Asper cream come across <laughs> your dashboard, it is the Legends competition, and these are the foundational athletes that built this community as far as the sport is concerned all the way back into 2007, which was the very first CrossFit Games in Aromas, California. Event number one, sponsored by BTWB, rope climbs and clean and jerks. The rope climbs will always stay the same. The reps descend in the clean and jerk, and you can split the work up however you want. It's not often you'd probably see athletes argue of who's not going to do the reps, but I think in the Legends competition, it might a little bit be different, different when they were competing in their heyday. But as you said, the reps will decrease, the weight will increase, and I think this is just a very fun event to do with a paired competition. Miko Salo and Rich Froning taking the field together. Miko Salo, the last European man to win the CrossFit Games, did that back in 2009. And of course, <laughs> Rich Froning is fresh off yet another team championship at the CrossFit Games. It'd be a fun pair to watch. And then also you have Julie Fouché and Annie Sakamoto who will be competing right next to Froning and Salo. And I wonder, like, where is the, the comp competitive banter going to come from? Is it going to be more from the men's pairs or the female pairs? I saw Annie Sako Sakamoto compete in the Masters division this year at the CrossFit Games. Obviously a huge fan favorite. She's on the media team. She won her division, you saw Tanya Wagner outside, your 2009 champion, Becca Voigt, Chris Clever, Margot Alvarez. I mean, as I said before, just, I think it's just a wonderful addition to the competition because you showcase how far the sport has come, yet you tip your cap to those that brought it here along the way. I love the Legends portion of the Rogue Invitation. Chris Spieler and Dan Bailey, closest to the camera, they will be paired up. The one couple I am interested in watching here is <laughs> Jason Kalipa and Josh Bridges. This is going to be an adventure between the two of them. They talk about the odd couple between <laughs> Jason <laughs> and Josh. And no stranger of competition with each other out of the California regional over the years. But uh, a little north and south rivalry, if so to speak, coming up. The first event for the Legends is underway. They start with six rope climbs. Again, split them up however you want. They go up and over that log and... Lane 8, Becca Boyd Miller is on to her rope climbs. There's Miko Salo. He's out of you. Josh Everett also on the field. And then the pair of Dan Bailey and Chris Spieler. Josh Everett, the, uh, the pioneer and one that holds dear to the old split clean. I wonder if we'll see that as the weights get a little bit heavier. 109 total scored repetitions at the six rep mark. They will move to the barbell and perform their first set of 36 clean and jerks. And what I love about this Legends competition is that there are a lot of people out there who are fans of this sport who never saw Nico Salo compete, who never saw Jason Kalipa compete, who didn't see Josh Everett. Now it's a chance for them to learn about these, these athletes and understand I think the contribution that they have made not only to the sport but also to the community in general. And the other thing I think that's wild when you talk about legends in the sport, we do have more men here on the women's side and the only reason is because some of the legends in the sport are still competing on the individual level. Annie Thor's daughter came on the scene with all of these athletes, some before some of these, she was before Josh Bridges, she was before Rich Froning, she's 2009 royalty. I mean, it's wild to think that she's still competing at this level that came in with these legends. So far as Josh Bridges and Jason Kalipa battling with Dan Bailey and Chris Spieler for the lead here. They're all on the lead pace, as are Rich Froning and Nico Salo. Rich Froning, 34 years old, originally out of Michigan, now, of course, in Cookville, Tennessee. The 
hotbed of fitness that Rich Froning has turned that little town into. Well, it's nice to know that as you know, Rich may soon step into the master's pool of the 35 to 39, I will be stepping out of that pool <laughs> immediately. <laughs> so hopefully I'll advance to the 40 plus division once he enters that. When Godzilla steps into the, into the pond, you want to get out of that thing in a, <laughs> in a hot minute. Josh Bridges and Jason Kalipa now through 30 of the 109 total scored repetitions. Froning and Salo fighting with Bailey and Spieler for second place. And Rebecca Boyd Miller and Tanya Wagner creeping up. Looking to get inside the top three. 36 total reps combined between the two athletes. The rope climbs, again, will, they'll always stay at six, but this is your classic grace weight. 135 and 95. There is Becca Voigt Miller, who was competing as an individual this year in the CrossFit game season. And Tanya Wagner, someone we know very well, spends a lot of time with us uh, on the media team, won the CrossFit games in 2009. The, the official mom of the CrossFit media team is <laughs> what we like to say. For Tanya. And just one of the best people that you're ever going to come across if you had the privilege of ever meeting her in, in person. Just a fantastic human being. Bridges and Kalipa continuing to lead through 45 now of the 109 repetitions. It, it, you know for some of these athletes, it's this is an exhibition. This is a, a showcase of what you know the, the, the past was with, with these athletes, but I feel like after the first round, that changes a little mm -hmm. bit. It's kind of like playing two-hand touch out there on the football <laughs> field with your buddy, and then one person gets a hard shove, and now it's Game tackled. Game on, yeah. <laughs> Great to see the Legends competition back as you take a look at Jason Kalipa. Lives in San Jose, California. The 2008 CrossFit Games champion who had that fantastic comeback at that event. But in 2019 was when Rogue debuted the Legends competition. It was an individual competition uh, it, when it was, the event was held in Columbus. Another weight win. being added. Be as we're now at 155. Josh, Josh Bridges getting to work. First. And we move from Grace weight to DT weight. 155 and 105 between the men and the women, but the reps will go down to 30. So it's not much of a decrease. It's only a six rep drop from round one to round two, yet it's a 20 pound increase for the men and a 10 pound increase for the women. Final barbells for the men and the women after this round goes up to 185 for the men and then 125 for the women. Julie Fouché working her way back to the barbell. Josh Bridges and Jason Kalipa continuing to lead. Rich Froning and Miko Salo and I don't care what it is, just like you said, I don't think Rich Froning enjoys being in the second place if you're playing <laughs> yeah. you know, Name Your Game. <laughs> We're playing jacks out there, and Rich Froning's <laughs> going to try to beat everybody. Dan Bailey and Chris Spieler sit in third, and Becca Boyd Miller and Tanya Wagner sit there in fourth place trying to hold off Margot Alvarez and Kristen Clever. Clever, the last American woman to stand on top of the podium at the CrossFit Games. And the year that she did it, all the way back in 2010, her average finish place was somewhere less than th third. If you go back and look at just those place finishings of Chris and Clever in 2010, is that it was just first and seconds across the board. Uh, I think other than one event, it was one of the most impressive performances we've seen from an individual at the Games. Over back on the barbell. And Froning and Miko Salo in the background are running back to the rope for their third round of six rope climbs. Josh Bridges and Jason Kalipa are already there. So at the 84 rep mark, they will return to the barbell for 24 final reps. Again, 185 for the men, 125 for the women. Spieler and Bailey are done. They are still in third place. All these athletes are getting a, a good dose of intensity that they, they may not train with on a daily basis. I mean, you see all these athletes, they're still training, they're still working out. 
Because some are building their businesses and, and keeping those things going. Chris Spieler just opened a brand new affiliate in Park Cities. It's, and he's been in the game forever. And so it's really cool to see these athletes do things outside the realm of CrossFit and CrossFit competition, yet still very involved with community in CrossFit competition. Josh Bridges making his way up the rope. Remember at the 84 rep mark, that is when he and Jason Kalipa will head back to the barbell. And Kalipa continuing to rest Bridges back on the rope. And you want to just talk about a guy who's had some iconic moments at the CrossFit Games. It's Josh Bridges. He was a guy who always was able to perform under the lights inside the tennis stadium. And you go back to push-pull in 2014, one of our favorite events, and the yes, finish there. Absolutely. And that was, I think that's one of the first events you think of when you think of Josh Bridges. Well, the, the cool thing for Josh is that he was so passionate, but he was so passionate outwardly as well. And it was never over the top, but it was always authentic. And you could really feel that as a fan, and we got to experience that as fans and as broadcasters when we got to see that live. But there was... <laughs> I mean, make all the stature jokes you want, but there was no moment too big for Josh Bridges. And that was one of the things I really love watching him compete is that he never shied away from the challenge and he always gave everything he could for the competition itself. 109 is the mark that these guys are trying to hit. It's become a battle between Rich Froning and Miko Salo and Josh Bridges and Jason Kalipa and Froning and Salo have taken the lead here as Rich Froning is just going touch and go <laughs> on a couple of those reps. Well, it's, this could be a classic charge of Froning at the end when it comes down to the final repetitions. Kiki Dixon has a great vantage point of this competition. She's down on the field. You know, guys, there's no real hard lines on what defines an athlete in the legend division. However, we have been able to identify a few things. You've got to have a career with some longevity. And in that career, you need to be decorated. And they're also considered ambassadors of the sport. And last but not least, you need to maintain your fitness before you come out and throw down at the Invitational. In general, this division was created to honor those who laid the foundation of the sport as we know it. Thank you, Kiki. And no question that all the men and women on the competition field right now embody all of those attributes as Rich Froning and Miko Salo look like they're going to take this event just a one rep away and now done. And Froning and Salo first across the finish line. Was there ever a doubt? It's like, oh no, we're not, we're just having some fun, right guys? <laughs> and you do know at some point the, the switch got flipped inside of Rich Froning's like, hey, we're not finishing second. I think like I said, I think that was after the first round when they realized they weren't in first anymore. Josh Bridges and Jason Kalipa coming across. And that will leave Dan Bailey and Chris Spieler as the leaders on the floor. Becca Voigt Miller and Tanya Wagner, they are Towards the upper right part of your screen, Tanya Wagner on the barbell right now. She's in that light blue tank top. Now Chris Spieler and Dan Bailey making their way across the finish line. Eight reps to go for Becca Voigt Miller and Tanya Wagner. I think one prerequisite of this should have been team members. <laughs> well, the pairings oh, yeah. will change throughout the weekend. I think they might they might mix it up a little bit. And it's going to be part of the fun as well as just getting them together. I mean, not a lot of times, if ever, can you remember some of these athletes ever pairing up for something mm -hmm. or doing, you know, Kalipa went team for a little bit. Um, Dan was a part of that, but it's neat to see them pairing up. Tanya Wagner and Becca Voigt Miller across the finish line. And Margot Alvarez and Kristen Clever will be next to finish. She saved me. Julie Fouché and Annie Sakamoto are five, now four reps away from closing things out. Well, Julie Fouché had that iconic moment 
in the boot in the regional competition in 2015 when she ruptured her Achilles tendon and decided to still go out and just compete as much as she could. And think of that image of her handstand walking with the protective boot around her leg. And it was unfortunate that she wasn't able to stay healthy that year because she was coming off a great season where she finished on the podium at the CrossFit Games. But fantastic to see her back out here throwing down. Matt Chan and Josh Everett are your leaders on the floor. Now, Stacey Tovar is competing here. And she's 20 weeks pregnant. And she got clearance from her doctor. She got all the medical approvals from professionals that know way more than either of us and most people listening. And so it was a pretty neat thing to get the invite. It's her first Legends invite after her retirement. And yeah, just shows you the ability of some of these athletes as long as you can do it. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. Watch and Tovar with the <laughs> final rep, and she and Tommy Hackenbrook will make their way across the finish line. I'm just watching Matt and Josh, and I'm, I'm, they're, they're probably asking Rich and Chris why they couldn't do the Bella Complex instead, <laughs> instead of this one. Matt Chan and Josh Everett got across the finish line as well, so all the legends are in. And they are saluting the crowd. Great to see the people who you know, help put this sport on the map and growing it to what it is today. Out there showing that they are still pretty fit. And a great event to kick things off. They'll do one per day. I'm very excited about tomorrow because we talked about the intensity of today, but tomorrow might be a little different. <laughs> And the question was, is how hard are they going to go? And if Rich Froning is in your pair, you know that you're going to have to go pretty hard, <laughs> even if it's casual for Rich. <laughs> and on the other side, you have Becca Voigt and Tanya Wagner, your 2009 CrossFit Games champion. Becca Voigt still competed at a semifinal this yeah. year. So just absolutely incredible. It's like, yes, legends of the sport, but they're all still heavily involved in many different ways. Let's send it down to the field, Kiki Dixon, with two of our top teams here. You guys, it looked like you were having so much fun out there. Tanya, what was the reality of the situation while you guys were thrown down? It was 100% go, just like any other competition. At the go time, it, it, you turn it on. You can't not. Miko, you started CrossFit in 2007. How does it feel to know that you can come out here and you still got it? It's a proof of that this thing works. So it is awesome to be here. Now there was a lot of laughter and smiles before the buzzer hit, but once it was go time, did it switch for you as far as fun to competitive Rich? Yeah, it always does. I think when you got Josh and Jason, it brings back memories. And then, uh, you know, Miko was somebody I watched when I started it. And so it was cool to be able to partner with him and uh, have a ton of fun. And of course we want to win, right? We said it's not fun unless you win. So you gotta, gotta push. Thanks guys. We'll see you back out here tomorrow. And there you have it. If there's a clock, classic. we're playing to win. <laughs> that's right. Classic Rich Roning. And I tell you what, I mean, that, and that's what made these athletes great. It, there's one thing about having the ability, the training, and all that other background, but you have to have that competitive fire that just never truly goes away. And that's really what drove them to be legends in the sport. Rich Froning. Josh Bridges, Julie Fouché, the whole crew now getting together for a photo. Danny Sakamoto. Someone we know, of course, know very well, another member of, of the media team. Another just fantastic person. And Katie Henniger jump, jumping in there as well. The 2008 CrossFit Games champion. First event for the Legends is done. They'll be back tomorrow. We're going to take a break. The Rogue Iron game will take over for us. And then after that, it's event two for the Strongmen. So stick around here in Round Rock, Texas at the Dell Diamond as we continue the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
Welcome back to the 2021 Rogue Invitational here at the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Here at the Rogue Iron Game Desk, I am Pat Sherwood, joined by China Cho, former Rogue Invitational competitor and seven-time CrossFit Games athlete, and Dr. Bill, oracle of all knowledge, strongman. The Legends competition, how fantastic was that? Just to get to see all those faces you've known for so long get out there and throw down. I mean, it was such a fun thing to watch. I love the format of the event. I love the pairing. I love that the weights increased. They were not easy weights even no, at the end. No, for sure. And it was just exciting. And Dr. Bill, this is one of your first exposures to kind of CrossFit in, in, in person, isn't it? Yes, it is. I, I'm very excited by this. I love how we're taking barriers down and having all strength athletics come together. I grew up and, and that's the way it was. It was Olympic lifting with bodybuilding and everybody just trained together. So maybe we'll get that back. You and I are going to go out there afterwards and kind of hit some clean and jerk, some rope climbs. We'll be good to go. Some you, elephant deadlifts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, the the, you can pull the deadlift. I'll handle the rope climb. Okay, we'll be that good sounds to go. good. <laughs> I'll do that. We're well into day one of competition. The, a lot has happened. We have a lot left on the table. More strongmen, more cross it. But up next, we have the rogue record breakers and specifically the anvil grip, which was an event that I was unfamiliar with, but you are quite knowledgeable in this area. Well, it's in uh, reference to George Jowett, who's considered to be the father of American weightlifting, even though he was born in England and is buried in Canada. But uh, it's a, a anvil that was 172 pounds, and he, he was considered to have actually lifted it by the horn and picked it up. And a lot of people still try to do this kind of thing. It's very popular. But Rogue has an implement which actually can be plate-loaded from the bottom, and you can reach down and lift it up. It's very hard because it's, it's a basically a conical-shaped uh, iron or, st or stainless steel implement that tapers to the top and it wants to slide out of your hand. So it takes a tremendous amount of grip, particularly in the thumb and the forefinger. That's incredible. And you know, the current records right now is 240 pounds for men, 170 for women. And each competitor will get, is it three attempts to establish their best lift? Yes, it's just like a powerlifting competition where you have to have an opening weight and you have about 30 seconds to declare for the second. And then after that, you're stuck with that one. And then you have another 30 seconds to declare and keep moving up. And you pick whichever hand you would like. You can do it. And uh, you, could, you just need to get it off the ground. Stand okay. up. You have to lock it. You have to also let the weight down under control. You can't let it down because that actually looks like it slides out of your hand. That's a no lift. Oh, oh okay. Or and so, so, like so to make a lift top count. Of the rope. And, and your, uh, the judges are top experts in grip strength. So uh, Chad Clark and, and the legendary Ode Haugen uh, know all about this kind of implement. So they're not going to let this slip by. Well, we're extremely Literally. excited to see what kind of loads we're going to get off the ground here. We've got both men and women competing in the Anvil Grip event on the men's competitor field. Oh, there we have a shot right now. This is, this is about to go down live in person. Oh, that, that cylinder does not look thin. That's Jan Todd. She runs the competition. There's a lot of history there as well. Yes, Jan would know all about it. Actually, at the Stark Institute, the original Jawa Anvil lives there. So if you actually want to go put your hands on history, go to the Stark Institute at the University of Texas, and it's there. Do you think we have a chance of seeing one of those records fall today? I'd love to see that. I think that what it does is it re-energizes re the idea that this isn't just strongman, this is old-time strongman, that we're bringing up things that people used to, blacksmiths would do things that would, that would allow people to have the imagination that they were really much stronger than anybody in their village, and, and that was old-time strongman, lifting something very basic like a stone or a log or an anvil. So this is, this is the kind of thing that I'd love to see continue. How would you train for this? Like how? Like, <laughs> well, how would you train to uh, lift more weight on a deadlift? Lift more weight on a deadlift. <laughs> so you okay. do the same thing. Start you get the implement there. and you start, you start training on it because it's very specific. Grip strength is very specific, especially an implement like this. Yeah. There are people that have great grips that do different, that they have different strengths in their grip. Some people are great with, with crushing. Some people are great with supporting. Some people are great with other other types of grip. This is very specific in that it's mostly forefinger and thumb, and that kind of incorporates some of the crushing grip. I said most of the time when you think of grip training, you think of those. Yeah, that's what my dad had. The grips. There we go.
So, Bill, what are you looking for as you watch this event? So I'm looking for him, well, one, to just get a, to get a good purchase on the, on the implement and be able to stand it up. Now, he's taking, a, he's taking a top end as opposed to a bottom end. Sometimes people with smaller hands will try from the top. And you may have said this, but how high do they have to get it off the ground? You have to be able to stand up with it and okay. then let it back down under control after, the, after receiving it. the judge's order to come down. Are we looking for the knees to extend, the hips to fully open, or just break it free of the ground? No, you have to stand Top up with it depth. and then let it back down. Okay. Top pole, good lift. I would think you'd want to be near the top there for sure. It seems to me that the Rogue record breakers and Rogue in general is kind of bringing a lot of events that have a lot of historical value and maybe aren't quite as popular to the forefront. So we have 225 pounds on the anvil now. 225? Yes, and the record's 240, so these guys have been training. Okay, so he's taking a, he's taking a top end on that one. Really squeezing down. Good Ooh. lift. Wow. I say, to my eye, that looked like a he was well within his capacity. Kind of pedestrian, actually. He's got two more attempts. On the way, there we go. Lift by hand. And is this anvil common gear in any strongman facility? Yes, and good home gyms. <laughs> Would a taller athlete succeed more than a shorter athlete? Does it really matter? It doesn't really matter. It's about your grip. Got it. Yes. Back up on the fellow side, Justin up next. 225. 225. Any particular yeah. reason for the mouthpiece? Uh, some people just like the lift of the mouthpiece. Clench your teeth and you can chip your teeth doing that. Yeah. Oh, let's see what the judges say. Goes a no rep. He's going to give it another shot. Uh, he just didn't show the control at the top. Correct. No lift. Looked like it fell out of his hand. Yes, it did. It slipped. Okay, he got it. Go. He got it down. So that was a good lift. 2.30, it sounded like. 2.30 is the next call for the next athlete. Okay. Kristen up next. She's set up with 140 pounds. Starting to get into some high numbers here. Yes. Easily done. Yeah, they look clean. Very easy. Get another attempt. China, how come you're not out there? Well, my grip strength <laughs> is very. Uh, they didn't pass that. She let it down too quickly. Oh, really? Oh. Oh. oh she's not letting that's, it down that's under why control. I'm not judging. It looked like a great lift to me. The first one, yeah, I thought Still so have too. Time. Twenty seconds. They don't have weights light enough for me to do this. <laughs> Just the anvil by itself. Yes. And Dr. Bill, you said they could take as many attempts as they want within 30 seconds? Within the time limit, yes. And another shot. Yeah, I thought he said 10 seconds. Does good deadlifter equal good anvil lifter or not necessarily? Not necessarily, no. Grip specialist, you have to, it does help to have a great right, grip with a, with a deadlift, but up. it's not also a prerequisite. I think it was very specific. Now this oh. man has a large pair of hands. <laughs> it's custom built for this movement. Yes. Oh yeah, easily done. Very easy. Nicely done. Solid lift. Now notice how his hands are a little bigger, so he's actually gripped a little further down. It's just not so high up. 
He uses his hand size. So this is Ashley Munsey. Solid nice. Lip, Ashley. Good job. Wow. Very Short good. range of motion. That didn't go very far, but she stood up perfectly straight. Yep, and she got the down signal, and yeah. it was a good lift. David getting ready. 230. Still at 230 for the men. Easily done. Good, good lift. Ooh. Dr. Bill, before Rogue kind of bringing this to many people's attention, how in the world did somebody find themselves in the world of anvil grip lifting? I mean, just, you, you happen to have a buddy who's a strong man, or you know, how, how is it kept alive? I have several anvils. <laughs> <laughs> just come by your house. Yes. They're very popular. They make them in all sizes. It's great Brown to see there the good crowd lift. that drew. Notice how she kind of turns her wrist and locks into it. She turned her wrist and she held it for so long at the top, like that was clear that that was good. Yes, yeah, she turned her wrist and locked into it. You don't want to put that thing down too soon for the judge gives you the green light, you know? Correct. Oh. More chalk. When in doubt, more chalk. That's more chalk. always the answer. Magnesium carbonate. There we go, crowd. Oh, I can tell you this from 225 to 235 pounds, and it's almost like it's nailed down. It doesn't take much with grip strength, and it just it will suddenly not move. just falls Such off the cliff. It just won't move. Muscle it's, group. Yes, it's a it's very specific grip. Now, would this ever be programmed as an event in an overall strongman competition, or is it more of a singularity? Come on, guys. It, it, it would be in a, in a grip strength competition. Okay. Oh. Great lifts. Okay. They gave her the, so gave her the down right as she put it down. Absolutely. Don't be shy at all. Up next, 235. Well, this was a guy that had the really easy 225, I think. Yes, he did. Now, see, you see some guys with some big, powerful upper arms. A, a, a guy with a little bit smaller, but he's right in there. He's kind of going for a knockout punch. It looks like he's trying to go a little bit above the other guys and hope they can't make the next weight. Wow. Wow, great comeback. I didn't think he had it after that first attempt, and he bounced back. <laughs> well, he, you notice he turned his wrist a little bit. He locked in a little tighter. Judge Chad, uh, Chad Clark speaking to the athlete. Tell him. Just tell him. Tell him what's up. All right, Chris is setting up with 150. The other thing you're going to watch for is, is some athletes will build a lot of tension before they start the pull. You don't want to yank on it. You want to build a lot of tension. And then you start it up. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get behind Kristen. It's not easy. Kristen Benito. 150 pounds. Oh. Almost there. Oh, oh, just keeps dropping it. Still have another attempt. Still keeps slipping. You know, in a, a barbell, you have the knurling that it aids in your grip a little bit. Is there any knurling whatsoever, any texture? Very smooth. Very smooth. Well, that doesn't sound very kind. We would call that a, a postcard lift, where if you took a picture at the very seconds you stood up with it, it looked like a good lift. Yeah, right. But in actuality, it wasn't. Let's get behind Dave on this one. So, so Dave Laby. 
240. Wow. 240. That's, that's a, that ties the record. Wow. He also has such uh, he also has such great forearm strength. Notice how he kind of tilts the anvil into the into his hand. And his arm looks slightly bent. Yeah. He tilts his, he tilts the hand anvil a little bit. That's completely legitimate. You've got to be strong enough to employ that technique. Let's cheer on Ashley getting ready for 155. Oh, she's right there. And so just to be clear, that the previous gentleman tied the record. Yes, that's that's what it appears. 240 was the record previously. So. Oh, oh keep so slipping. Close. If I were her, I would come down just a little bit. I would give a, she's, she's trying to do, use the smallest part of the anvil. I would come down and grip right, a little lower. So gives you no room oh. for error when you're too high, correct? Yes, because it keeps slipping. Maybe she, that gives her the purchase she needs to finish the lift. Alright, next up is going to be Eric. 245 is going to be a record. 245. 245. So this will be the record. So that was a tied record. Now this is breaking right, the record. Keep that clap going. There you go. No pressure. He's got, Nervous. He's got large hands. He's going to grip a little bit further down than the other athletes. Oh, keeps slipping. It's just right there. Uh, no, no ran out of time. Impressive. That Great time really catches him, up on you. It does. And your grip, once it goes, it's not like grinding something out. Once the grip goes, right. usually it just is not there. Chad Clark getting everybody pumped up. Thirty-five. Oh, that looks Jen. so good. good! Wow, love it. <laughs> that was a great lift. She leaves no doubt that no. she made the lift, holds it, brings it back down. Yes, very, very strong, and that gets in the other people's heads too. Mm -hmm. I bet. <laughs> it's like any other thing. If you make something that's heavy look right, not as heavy. Two forty-five will be a record-breaking attempt here. The standing record has already been tied. Let's see if we can break it. Just not coming off the ground. Just too much. Record breaking attempt, though, so that was exciting. Olivia, here we have 145. 145. I think to take the lead. Just telling you guys, get on your feet, make some noise. 145. Is it a new possible record? I believe so. Yes. Oh, wow. 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 Third attempt. Oh, give her an extra. <laughs> that was so good. Just like in powerlifting or some throwing events, you can take an extra if you have three okay. solid attempts, but I don't Fight. think they do that. Just didn't come off on that one. Oh, one more try. Let's get behind him on this last one, folks. And time. It ran out of time. Also, too, you notice how the weight was spinning Maybe underneath the anvil. That's tough to that's tough to overcome that momentum. Up for 155. This is her third attempt. Third and attempt, 155. One fifty five. That would be the record. I'm sight, she sight, he sight. Let's go. One fifty five. 
Oh. Broke it. Just got to fully stand up with it, lock it out, and wait for the judge's command down. Current record for women is 170, so this is quite a good lift for the competition. Oh, he hadn't given her the down signal yet. She's also quite a deadlifter, by the way. Oh, really? <laughs> Why do you think she's missing that lift? Well, she just wasn't getting the down signal from the judge, and he's trying to explain that to her because you want to stand and lock it. She's standing and then putting it down. Gotcha. You want to, you want to show command on the weight. Watch the judge. Watch the judge. You don't want to do all that hard work just to barely miss out. It has to come down under under control. He was trying to try, tie the record, but just didn't have the impetus. Does everybody have their little routine? You're gonna chalk, gonna walk in, gonna walk back. You know, they're kind of pre, their pre-lift ritual. Pretty much, that's like every other lift. You'd have a little bit of a ritual. Where are you gonna put your hands on it? Oh, 175. Oh, wow. This would be the record. 175, 170. This is a great lift for anybody. And for a women's record, this would be fantastic. Okay, come on. Oh. Oh. And you're right, there is that point that it just becomes exponentially harder. Because her previous lifts, I don't want to call them easy, but they, they looked no question. Plus, she's had a big jump. Mm -hmm. 145 to 175. Take it to the crack at it. You never Why know. Why not? Come on. Feel the crowd. Make it happen. Okay. <laughs> Good run at it. All the fellas side, Eric Dawson, staring down 245. Record breaking attempt, folks. Call it record breakers for a reason. We're going to make it happen. Here we go. 245. Potential record here. He's starting to rotate on him as he, as he starts up. Any kind of momentum like that will break the weight from your hand. Can you counteract that? You really don't want that twist. You want to have it solid from bottom to top. Big round of applause for Eric Dawson. So far, we've had some people just right on the cusp of breaking these records. Well, it gets it gets to where you can break it off the ground, but you have to pick it up under right. control and put it back down, just like you saw the other athlete. Right. She was right there. It just seemed like, why isn't it? She didn't get the down command. That's that's the way it is. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Why so quiet? The big boy. 245 for a record. Justin looking strong. Justin Clifford. Justin World record. Up. Here we go, 245. Oh. Got some time. Gonna readjust. It looks like it's nailed down. <laughs> Not coming off. Justin. Again, five pounds makes all the difference. We got our next athlete. Next up, David. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Dr. Biller, are you familiar with all these names and faces out there? No, I'm really not. I, it, a lot of these are folks that train, maybe train at home, and there's not a lot of this kind of competition. That's why Record Breakers is great. You can take somebody that really does something and endeavors at home and come out and show the world what they've got. Oh, broke so the ground with it. Close. 245, he's right there. World's record. 
Very Let's solid. Go. Let's give him a high take, David Let's Levy. Go. Let's go. Oh, he got it off the ground. Now he's going to try it with his left hand. Time. Not going. Is that time? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for Somebody nailed 245 to the ground. <laughs> so close. So Absolutely close. so close. With his last attempt, I felt like he was probably going to pull that one, but just didn't happen. Just that five pounds, that little bit with these kind of grip competitions. Right, That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for all of our athletes. David. Well, no records are broken, but we came darn close. There's some fantastic lifts that occurred. He got the he got the 245 off of the ground, but it just didn't happen. And we're gonna welcome to the desk Tommy Hackenbrook. Tommy, good to see you, man. It's been a long time. Yeah, you too. I've, uh, I've been hiding out. <laughs> you know, well, I was gonna say you were retired from many, many years of competition, but I can't say that. Just saw you throw down there in the Legends. How was that? Oh, it was good. Uh, th thank God Stacy Tovar carried me um, while she was carrying another child. And right, exactly. Tommy, so <laughs> even more impressive. It, how did you guys, when you were out there, actually break up the work? Was it a 50-50 split? Was there a plan that you threw out the window? Yeah, the plan was uh, I would do a few more rope climbs. And, uh, <laughs> As a just, tall guy. Yeah, just check in with each other as we went. Um, I, I knew... It was gonna be a rough one just because haven't done anything like this for a while but um the whole point is having fun and we definitely had fun and um you know one one less no rep and i think we would have beat everybody but it was close uh, did, what was the experience like in general just getting to be back out there again with so many just notable faces from you know crossfit history quite frankly Oh, it's incredible. Like, it's it's just an incredible honor. Um, I can't thank Rogue Fitness enough and, and Katie and Bill for putting this on and just making it extremely special. But um, I, I told my wife, I spent the middle half of that workout just <laughs> listening to Josh give the play-by-play because -play, I was like, ooh, Rich and Jason are going at it. Like, I want to <laughs> I want to see this. And um, the last part of that workout was blacked out, so I don't know what happened. But it was, it was fun being out there. And what does training look like these days for you? I'm sure back in the day it was – multiple sessions a long time in the gym these days what do you do um i, I just kind of split time i'm doing a lot of home improvement projects and i'm a, a basically a referee for my little kids wrestling matches um that, that happen all the time so just chasing them around um I'm looking to open a gym. I've been working out in the garage a lot, but trying to get something going in Vegas. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, hopefully once I'm there and, and have you know a bunch of clients in there, I'll have to hold myself accountable and I'll I'll be a little oh. more consistent. That would be that's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. So you we just get to watch a little bit of the rogue record breakers there. Have you ever played with any strong man apparatus in any of your training? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's uh that's my cup of tea right there. Oh so, really? What, yeah. what are the favorites? Now you oh, yeah. got uh, Dr. Bill's attention. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say if you're climbing a rope like that, a guy your size, you would have a great grip. You should try some of those things, like the anvil. You've done that before? Yeah, I've done stones. I haven't done the anvil. Uh, that would definitely be fun. Mm -hmm. But I love sleds. I love stones. I've done, done some of the log stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah, any anything that's non-conventional and conventional is, is right up my alley. Maybe for some CrossFitters out there that haven't played with the strongman stuff and you've got some experience with that, why is it that somebody may want to mix that into their training? It's just good old-fashioned old, old work capacity, yeah. you know. It's, it's uh, lumberjack stuff. It, it's just... Uh, I think it teaches you to kind of go to dark places, and it's it's really safe. Like, that's something I didn't really know about Strongman. As a, as a casual fan, I watch you, Bill, a ton. And, by the way, my little sister, I have twin little sisters. One of them is a huge fan of yours. Um, she's never been across a gym in her life, but she's obsessed with Strongman. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Watch she needs to come you. to our house. That's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's so safe. Um, you can get almost anybody doing Strongman-type workouts with very little experience, mm -hmm. and, and it's it's natural, you know. It's, it's basically what kids do on the playground. And I would say to, to anyone unfamiliar with it, it's also just fun. Like yeah. if maybe training has got a little bit stale or whatnot, pick up some sandbags, move a yoke, push a prowler. You're going to have an absolute blast no matter what. Absolutely. Dr. Bill, you know, we just saw the, the legends throw down out there on, on the CrossFit side of the house. you ever considered getting a strongman legends going and, and maybe throwing your hat in the ring there? Uh, I wouldn't throw my hat in that ring. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> I, I ran out of cartilage. <laughs> but I, I could see that would be a great event for a lot of 
strumming that maybe you've had a few years since their competition days. A lot of people that have fans that maybe have been world's strongest man or top competitors. That'd be a lot of fun because that's exactly what we were watching. A lot of people who are legends, and I, as the little I know about CrossFit, I recognize a lot of the names. You can do the same with strongman and have people actually root for the people they used to root for. You know, how, mm -hmm. how fun would that be? It would be an, an absolute blast. And Tom, it was a blast watching you out there with the Legends competition. I didn't know you were looking to open another gym. I hope that goes fantastic for you. Hey, thank you. And um, if I don't get my butt back to training, there will be there will be a spot here at the Legends competition. So I'm happy to trade places with you. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay here. Just kind of running my mouth. Happy happy to do it. Well, we've got to see some CrossFit today, some Rogue Record Breakers, some Strongman. There's more Strongman coming up. And Kiki Dixon caught up with one of the most world-renowned Strongman out there, Tom Stoltman. Tom, this is a very condensed competition season. You literally were just crowned Britain's fittest man last weekend. How's the body holding up? Yeah, I mean, uh, getting crowned Britain's strongest man, you know, it's a national title, but it didn't take much out of me. Uh, my eyes were kind of glued onto this event, and, you know, I started this event good, and we're strong men. We usually compete week in, week out, so we have to get used to it. But I've got the best team behind me, so yeah, I'm fit, I'm recovered, and, you know, just strong, as you've seen in the first event there as well, so... We did indeed. Now, Strongman is a family affair. At what point in your life did you know this is what you wanted to do? I was obviously following my big brother Luke's footsteps. I think at 17 years old, I stepped onto the Strongman stage against the best guys in the world. At 18, 19 years old, I was competing against Eddie Hall and stuff. So, you know, I've been mixing it with the big guys for a long, long time. And just to kind of have a rapid progress in this sport is very special to me. So, and to also being well Strongest Man as well is a great, great feeling as well. So. I imagine so. We look forward to seeing you on the competition floor. Thank you very much. Cheers. Again, we've got one more Strongman event left today, three more tomorrow, plenty of competition in the books so far, but what are your thoughts leading into the second event? Well, I, I loved watching the deadlift, obviously, and JF Caron was so dominant in that. It's got a set in some people's heads, but they're, they're going for points. He's great at the deadlift. How good can you lift the dumbbells? There, there are several people who are very good at dumbbells who are in this competition. The other piece of this is that you've got to think that people that needed points to be in the overall standings later on. So it looks like there's, there's still three or four people who are within striking distance to be on the platform, the podium today for the end of the first day. There's plenty of events left. Let's take a look at those overall results as we head into the second event for the Strongman competition. JF Caron, your leader, Tom Stoltman, who we just heard from in second place, Martins Litsis, who you identified as a very dangerous man there, Dr. Bill, he's sitting in third place. And then Brian Shaw and Rob Kearney round out the top five. JF Caron, he has occupied a, a fair amount of your attention. And, and why is that? What, what makes him such a, a capable athlete? Well, he's paid his dues and he's been great at a lot of events. And the best part about today was he told me, I'm gonna pull this big deadlift. And he did, and he did it so easily. Look at the bar shake up and down when he finishes that huge, ni that huge 926. He had a, probably at least 75 pounds. He was in thousand pound deadlift shape. He's also is a very good dumbbell lifter. This, so the one hand lift overhead, he's really worked hard on that. A couple of years ago uh, at the Arnold, he, he struggled a little bit with that, but he said he's been working on it. Now that one arm overhead is exactly what's going to happen next in event number two for the Strongman, the Sear Bell. They start off heavy and they only get heavier, starting at 253 pounds and making their way up all the way to 300. And one of the most interesting things about this is this is a head-to-head -head competition. Dr. Bill, in your opinion, why does that or does that not change the nature of rather than having just one lifter out there, you see what he gets, somebody else does it. What's the head-to-head -head aspect bring to it? So basically, this is an event that who lifts the most the fastest. And if you've got a guy in front of you, directly in front of you, you can gauge yourself. It's sort of like running with someone. They're a little bit ahead. You're in CrossFit. I'm just watching people kind of gauge themselves against people in real time. You don't know where you are, even if someone's calling time. You've got a guy right in front of you. You're trying to. The first thing you're trying to do is outpace that person. Okay. So they're pacing each other as they go through the event. And knowing what you know about this field and the Sear Bell, who does well? Well, uh, Alexei Novikov obviously had that, that huge training uh, uh, implement that he used, but it was a little bit differently shaped. That might play into it. 
Um, there's several guys who are really good at it, as we mentioned, J.F. Carone, and, uh, and Martins is very good at this type of event too. But Alexi, on this particular implement, has uh, shown that he's good for over 300 pounds. And then there's the record holder, Mateusz. Mateusz Kalaskowski has the world's record at 145 kilograms. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. His injury, does that have anything to do with this? Right. I was going to say he needs a good event after not putting up any serious numbers whatsoever on the deadlift. What about Correct. the man of the hour, Martin Lietzis? Well, Martins is also very good at this event, and he's, he's doing what exactly I thought he might actually do. If he looks good in the deadlift, then he's going to have another good event in the dumbbells, and he's just going to be in that pace. He's not going to let anybody break too far away from him. He's not going to, he's kind of drafting a little bit, and then he's going to have tomorrow, which is strength endurance, and he's got a huge motor and does great at those events. We talked about the number one person on the leaderboard in JF Caron, the number three in Martins Leeds. Well, sitting right there in the middle is Tom Stoltman. Will he be a factor in event number two? Yes, he will be. He's uh, he's good at the press, uh, and the dumbbells only go up to about three, only go to 300 pounds. That's he's, it, just 300. Just 300, and he's also, <laughs> at least it's not shooting for a 145 kilogram, 150 kilogram, but Tom is the reigning world's strongest man, and he reaches into different gears sometimes and just pulls them out. He's, I say that, it's not, I'm not being facetious, he does have extra gears sometimes. So I think he's going to do really well with the dumbbell. Do you think we'll see anyone pull all the way up to 300? I would, ex I would expect at least three or four of these, of these athletes to get to the 300. One thing about it, though, is that it's not just who's lifting the most. They're in sequence. So, you know, it's 253, 274. Right. And then they're sequenced. They're stacked on top of those 280, 290, 300. So they're really, really close. So I think that's actually good because then you can kind of feel 280, Okay, a little bit of a progression there. So it's not, it's not a huge jump. So it might actually help some of the athletes make it to that 300. Big weight going overhead in event number two. It starts at 6.10 p.m. Central Time. Don't go anywhere. More action coming up next.
lift heavy, lift fast. That is the name of the game in event number two for the strongmen. The Sear Bell Ladder is next at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Dread it, run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. Opening day of competition for the strongmen here at Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas is coming to a close. Event number two is the Sear Bell Ladder and Mateusz Kieliszkowski looking to do some damage here with that implement. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with former Europe's strongest man, Lawrence Chalet. And Lawrence, if you can have a good finish in these first two events and set yourself up on top of the leaderboard or towards the top of the leaderboard, that is a huge advantage going into the final day of competition. Absolutely. You want to be in a strong position starting off day two. We saw an incredible performance earlier from JF Caron winning the deadlift, but we're into a different event now. This event suits different athletes. For me, I'm going to be looking out for Kiliuszkowski and Novikov. They are two of the absolute best dumbbell pressers on the planet. One event is down. That was earlier today. It was the Elephant Bar deadlift. Here are the overall standings after that event. JF Corona with the event win earlier as he deadlifted 926 pounds to take the win. Tom Stoltman, the defending world's strongest man, sits in second. And it's Martins Litsis who is in third place. The Sear Bell Ladder is sponsored by BPN Effective Health and performance supplements you can trust. Bear Performance Nutrition Supplements are banned substance certified. Shop BPN Supplements at bearperformancenutrition.com or roguefitness.com. That is the final bell on this ladder. 300 pounds, two men on the field at the same time. They will try to lift five sear bells in ascending weight as quickly as they can. Absolutely crazy. 300 pounds for one rep is mental. Doing this as part of a medley, this is going to be one of the most imp If anyone can finish this and get that 300 pounds, I I I'm going to go nuts because this will be one of the most impressive feats of strength I've ever seen. Down to Kiki Dixon, who's on the field. Guys, Mateusz holds the world record for the one rep max at 320 pounds. However, when we sat down to conversate, there wasn't much confidence in that conversation because, well, four surgeries on the elbow, one as recently as April, plays into it. Also, the other problem, this field is stacked. There's a lot of talent on this competition floor, guys. Thank you, Kiki. And Mateusz Kaluszkowski and Mikhail Shivlikov. Kieliszkowski on the right, Shilvikov is on the left. The first two men out. Neither one of these men posted a score in the deadlift, but this is a chance for Kieliszkowski to really get himself right back into this competition. Absolutely. He needs big points on this event. This is one of his favorite events. Has he got the down signal? He gets the down signal. Looks a little too much for Misha there. These are ridiculously heavy dumbbells. We're already up to the 280 pounder now for Kieliszkowski. You can see his elbow strap. He's had elbow surgery. Now, before surgery, he, I mean, he is the current record holder. He would be looking forward to this event. He's going to be nervous about it, though. He's worried about that elbow. 280 pounds up to the shoulder. Can he get this? He's got nice high elbow position. Lots of drive from the legs. Does he stabilize? That rep will count for Kieliszkowski. He's shaking his head, but that was a big lift. He needed it. You can see he's lacking that stability at the lockout. That's where he's struggling right now. He's got the leg power. He has quite a narrow stance with the feet. That allows him to drive with both legs into the movement. But the elbow is just not quite as stable as it used to be. 290 now for Kieliszkowski. He clears this. It's on to 300. We are now a minute 30 in for this event. There's a two and a half minute time cap. As Shivlikov is still trying to work on 274. Kieliszkowski misses his first attempt at 290. I think that's going to be it for these two gentlemen. Shivlikov gets the 253. Kieliszkowski into the lead with 280 pounds. He's rolling it and looking like he's going to have another attempt. 
290 pounds or 132 kilos up to the shoulder. He's got it nice and tight into the, into the net. He just can't stabilize it there. And he's going to call it. After clearing 280 and two unsuccessful Ooh. attempts at 290, Shivlikov almost getting 274. And the two men who opened up this event will leave the field. Neither one able to clear the entire ladder, but Kielos Kossi did get through three dumbbells at 280. 280 is amazingly impressive. If we see that 300 pound go up today, like I said, doing that as a one-off, as a max lift, now that, that's something. But to do it at the end of a run like this, truly incredible. Here's Kielos Kossi, who came in with no points after failing to post a score in the deadlift hoping that that is good enough to get him some very valuable points as he heads into the final three events on Saturday. Talking things over with Martins Lietzitz there. His body language doesn't look good. He doesn't look happy about it, but I'm pretty confident that's going to score him some decent points. Maybe not a winning performance, but I think it's going to be up there. Next two athletes out on the floor will be Luke Stolman and Jerry Pritchett as they are resetting the competition floor. And see Martins Leach, he's getting his right arm braced up. But a little surprising, I think, for Mateusz Kieloszkowski, and it's surprising for us, I think, the expectations we had for him in that event. And, and now he's running out of opportunities to really get himself towards the top of the leaderboard with just three events remaining. Absolutely. I mean, it's always tough coming back from injury. It, it was one of his absolute best events. And as we've mentioned, he is the current world record holder for maximum weight on the dumbbell. But he had four surgeries on that elbow. It's a lot to ask. Maybe he just needs a little more time getting the stability and strength back in the elbow. He looked like he had the leg power. He was punching up nice and hard. He just couldn't quite stabilize. Looked like he was waiting a long time for the down signal. The referees are being strict with these gentlemen, which is good to see. Good crowd on hand here at the Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas. Watched event number one for the Strongmen earlier today. That was the Elephant Bar Deadlift. J.F. Corona, who you see at the top of your screen, won that event. Brian Shaw and Alexei Novikov there with the beard. Novikov, another guy who could do very well here. Novikov has been posting some incredible lifts on, um, in his training. Actually did more than the current world record in a training lift. But now in contest, let's see how things go. We're going up with Luke Stoltman and Jerry Pritchett next. Luke Stoltman won this event at Britain's Strongest Man just one week ago. It's a little bit heavier this week, but he's a huge presser. Prefers a log. Luke's, Luke's one of the best in the world when it comes to log lifting. Dumbbell, he's not quite as confident on, but he's been improving it very, very fast over the last year. Luke Stolman and Jerry Pritchett will be up next. Mateusz Kieliszkowski with the best mark so far as he got through the 280-pound bell. And just two bells remaining to clear that ladder. Jerry Pritchett, another man looking to work his way up the overall standings. He comes in ranked seventh after event number one. So these gentlemen have seen what's gone before them. They've got targets to beat. I don't think either of them will do the lot, but if they can get two or three in a decent time, it's going to score good points. Take a look at the competition floor. You start at 253, then 274, 280, 290. And then if you want to clear the entire thing, you have to lift a 300-pound bell over your head with one hand, the sear bell named after Louis Sear, the famous French-Canadian strongman who was a circus performer and used to use a bell like this in his act. Yeah, that's where this comes from. It's a traditional test of strength. Brought back by Rogue. These are uh, beautiful bits of kit, as all of the Rogue equipment is. Luke Stoltman, a big fan of pressing events. He's going to want to prove he's got some of the strongest shoulders in the world. Look at him looking up to the gods there. Trying to generate some extra power. And Jerry, Jerry Pritchett was America's strongest man in 2017. 
spends a lot of his time building his own equipment. He does indeed. His son is a potential future world champion. Bubba Pritchett looking up at his father, I'm sure today, huge inspiration. He's been a fixture at the Arnold Strongman Classic as well. He has nine career appearances at that competition. And even though he's, he's, I think, 40 or 41 now, he's he had one of his best years ever in 2020. Just needs to make sure he's fully fit and he can perform with the best of them. 280 is the mark to beat. Easy lift and there no for Luke for Stoltman as he clears the 253-pound bell. Now moves up to 274. 253 with ease. Luke gets it set. He's going to drive powerfully with the legs. He needs to get the timing right. Stoltman's first attempt is no good. Meanwhile, Jerry Pritchett doesn't look like he's in any hurry to make another attempt at 253. Like he's, he's just just standing. Support Luke now. Luke needs this. 274 pounds. This is heavier than the heaviest dumbbell they had last weekend at Britain's Strongest Man. As dumbbell number two. Here goes Stoltman's second attempt now at 274. So the thickness of the handle, it makes it awkward. The roundness of the gloves. He's got to get it set right. If that dumbbell moves while it's on the shoulder, there's no chance. And Stoltman is going to call it. He got through 253, made two runs at 274. So Kielikowski still has the top mark at 280 pounds. Jerry Pritchett was unable to complete a single lift. The organizers really have set the mark with this event. Honestly, it's ridiculously heavy. Uh, it, I can't kind of, you know, I, I was a strong guy. The most I've ever done on a dumbbell is about 250 for a max. These guys are opening on just over 250, 274 pounds, 280 pounds. So far, the biggest lift we've seen. If they can get that, they move up to 290 pounds. And finally, the monster at the end there, 300 pounds, heavier than Novikov himself. Mateusz Kieliszkowski, still your leader, 280. Stolman and Shivlikov both tied at 253 pounds. We will reset the competition floor and bring out our next pair. The next two athletes to go will be Alexei Novikov and Rob Kearney. And Novikov, a man that could find himself on top of the standings, not only for this event, but possibly the competition heading into the final day, if he can have a great performance. He's been looking forward to this event. He, he believes he's the best in the world right now at the dumbbell. He wants to prove it. He knows there's still some big names to come, such as Brian Shaw. So he's going to have to be fast. He's going to want to make sure he at least gets three faster than Kiliuszkowski first. That has to be the first goal, get into first place. Then he can focus on 290 and potentially 300 pounds. There you see his body weight is 300 pounds, the same weight as the last dumbbell they're trying to lift. Novikov won the World's Strongest Man in 2020, and he was tied for the youngest World's Strongest Man at 24 years old. Yeah, what he's managed to achieve so far in his young life is, is truly incredible. He always wants to get better. He gives 100%, very driven and determined man. And there's the man he will be going up against in the seat. That's Rob Kearney. I mentioned earlier that he had the American record in the log lift. That was just recently beaten, but his old record that he had was 475.75 pounds. But a couple weeks ago, that, that mark was bested by just a, just a bit. Yeah, just a fraction. Bobby Thompson taking the American record recently. But Rob loves overhead events. Very explosive, as you could see. Just a second ago, his, bo his body weight, only 285 pounds. I say only. It's small for a strong man. It's still a very big human being. And he's very, very powerful. 
I think there are a lot of people in this crowd who are probably seeing a strongman event for the first time, and the fact that they're putting this much weight over their heads with one arm is just, I think, inconceivable to a lot of these people. They would struggle. They would give anything, I think, to get 274 pounds over their head on a barbell. 250 pounds is a decent bench press in most gyms. Still plenty of time before we get the next pair out. Novikov and Kearney. They are in the middle of the standings. Alexei Novikov comes in in sixth place overall after event one, and Rob Kearney is in fifth. Final event of the day for the strongmen. They will have three more tomorrow, including the Wheel of Pain. That has just been lurking out there in left field. That's a scary looking bit of pain. <laughs> It is one of the most impressive pieces of equipment that has been constructed, I think, for any sort of competition anywhere. And there it is. And the crew at Rogue did a fantastic job of replicating the one that is in the famous Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Conan the Barbarian. It's the effort they put into the detail. Look at the heads on the end of each post. I really want to have a go with that at some point. <laughs> Just while no one's looking. It is pretty ridiculous how heavy that thing is and how tough it is to move. And to watch these men push it is going to be quite the show tomorrow. But first, we had to get through the Sear Bell ladder. We've been through two pairs so far. Mate uh, pardon me, Mateusz Kieliszkowski is the man who got the farthest. He cleared 280 pounds. As Rob Kearney chalking up the 290-pound bell, walking back to the starting position. He'll be going head-to-head -head with Alexei Novikov, who's on the left side of the screen. So these are two of our smallest athletes in this lineup, but they are two of the best at the dumbbells. It could be an exciting one to watch. We were talking earlier, a lot of people will look at this as a, as a pressing event. You know, what's your shoulder strength? But it is an entire body test. Absolutely. To be honest, you need to, first you need the, sh the stability in the shoulder to, to keep the dumbbell in place, not let it move. But then it's about leg power. You're trying to be explosive, use your whole body, get every ounce of power that you have driving into the dumbbell and punching it overhead and then almost catching it locked out. It's, it's very difficult to just press these type of weights on a dumbbell. And you mentioned earlier, too, if that thing moves at all, if it's slightly out of position, I mean, the slightest error can and the be other, the difference between a good lift and a, and a absolutely. bad one. You, you can almost, you'll watch some athletes and they'll either make it look easy or it doesn't go at all. It's all about timing, having everything set perfectly. I'm excited to see how Novikov does. He's talked up a big game on this event. He needs to prove now he's here to challenge for the title. We are underway. Rob Kearney on the right, Novikov on the left. 253 pounds on the opening. Wow, ball. what a Both first lift make that. Both of them looking strong, but Novikov absolutely punched that overhead. Look at this technique. Look how fast he is and explosive. And he is right to work at 280, and we aren't even 20 seconds in here. A two and a half minute time cap is. Kearney is on 274. 280 up like nothing. I think we could see all three go up. All five, sorry, excuse me. 290 to Novikov. This would give him wow. the event lead, and he hits that no problem. And now on to 300, and he he's barely trying to get looks the, taxed. He's getting the crowd worked up. Look at this technique, though. He gets it sat perfectly just behind the neck. Oh, I say that, and this one's a little too heavy to clean. That shows you again how heavy it is. Two hands, they're trying to get it up to the shoulders. Rob Kearney on the 280. Novikov on the 300. He's got it set perfectly now. He punches. Can he lock out? Yes, and he Novikov can. Novikov has 300 it pounds. Clear the ladder, and this crowd loves every second of it. Wow. Such impressive power there. You look at him, and you don't see the biggest guy. You compare him to Brian Shaw or Tom Stoltman. He almost looks small. But every ounce of muscle in him, he packs into those movements. Now he's off to cheer on Rob Kearney. Novikov clears all five sear bells in one minute, 5.74 seconds. That is absolutely brilliant lifting there. That's so absurd it should be criminal. <laughs> 
All five dumbbells, one minute, five seconds. Can that be beat? It's going to take a hell of a performance to do it. It's going to have to take a perfect performance because as we saw him on that final bell, he did stumble with his first attempt at 300. But once he got that situated, that thing went up with little trouble. And Alexei Novikov is looking to lock up 10 points and put himself in great position heading into the final three events on Saturday. The crowd enjoyed that one as well. That was truly an immense feat of strength. And he's... Alexei Novikov went through that event so quickly that we're going to show it to you just one more time. And if you blinked, you missed the first three bells. Watch this technique. He gets it perfectly set. Punches it overhead nice and fast. Very explosive. Moves on. And every single lift is the same. Look at this technique. Just rests it just behind his neck. Punches overhead. He's trying to use all that leg power. He's just catching it locked out. He's not having to use his tricep to press. Balanced. Punch. Perfect. This was impressive with the 290. Look at that. It was only the 300 that slowed him down. Just reminding him that it's 300 pounds there and he can't just treat it like a toy. But once he gets it into position, look at his stability. Stability, great flexibility to bend there and maintain that balance. And he's happy with that. Fantastic Unbelievable performance. Unbelievable performance from Alexei Novikov as he is your leader. 15, Clearing the entire ladder in a minute, five seconds. There's two heats to go. Martins Lietzis is in the next heat. But as we said earlier, Lietzis is going to have to be flawless in order to come close to that performance from Alexei Novikov. Lises, is, he was very good in the deadlift, nice solid performance, and I think he's going to be looking to do the same again. Lises in his head, top three on, on this, he's going to be very, very pleased with his day one performance. I don't think he'll try and, and beat Novikov's performance there, but I think in himself he'll believe he can beat Kiliuskovsky's three. And Brian Shaw will be the man who's going head to head with Martins Leeds. He's Shaw coming in in fourth place overall. And Shaw is always a good dumbbell presser. If any of these men, along with Novikov, can do all five, it's this man. Yeah, Brian Shaw originally wanted to play basketball. He went to Black Hills State University on a full basketball scholarship. And during his career, he said he just got hooked on the weights and that he always possessed brute strength, and that was the genesis of his strongman career. His first competition was back in 2005. He's been a fixture in this sport for 16 years. Yeah, he's truly one of the greatest of all time. No weaknesses in his arsenal. He's won every major title there is to win. And how he'd love to add the rogue invitation onto that list of achievements. Martin Vlitz is originally born in Latvia. He moved to the United States when he was just four years old and then moved to California when he was 20. He trained by lifting stones on his grandparents' farm. And then Ode Haugen, the legendary Norwegian strongman, took him under his wing and has developed Martins into one of the best here in the world of strongman. So good to see Martins back. He's been missed this last year. Such a popular athlete. He's been featured on some national television commercials here in the United States as well. If some people are out there thinking, this guy kind of looks familiar. You <laughs> may have seen him on TV before. He's someone that can do it all, but I know how pleased he is to be back on the competitive field. This should be a good one. The crowd has regained its sanity now after watching what Alexei Novikov just did and his Ready to watch Martins, Lietzis, and Brian Shaw go head-to-head. 105 
1.74 seconds is the amount of time it took Alexei Novikov to clear all five bells. It should be a good matchup of two of uh, America's best athletes. Of course, Brian Shaw, already a legend in the sport. Martinez Lisi says, ah! he's on probably his way. one day going to be He's on there. his way. Already a world's strongest man winner. Ten seconds. Stand by. Here we go. 253 up first for both Shaw and Lisi. Shaw on the left, Lisi on the right. Both men solid with the first number. Now to 274. Clearing that first bell with ease. Shaw with 274 on his shoulder. Martin. Shaw looking really strong there. Lisi's also getting the 274 dumbbell. Two for two so far for both athletes. Now on to 280. He gets it, and that's quicker than Brian Shaw. So Shaw was unable to complete his lift. He'll try to make another attempt. Leetzi's now to 290, 105.74. That's the time to beat. Leetzi's going to have to hurry if he wants the best Novikov. The elbow nice and high. That's important. And a failed rep for Martinez Leetzi's, and that cannot feel good if that weight comes crashing down. Big weight to come crashing down. Brian Shaw still back on the 280. Can he get this? Just can't quite lock it out. He's limping away there. Yeah, Shaw pulled up a, a little gimpy earlier in the deadlift, but was not limping at all. Now looks like he's really starting to feel the effect of whatever happened to him in that event. Now Martinez Leitzis is done. He got through the 280. We need to check the time to see who's ahead out of Kiliskovsky and Leitzis, but he's put himself into good point region again. And I said that before. His consistency could well be. What gets him the win this weekend? Brian's leaving it there. And Shaw. so Shaw's going to call it. He got through 253 and 274, thanking the crowd here. Brian looked very easy on the first two, but it's that third one. Started pulling up on his hamstring, maybe feeling it as he drove through the legs. Alexei Novikov is still your event leader with now just one heat to go. I mentioned earlier, a lot of people in the crowd here who have never seen a strongman event. I think a lot of these guys are, are earning some new fans here in Round Rock, Texas. And, and unfortunately, Brian Shaw looking worse for the wear now, actually, as he hobbles off the field. And hopefully, he is okay to continue. Here at day one of competition, the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Let's go, Brian! That's all we needed. Let's just remind ourselves how impressive Novikov's performance was because you have the 10 best strongmen on the planet. We are watching them all struggle with these dumbbells. And he just blitzed through the whole, the whole set. Slight mistake on the last one. That was it, though. It was almost a flawless run. Simply incredible for Alexei Novikov to do what he did. The, not just the strength, but the endurance, too. Keep lifting these type of weights again and again. Well, he looked like he just kind of walked off the bench after doing those first four dumbbells. Didn't look winded, didn't look tired. And you mentioned one small bobble on 300, but then a second attempt was nearly perfect. And he's looking at an event win here, but two men remain. Tom Stoltman and J.F. Carone. I think both Stoltman and Caron will be looking to just focus on getting good points. I don't think either of them believe they can beat that performance from Novikov. They'll be focusing on doing two to three dumbbells in a decent time to get themselves starting tomorrow in a strong position. Here's a look at J.F. Caron, the man who sits atop the overall standings with 10 points after winning event one, and Tom Stoltman is in second place overall. Alexei Novikov came in in sixth place, he had five total points. Looking to increase that amount to 
15. 10 points to the winner, 9 points to second, and so on and so forth as you work your way down the field. Tom Stoltman has had an incredible year, winning the world's strongest man. His brother there, Luke, Europe's strongest man. But Tom truly, truly believes he wants to go down as one of the greatest of all time. And if you want to be the greatest of all time, you have to win everything. Nine years younger than his older brother, Luke. 397 pounds. He's a big boy. They breed them big up there in Scotland. <laughs> the dad in me just keeps thinking about that family's grocery bills <laughs> when those two kids were growing up. There's another brother as well who's getting strong. Jeff Caron looking focused. Dumbbell has never been his favorite event, but he's made great progress on it in the last couple of years. And I think if he can get some decent points, come out of day one around 15, 16 points, he's going to be extremely happy. There's Lee Hansi Novikov oh. talking things over there. They both had an excellent first day. And the Wheel of Pain is what will start things off tomorrow. And Martins Leeds, he really loves that implement. The two times we've seen it in competition, he finished first and second. But first, we have to get through the final heat here of the Sear Bell Ladder. Tom Stoltman, the current world's strongest man, taking on your current leader here in this competition at the Rogue Invitational, J.F. Caron. Now, for Tom, this is probably his weakest event of the weekend. So if he can put in a solid performance on this one, he's going to be feeling very, very good going into day two. You may have seen the rogue record breakers earlier. J.F. Caron is no stranger to that uh, aspect of this competition. Back in 2016 at the Arnold Strongman Classic, he flipped a 1,350-pound tire four times to set a new world record at that time at the rogue record breakers event. J.F.'s just been an incredible professional over the last 10 years consistently performing in all the major shows. He's always there or thereabouts. Doesn't often end up on top of the podium, but he's had second and third place in many, many big internationals. And we will see if one of these final two men will be able to do what Alexei Novikov did, and that is successfully lift all five Sear Bells. Novikov blitzed through this ladder 105.74 seconds is the time to beat. It's a nice position being able to go last on an event like this. You've seen what the other guys can do. You, you'll, you'll have your tactics in your head now. They'll see times that people have done certain numbers in and they'll be focusing on those. It takes a little bit of pressure off having to just blitz through as many as you can as quickly as you can. So when, you, when you try and rush, it's easy to make mistakes. 2.53 up first for Stolman and Corone. Stolman on the left, Corone on the right. Both men getting the first dumbbell. Now on to 274. 274 so neither of these guys are rushing. They've definitely got tactics. I think both of them will be happy to get this dumbbell done. Elbows nice and high for both men. Good drive there. Oh, couldn't quite stabilize, but Tom Stoltman does stabilize. And he's happy with that. You can see the relief on his face. Big gasp of air. He can relax now. He's going to take his time and give the 280 a, uh, as much of a chance as he can. If he can get 280, Tom is going to be extremely dangerous tomorrow. First attempt. Mm. Loses it behind as J.F. Caron is going to make another attempt at 274 pounds. Jeff just couldn't quite stabilize on his first attempt. He's got it sat nicely. Dips, lots of drive. Problem is, as you, you fail one, you just start to fatigue quickly. It looks like Caron is going to call it. So he got through the 253 pound dumbbell. And depending on where that ranks overall in this event, he may surrender the lead. We just need to see the time now for, for some of the athletes. But the winner, unquestionably the winner, with an amazing performance, Alexei Novikov. Congratulated there by Martins Lissis.
Some True. fireworks to boot here for Truly Novikov. Truly fantastic performance. We witnessed something special there. What a way to end the first day of competition for the strongmen here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Alexei Novikov, the only man to clear the ladder, and he did it in one minute, 5.74 seconds. Martins Leitzitz will take second. Mateusz Kieluszkowski will take third, and it's Rob Kearney and Brian Shaw tying for fourth. I think these people are still somewhat in shock by what they saw from Alexei Novikov. I think I'm still in shock. <laughs> Honestly, I've lifted some of these dumbbells before, and I know how hard the first one is to do all five. I'm lost for words. I really am. He's just such an incredible athlete. And not a bad first day for J.F. Caron. Won the opening event. J.F.'s deadlift this morning was... He was by far the number, number one man today when it came to deadlift. He looked like he had plenty more in the tank. But event two, all about Alexei Novikov. And let's send it down to Kiki Dixon, who is with your event two winner, Alexei Novikov. Alexei, you are the only athlete to get all the way through that ladder, 300 pounds up. You got some fireworks for it, a lot of applause. How did it feel? It's amazing. I very, it's very good for me, and uh, I'm ready for more weight, and I, uh, I made the unofficial uh, record in the dumbbell, and uh, I prepare for 150 kilos. So today, very good competition, very good uh, public and uh, thank you very much for support you're amazing you've completed two events you have three more to go which one are you looking forward to the most uh, for me next uh, events will be good i think uh, wheel of pain and uh, your race will be good for me and uh, stone too so i i hope we'll be in top three and very very hope to win and I will do everything for this. Sounds like it's going to be a great day for you then. Thank you. I hope to. Thank you. Alexei Novikov will close out day number one with an event win and he is well on his way towards achieving the goal of finishing inside the top three after that performance. Once again, your event results from the Sear Bell ladder. Alexei Novikov in a minute, five seconds. Goes through all five bells. Martins Lietzies edges out Mateusz Kuliskowski for second. And then a three-way tie for fourth between Kearney, Shaw, and Tom Stoltman. And J.F. Caron, your overall leader coming into the event, will finish in seventh place. <laughs> yeah, fantastic performance there by Novikov. And as you heard Alexi say, He's looking forward to tomorrow, and he has a, he's another guy who's done very well on the Wheel of Pain. Uh, absolutely. Tomorrow's going to be fantastic for him. He's, in a, he's put himself in a really strong position now. I feel JF had to have a good day, day today. The Day one was definitely his better day. Brian Shaw would have wanted a better day. Lishis, Tom Stoltman, Novikov, those three men for me will be extremely happy with how they finished day number one of the Rogue Invitation. Still plenty of action to come here as day one at the Rogue Invitational comes to a close. The Wheel of Pain will kick things off tomorrow for the Strongmen, but we're going to replace the dumbbells with barbells. The CrossFit athletes coming up here in a little bit to close out their first day of competition. So stay with us here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
welcome back to the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Day one of competition for the Strongman is over, but don't worry, we've got plenty in store for you tomorrow as well. It has been a tremendous day thus far. Dr. Bill, second event down. Did it live up to your expectations? I thought more guys would get closer to 300, but Alexi just showed what he has. It, the weights that they were taking from the ground to overhead absolutely boggled my mind. After the second event, here was the overall results for the Sear Bell. In first place, we had Alexi Novikov. Second place was Martin Litsis. Mar Mateusz Kalishkowski coming in third. Brian Shaw in fourth. And Tom Stoltman rounding out the top five. Dr. Bill, when we first had this event, you thought maybe a minute and 30 to make it from one, the, the quote-unquote lightest of the bells to the heaviest would be a good time. But then you've got Novikov comes out of nowhere, does it in, in a minute and five. That was a tremendous uh, performance. And, you know, I think even with a drop, he just kind of slowed down. Very mature, right at the 300. He kind of picked it up, put it back down, collected himself, and went back to the dumbbell. Great result. On the other side of the spectrum, we've got J.F. Caron, who is the leader coming into this event, and potentially we were expecting a little bit more from him. It didn't really go his way. No, it didn't. He only got the 253, and it kind of fell through for him. So you go from a dominant performance in the in the deadlift, and then you find yourself having a having a problem with the second event. What the problem with that is that then you find yourself going from being in the leader the leader uh, seat clearly, and then you fall you fall down uh, the, the leaderboard. That's, that's exactly what this, this scoring format's about. It's not a decathlon type scoring where you can have a dominant performance. You have to put things together and be consistent throughout the, perform throughout the competition. You can't have a bad event. It can drop you completely down. Three events left, two down, and after two events, your overall standings at the end of day one put Martin Litsis in first place overall, followed by Tom Stolman and then Alexei Novikov rounding out the top three. Martin Lietze said, this, this is an individual you told us we should keep our eyes on, and he is living up to the hype right now. Yes, he is. He's got this, he's got this ability to hang in there. He's not letting the leaders get away from him. You know, he kind of placed, uh, you know, he placed sort of a uh, little of pack a little bit in the top end of things on the deadlift, and then had a great performance in the dumbbell and finds himself the leader. Brian Shaw, one of the biggest names coming into this competition, and at the end of event number two, looked a little bit banged up. He looked like he walked off. I don't want to say in pain, but a little stiff maybe. Didn't, didn't quite look how I was expecting. Any word on what's going on with him? I haven't heard anything. I think it looked like something might have happened, uh, you know, a leg injury, a back, a hip, I don't know. But, you know, he finds himself in fourth place, and I know, Brian, he's going to do everything he can to be back tomorrow morning to do his best. Three events remaining tomorrow. It's still anybody's game. We have more CrossFit competition coming up later on tonight. And Kiki Dixon caught up with two of the young stars in CrossFit, Mal O'Brien and Haley Adams. Hey, guys. I found two of the Rogue Invitational's finest athletes relaxing in between events. Mallory, this is your first year here with us. How excited were you when you got that invite? I was super excited to receive the invite in the mail. I honestly wasn't expecting it, and I'm just super super pumped to be here and compete. So, We're pumped to have you. And Haley, last year you competed online, this year in person. How much better is it in person? Oh my goodness, it doesn't even compare. Rogue puts on an amazing show for all their athletes and spectators, so it's amazing. Thanks for joining us, ladies. Welcome back, everybody, and through the uh, amazing TV magic, we are joined by Matt Chan at the desk. A, a pleasure to have you here, Matt. It's been a long time. It has been a while. What have you been up to? Well, I went back to the fire service uh, after a five-year hiatus uh, in 2017 and kind of been ramping all that stuff. I've been totally fired up to be back in the fire service and working with all the guys. How is it competing in the Legends? Well, I mean, you saw it. <laughs> is, uh, it. is it still stressful? Is it actually, can you work out for fun these days? Well, you know, the stressful part is that we're standing there, you know, ahead of, <laughs> ahead of time in the event uh, in, in the back, and everybody's talking about, you know, how fun this is going to be and how, how mellow it's going to be right. to not compete. And then they go out there and they're, like, cutting each other's throats and trying to 
you know, beat each other to death. Yeah. I, I'm not shocked. I would be shocked to hear that anything other than that was happening. Well, yeah. again, we're only halfway through the competition on day one for CrossFit. And right now on the men's overall leaderboard, we have Pat Vellner sitting in first place, followed by Justin Medeiros, the ever dangerous BKG sitting in third place, then Cole Sager and Jason Hopper rounding out the top five. This was Pat Vellner's competition from last year, and right now he is holding on to that top spot, but not by much. That Vellner Medeiros competition was something that we were very excited to see, and you know, China, we've been talking about it all day. Yeah, I mean, Justin Medeiros has proven to all of us that he's super well-rounded. Two out of two times, he has found himself on top of the podium at the CrossFit Games. That's a solid start to his CrossFit career. If he just continues to do what he does best, which is stay consistent, he's going to have a great weekend. I'm not exactly sure um, if he's the favorite to win the next event, but I'm sure he's going to put up some super solid numbers. Matt, you've competed in a large number of competitions to say the least when you've got two individuals like this that are so close and all the hypes around them does that pressure or stress help you know drive one another or does it you know does one just clearly succeed and the other folds you know what, what's been your take you know competing with somebody that you're just neck and neck with yeah you know i mean a lot of times you can defeat yourself um uh, pretty easily just by getting you know down on yourself and how you compete at a certain event. So I think the, the bounce back between a bad event and a good event um, is obviously something that you have to, to learn to do. Um, you know, but I, I, we're still looking at guys that are finishing top five consistently in every event. And obviously that's how you win uh, you know, competitions as a whole. If you, can, if you can stay in that top five, you're, you're going to place well in the finish. I was going to say, if you, if you want to be one of the best in the world, you're going to have to deal with the pressure. It kind of comes with the territory. And this is where they want to be under the lights making it happen. We have an amazing competition on the women's side as well. One event down, the second event to take place very soon. And Annie Thor's daughter <laughs> leading the way. <laughs> she's just incredible. She, you know, She's somebody we knew would do well, but we didn't think she would be in the lead right now. Good for her. We've got Megala in second place. Tia Claire Toomey, the multiple-time CrossFit champion in third place. And Haley Adams and Laura Horvath rounding out the top five. A fantastic battle taking place on top. China, your thoughts just so far on the women's competition. It's been fierce, and I don't think it's going to stop for the rest of the weekend. I'm excited to see some of those, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh place girls move their way up on this next event. I know Laura has a huge clean and jerk, really, really strong, so I'm super excited to watch her in this next event. Event number two is going to be fantastic. The entire world loves seeing heavy weight get moved, and that's exactly what happens. Event number two is the Bella Complex. It involves one clean, one shoulder to overhead, a front squat, and then one more shoulder to overhead. And this is done for max load. It is absolutely going to be a crowd pleaser. It'll be electric in here. China, the Bella Complex, what do you see as the keys on this event? Do not rush your movement. Even though you have 20 seconds to perform the lift, once you start, you are going to be able to finish. Also, that second jerk, not only is it dirty, it is going to be rough after doing a clean, an overhead, a squat, making sure that you take the time to catch your breath, get yourself in a solid position before you attempt that lift is going to be super, super important. Matt, you're extremely talented with the barbell. If you had to walk out there, what would be going through your mind to succeed in this event? Uh, having a game plan ahead of time of what weights you're going to hit, you know, how you're, how you're going to space out, you know, the basically, you know, like, like uh, China said, you know, how do you perform that series of repetitions at a pace that you can maintain? And I look at it, and to me, it's those two jerks, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's the whole uh, kit and caboodle of, you know, what's going to limit your, your, your end results. So I would say, <laughs> for me, I'd just be thinking about that last jerk. It's going to be exciting no matter what. Big weight going up soon. Don't go anywhere. Event number two, Bella Complex, coming up next.
The 2021 Rogue Invitational is brought to you by Romwad. Optimize your range of motion with daily mobility routines. U.S. Army. What's your warrior? Visit GoArmy.com to find out. Yeti is built for any and every outdoor adventure. Shop for high-performing and ultra-durable hard coolers, soft coolers, drinkware, and outdoor gear at Yeti.com. Lifting under the lights. There is no better way to close out day one of competition here at the Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas. The Bella Complex up next at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Dread it, run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. The barbells are out here at Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas, as we close out day one of competition at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I am Sean Woodland with Chase Ingram. 
the Bella Complex presented by Ram. That is what is up next, and everyone loves lifting big under the lights, Chase. How often do we say in competition that this is the home run derby version or event in a CrossFit competition, and here we are in a baseball stadium to do such a thing. The thing I love about this Bella Complex is that we've seen it before. It's a mm -hmm. challenge that Rogue put out a few months ago that the world was able to tackle if they chose to do so. So now we get to see it under the big lights with 20 of the world's greatest CrossFit athletes. Overall standings after one event, Jason Hopper on top of the leaderboard, followed by Chandler Smith and Will Morad. These are the lane assignments. This is not the overall standings as Pat Vellner is in first place. And Justin Medeiros is in second. So these, those were your lane assignments. We apologize for the mistake, but there is Andre Uday who is in this first heat. Event number two is the Bella Complex presented by Ram Trucks, built to serve. And let's talk about the complex itself is that it's going to be a clean from the floor. Athletes have any choice. You can squat, split, or power as long as the feet come together and they establish a secure receiving position. Then you do one shoulder to overhead, follow it up with one front squat, and then another shoulder to overhead. And what I love about this is when you have a shorter event totality, right, six known events that we are aware of, is that doing something outside of just a classic one rep max, I feel like is a really good test when you have such a smaller sample size to choose from. And this complex itself, it's going to require technique, it's going to require skill, and it's going to require strength. Ten athletes on the field here. They will have three attempts to establish their one rep max in that complex. And Sam Quant in lane 10 is going to be up first. Quant will opt for that squat clean to start. Push jerk to finish. Now he'll have to do another front squat. And then one more shoulder overhead. Again, at 312. So 312 good for Sam Quant in his opening attempt. And that will move us to Jason Smith. And a lot of it's really just going to come down to that final jerk overhead. And... Obviously, that seems self-exclamatory, but what the idea is that with this first movement, the clean, again, power is the option that Jason's choosing, is a lot of these is just going to take away your explosiveness and your overall strength going into that final shoulder overhead. 275 will count for Jason Smith. And a good predictor of if they're going to finish it, it's not the second front squat. That's really not going to be an issue for any of these athletes that I see, but how clean is that first shoulder to overhead going to be after the first clean? Alexander Caron with 320 pounds on the bar. Now for Caron, he almost has an ability to snatch this if he wanted to for one rep. And Carone will make it. He has the early lead here in this first heat. And what we'll see a lot in this first round is we'll see athletes that are a bit more shaky than you expect based off their overall one rep max or at least listed maxes that they have. And a lot of that has to do with time out of the warm-up area. They've, they've been standing around for probably about 10 to 15 minutes, which is standard for a competition. And you want to make sure as you pick an appropriate weight, because you only have three attempts, to really get re-warmed up, get re-familiarized with the weight of that bar. So often you'll see the second round look way better than the first, although Will Morad looked very good on that attempt. 297, good for Will Morad. He finished 16th at the Rogue Invitational in 2020. Now Heinrich Hapolainen at 317 pounds. This is his first appearance at the Rogue Invitational. 
we say based off their listed maxes, if you just go off their clean and jerk, Hopalainen's listed at 315. He's doing 317 for the complex, so he's probably been hiding his total lifted on the old profile. He said we won't really see anyone have an issue with that third front squat that's really in there to disrupt the athlete's ability to use the legs appropriately for that last jerk. Now Andre Uday will try to match Hapalainen at 317 pounds. Three, Uday, one of those athletes in the first event that struggled a lot on that second round of five rope climbs. And what that's going to affect, is going to affect your overall grip and shoulder stability coming in, but I feel like there's been enough time since that event for them to recover. Nobody should have any residual fatigue from the first event of the day. This looked very good from Uday. Four athletes remaining so far. Everyone has hit his opening attempt. And it's Jason Hopper who won his heat in the opening event but could not hang on for the event win. That went on to go to Pat Vellner. So now 315 pounds for Jason Hopper. The question is, what version of Hopper are we going to get? Are we going to get the Mid-Atlantic one that came out of nowhere and beat some of the biggest names in the sport? Or are we going to get the one from Madison who crumbled under the pressure to the same names in the sport? I think the way he finished his heat in event one should give him some good confidence going into the rest of the weekend. So that lift is no problem for Jason Hopper at 315. And here comes Chandler Smith looking to tie Alexander Carone at 320. <laughs> That's Chandler Smith. He's obviously a fan favorite. You can hear the crowd all the way up from up the booth. But Chandler Smith was just one of those infamous lists of it's not the prettiest thing you've ever seen. But I tell you what, I can't really find just a more just strength gifted athlete than Chandler. And the, the thing that's always been his Achilles heel is the technique. And if you can give that guy even mediocre technique, you're going to see his list go up 20, 30 pounds based off what he's done. But Chandler Smith is definitely one of the athletes that is in contention to win this type of event. Yeah, he just mauled that barbell and relied on pure strength just to get to 320. He is tied for the lead now as Uldis Upniks is at 277 for his opening attempt. You see for Uldis is that power clean ease at the front squat, but the jerk is going to be the the struggle point for him, but you see that in with Olympic lifters. How often do you watch the Olympics where they clean something that looks effortless, yet miss the shoulder overhead? Ben Smith will close out round number one, a guy who kind of made a name for himself before he was crowned fitness on Earth in 2015 for lifting in his garage in front of his parents' refrigerator. I'm just waiting for the refrigerator fat head in the crowd. Not a picture of Ben, <laughs> but just the refrigerator itself. Now, one thing that Ben has is he has strength and he has wonderful technique with the list themselves. 317 is good for Ben Smith. So every man successful on his opening attempt, and we move to round number two. 320 pounds is the mark to beat. And Sam Quant is going to try to best that by seven pounds with his second attempt. And he, he came out pretty heavy based off how it looked on his first attempt. So it's no surprise to only see him go up a few pounds relative to his opening weight. And Quant's still one of the very few guys opting for that push jerk where the feet won't split forward to back. They'll just shoot out to the sides just a little bit. They'll receive it in that power position and come on up. And a lot of that really is opting for that versus a split. They're just more comfortable there. You can potentially lift more weight doing a split jerk, but really when it comes to a complex, it's whatever you're comfortable with. And now Jason Smith at 295 pounds. See Smith's overhead position 
isn't quite as dialed in as you'd like it to be. And some of that has to do with just opting for the push jerk. And so when you split, it actually allows you to get away with a less ideal overhead position as opposed to having your feet side by side in more of a push jerk receiving position. Alexander Corona now trying to reclaim the lead from Sam Quant. 335 pounds on the bar for his second attempt. Now it's getting real. 335 on the bar. This is some big boy weight. Corona is one of those athletes that definitely has the ability to do this. His listed clean and jerk is 355. And this is basically a double clean and jerk when you throw in the front squat and another shoulder overhead. 335 is good for Alexander Carone. He is back in the lead here in this event. And what you see on this second attempt is a weight athletes are about 95% sure <laughs> they're going to they're going to hit with an opportunity to do something a bit more out of reach if they need it. But what you don't want to do is have a big jump from second to third. You'd rather have a bigger jump from first to second. Now, that was a wide attempt at a power clean for Will. You've got to be careful of getting a little too wide when receiving that bar. And the 20-pound jump pays off for Will Moore at 317. Good for him. And we move on to Heinrich Hapolainen, who's going to try to match Alexander Carone at 335 pounds. For Hampelainen, he opened at 317. So that's an 18 pound jump from his opening lift. And that's a lot for a complex. If it was just a clean and jerk, I'd understand that. But man, that's a, that's a big jump. Very nice. Abelina at 335 puts himself in a tie for the lead with Alexander Carone as we are halfway through round two here in the opening heat. Honestly, based off those two athletes, Abelina looked much more in control of the bar than Carone did. Andre Uday 337 to take over the top spot here. And Uday, is, he's got such a strong, clean, very strong legs. Look how quick that front squat is. Nice, tight, quick dip and underneath the bar. So Uday has got strength, but what's going to benefit him is he has a lot of speed on those overhead positions. And he is your new overall leader by two pounds now, 337 pounds. And here's Jason Hopper at 335. 3, 2, 1, lift. Hopper's head at 335. Good first overhead for Hopper. What I like is his knees don't move on the way up. And Hopper has right. that. So now in a three-way tie for second place with Heinrich Hapalainen and Alexander Caron with one lift remaining. Now Chandler Smith, 330 pounds on the bar for him. And sometimes for athletes, like as you get a couple reps in, the weight just naturally tends to <laughs> put you in better My positions. My goodness, what a save on that one. I think mean, somewhere Josh Everett is, is calling it an inadvertent split clean for Chandler Smith. But in the, at the end of the day, as long as he gets the weight up, and I know one of Chandler's deficiencies is some ankle mobilities for him as far as getting into that squat position and sometimes you'll just see the legs have a mind of their own and they, they go wherever they want as far as they get the bar but you know as as a coach looking at that i would like to encourage you not to try a clean like channel it is not recommended 297 on the bar for oldest upniks And he will stabilize that. 
He got knows a bit that of a precarious a... situation, but yeah. able to fight through it. So 297, good for Oopniks. And what he did is he just lost his shoulder position. Those shoulders didn't quite secure up. And what you want to do as you go overhead is shrug those shoulders Three, up to the ears two, to help secure the one, bar. Too many people just try to receive the bar with their hands. they got to really understand is that the shoulders do a lot of the work there. There's 332 for Ben Smith. Ben's got to be careful after that jerk, depending on what the judge is looking for, to secure that a little bit more before he brings it down to the shoulders. Smith has that, and round two is done. And it's Andre Uday who is in the lead with 337 pounds, one lift remaining. Now Sam Quant going three pounds above Uday's lift at 340 for his final attempt. The thing was is Quant only jumped seven pounds from one to two, and now he's jumping 13, going from two to three. But that's the game you play, having to go first, watching everybody go, and now you don't really have a choice if you want to try to get yourself some points in this game. And can't hit and the final jerk. And that's what it's coming down to is, I have no doubt 340 is in there, but the seven pound jump from one to two is one thing, the 13 pound jump from two to three is another. Three, two, one. Now Jason left. Smith at 305. Smith still power cleaning that first rep. Three, now for him, it's going to be able to, he needs to get underneath that bar a bit more on that push jerk, just to make sure he can receive the bar with that locked out elbow go. position. I like how he push jerks the first one, split jerks the second. Again, in a complex, it's whatever is comfortable. Alexander Carone jumping up to 345 okay. pounds. <laughs> okay. Hapalainen has that much on the bar as well. And Jason Hopper, meanwhile, has 350. Three, Uday two, at 352. One, so we'll see if that changes lift. a little bit as we move through. Here's Alexander Carone, 345. Is, this is the go for it weight. This is your third attempt. This is actually when receiving that bar after that first, first push here is really the fifth sneaky movement. Alexander Carone, your new leader, 345 pounds. Good for him. He goes three for three in this event. And now the question is, what are the other athletes going to do after seeing that weight go up? Because just throwing on a pair of ones to be ahead by two pounds is worth the five points. Now Will Morad at 332. Morad had that really low power clean on the first one. Opting for a squat clean there. Now they just have to start the lift before the team is Second attempt now for Morad. There it is. He's got to get a good, good grip on the bar. And Morad just cannot stabilize it. And you saw that rear its head in the first split jerk where he didn't quite lock out the left elbow but was able to save it. 345 for Heinrich Hapalainen looking to tie Alexander Carone here in this heat. Hapalainen, he has a very narrow grip for that jerk position. A lot of times you see athletes spread their hands out further, which uh, it shortens the range of motion. But again, it's whatever's comfortable for you. Havalainen just can't make that final jerk. And it's coming down to the second front squat. I mean, they've already done two lifts, but the legs not having the same amount of power for that second split jerk. 352 now on the bar for Andre Uday. So fast. And that is no problem for Andre Uday as he takes the lead from Alexander Corona and he is fired up. And that just that looked really, 
Good, he had a great front rack position on his cleans and his front squats. And what you notice that he did is he kept a, a pretty full grip the whole way through. Matt Fraser does that a lot. In fact, a lot of Olympic lifters do. And it gives him a more secure receiving position. Did you hear that, Coach B? Receiving position for the clean itself. 350 for Jason Hopper, who decided not to add any weight after watching Andre Uday hit 352. For Hopper, he's got to get a little bit lower on this second jerk. And Hopper will fight through it, and he has it. Or press it out <laughs> because you're as strong as an ox. 350 pounds for Jason Hopper puts him in second place right now in this heat. Andre Uday still your leader, and nobody who's left has anything close to 352 on the barbell. Chandler Smith is up next, 340, hold your breath. Much better. Wow, much better. I can just see the, the mobility issue he has in that front rack position where he just can't get a comfortable high elbow. He has to have that open fingertip grip, right? Different than we saw with Andre Uday. But as we said before, there's really no one stronger than Chandler Smith. What a fight from Chandler Smith wrestling that barbell all the way through the lift and he will make it. An adventurous 340 pounds for Chandler Smith. And he knows, like Chandler knows where his deficiencies are, and it's not strength, it's not power. That's why he gave the little face afterwards. Like, I get it, guys. <laughs> it's not pretty, but it gets the job done. Now Udis Upnik's at 307, making a 10-pound jump from round two. And Upnik's just cannot stabilize that final shoulder to overhead. And what it looks like for him is just more mobility in that overhead receiving position. He can't get in that more vertical bar over that frontal plane position like he needs to. 347 for Ben Smith, his final lift. Now this is that two pound play we were talking about. He's already got a 345 on the bar. And for Ben, it, I said this in the second one, he's almost rushed it a little too much. And I think he has the strength and ability to do that, but you know, Ben knows his body better than anybody. Shoot, he's been doing it for long enough. So if Ben says he can't do it, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in there and trust his his own personal judgment. Andre Uday at 352 pounds will win the heat as he hopes to move him up the overall standings. He will wait and see if that mark will stand, but some very powerful and very talented athletes coming up in the second of two heats, and he looked extremely smooth through all three of his lifts. Big list in heat number one, but we still have some of the strongest athletes left to go, and it all started with Corona. He was setting the pace for these other athletes at 345. And what you see is, watch his hand position. He has that full closed grip when he cleans and front squats. And again, that just allows him to have a bit more stability and strength in that front rack position. We see other athletes have different technique than that. Now, Jason Hopper, 350. We said for him is watch his second rep, or watch his first jerk. He's a little bit shallow dipping underneath. We see a slight press out. So the next rep you would see when he comes back after the front squat, you would, you would suggest drop a little further. But what he does, since he's so strong, is you see that he can't receive it locked without the elbow bend, but he's strong enough to press it out. Uday, this is what you want to see in a barbell complex. Strong legs, quick split, nice, vertical upright position on the front squat, no change of the hand position, fast feet, good lockout, and that's how you get the heaviest lift in heat one. And Kiki Dixon is with Andre Uday. This event, the Bella Complex, was pretty straightforward. How do you approach the simple yet strength-oriented events? I knew I had a 352 for a one-arm clean and jerk, and it's, it's been a while, so I hoped that I could uh, put that up on the complex, and so I was really stoked to hit it. It was definitely exciting. What was this experience for you like on the Rogue Invitational competition floor? It's absolutely unique, and with the big crowd here, it's, it's really incredible. 
So thank you for cheering. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Impressive performance from Andre Uday. 352 pounds. He beats Jason Hopper by two pounds. Alexander Caron will wind up in third in the heat, followed by Chandler Smith and Heinrich Hoppelein. And Ben Smith was hoping to get himself into third place with his final lift at 347 pounds, but unfortunately failed that, so he will wind up in sixth. One heat remains here, and the top men in the overall standings will be on the field. And the battle that is being waged between Pat Vellner and Justin Medeiros will continue in the Bella Complex. Vellner got the best of Medeiros in event number one. When you're trying to do a predictor of who you think will do well in this event, I think you just got to look back to last year's Open, where we had a barbell complex after an, a, a, a Metcon. And, and lifting tired is one thing, and a complex is definitely another. But that one, you know, we had a deadlift, power clean, hang power clean, shoulder overhead. This is very similar to that. And Guy Mahiros, who was in this, who won the snatch in just classic, dramatic, beautiful fashion in this. He should be the front runner. If you look at the open weights, he hit 343 for that complex. The next closest was Travis Mayer at 327. I mean, there's almost a 20 pound difference between the two athletes. And knowing what's already on the board, obviously Guy is in contention to, to win that. But the, the battle between Mulheros and uh, uh, Medeiros and Vellner Obviously, that's exciting to watch. And these are two athletes that are very similar in that category as well as Vellner in the open got 287. So 287 to me, that's a that's a missed lift for the final rep. That's not the max Vellner could have done. And Madero, same thing, 278. So they're very close as far as what they did in 21.4. But if you look at their maxes, Mejeros 390 for a clean and jerk. Adler, Mayer, I mean, Pancheck. You got your top four or five guys strength-wise in this heat. The starting order did not reshuffle after the first event. Now, that means that Justin Medeiros has a bit of an advantage on Pat Vellner as he looks to track him down in the overall standings. Medeiros will lift after Vellner in the order here. So he has the advantage of seeing what Pat is doing first. You look at Medeiros and Vellner's listed one rep maxes. Medeiros is 350, Vellner 355. Now in heat number one, as these weights increase, we're talking about that re-rack after that first jerk as being the, the unforeseen fifth movement in the complex. Just if you <laughs> have a bad re-rack, that can take a lot out of your body when it comes to this, but the complex, again, if you're just seeing this, is going to be a clean, you can power, split, or squat clean the first rep, followed by a shoulder overhead, player's choice, we've seen push jerk and split jerk as the two most popular choices, followed by a front squat, and then another jerk, and it's just, it's going to come down to that fourth movement, that second jerk, no one's, I don't want to say no one, but you will rarely see anybody fail the front squat unless they just can't get past the, the clean. All the athletes basically have their opening weight declared. There's a couple of men who don't yet. Guy Mahieros right now has 357 pounds <laughs> on the barbell for his opening lift. Oh, I hope he hits it just for the celebration that we get from him now. There is Guy, and remember the moment that he had at the CrossFit Games in the one rep max snatch event. I'm pretty sure he just set a cell phone there to be <laughs> maybe going on Instagram Live. If you guys want to watch that, stay here, maybe pull it up on your phone. But the, the thing I loved about Guy is that, I mean, we see this with CrossFitters. They don't have the cleanest technique as you would say an Olympic lifter who spends their whole life doing this, but his lifts at the games this year were 
absolutely beautiful. Cole Sager will kick things off here. 305 pounds on the barbell for him. All right, folks, here we go. Starting with Mr. Cole Sager. So this round one opening weight, everybody should be hitting a weight. The only challenge is going to be, as we said before, is just being cold. It's cool. It's cold. It's cold out there. I know we're in Texas, but the temperature has dropped. The wind has definitely played a factor in how that feels. And they've been standing around for 10 to 15 minutes. So you might have to actually lower your opening weight just a little bit based off how maybe it felt in the warm up area. Here's Travis Mayer at 322 pounds. Three, two, one, lift. Here we go. Still get three attempts like you would normally see at a weightlifting meet, whether it be snatch or clean and jerk. Three twenty-two, no problem for Travis Mayer. Looked very good. Mayer listed at three twenty-seven from the complex from twenty-one point four as a little predictor of how people will do here. Here's Alex Vino. Will open up at three oh five. It's a fun little game to play when you go on a ladder like this. One after the other, what did that person do? What do I think I'm capable of? And as we saw with Quant in heat one is, you know, I need to make sure I pick an opening weight that I for sure can do, but a weight heavy enough that I can have a decent jump to the second set, setting myself up for something pretty big for the third one. No problem for Alex Vigno, 305 on the board for him. Saxon Panchik will be up next. He has 315 pounds on the barbell. Vellner will be after him. Then Justin Madero. Vellner with 317 right now. Madero's with 327. But here's Saxon Panchik at 315 pounds. The thing with athletes like Saxon and Madero is that they're so young, is that they're still getting stronger just by maturing. It doesn't even have to be with weight training itself. And so. You know, so you see a lot of the, the more seasoned athletes and veterans is that they're pretty much tapped about how strong and how big a jumps they'll be on those one rep maxes. But these younger generation of athletes like Saxon and Justin, I mean, like I said, they're just getting started. Now Pat Vellner, his opening lift at 317 pounds. Three, two, one, lift. One thing Vellner is very good at between the two Olympic lifts is the clean and jerk. We saw him represent Canada in the Invitational where he did the clean and jerk with Fakowski who did the snatch portion when they totaled those two weights together. So Vellner is no stranger to big lifts under the bright lights solo on a platform. 317, good for Vellner. Now 327 for Justin Medeiros, the man who currently sits in second place overall. Five points back of Pat Vellner. Big opening lift compared to what we've seen so far. One thing I really love about Justin, his overhead position is so nice, just locked in, secure. He has such great positioning overhead. Bjorgren Carl Gumanson will be up next at 317 pounds. And then it's Gima Heroes after him. BKG is one of those athletes over the last year or two who just seemed to have not all things aligning for him. Just is never hitting on all cylinders, but if he can get back to form where everything's going the right way for him, he is a very dangerous athlete that we don't talk about enough for podium contention. Final jerk for Gumitson, no problem. 317, good for him. And now, Guy Mahieros at 357 pounds. Five pounds better <laughs> than Andre Uday's lift that won him the prior heat. And Guy is calling on the crowd to help him through this opening lift. 357, his first Oh, come on. Slow down just a little bit. 
357 for Mahios. And he still has two lifts to go. We're going to need more plates to the platform of Guy Mahios, please. His only issue was that he was moving too fast. He got super height, and it was more of coming out of the hole on the clean. The barbell was still waving. So he got a little too excited, I would say. I mean, you're already in the lead after the first round. Jukic the same way, just not in the best position coming off that clean. He will get 315 on the board. And Jeffrey Adler will close things out here in round one. He has 337 pounds on the barbell. That would put him in second place here in the heat. Well, until Guy Mahero showed up, Adler was the guy that was the weight guy. Right? He's one of the strongest, if not the, in the field. And then here comes Guy Mahero just a year after the 2020 games. But if there's a lift that Adler wanted to do, it's this complex. He's running on that front squat. And Adler, solid. No problem for Jeffrey Adler, 337. Good for him. And as he puts himself in second place, now with two lifts remaining as we kick off round number two with Cole Sayer at 327 pounds. Now Cole got to lift first, which is good because Three, he had to wait the two, least amount of time one, prior to the lift. event starting. I think the hardest three, lift was the last three, for especially for Adler. Now, now Adler's got one Everybody lift under his belt, so he's back tennis. in the mix. Crowd game behind Cole That's good for he Cole. That first shoulder to overhead. Here goes the front squat. And Sager. 327 good for Cole Sager as he ties Dustin Medeiros for third right now. Travis Mayer at 337. One lift. Travis Mayer for loves the barbell, loves complexes. For a while, last year in the offseason, was chasing that 400-pound clean. I think it was a race between him and Alex Smith and a couple other athletes who's trying to hit that 400-pound clean in the offseason. With that lift, Travis Mayer now in a tie with Jeffrey Adler for second, 337 pounds, good for him. And Alex Vino now at 315 pounds. 315 is an interesting weight. We've had so many 317s so far. And you just wonder if not going at least that or a pound above. And just a 10-pound jump from his opening lift. Vino can't hit the jerk. And his first one looked great. I said, is that's the that's the the sneaky part of that second front squat. First man we've seen so far fail in the second round. Saxon Panchik up now at 337. Saxon also has a narrow grip for that shoulder to overhead. But he has such, again, good overhead positioning, such strong, powerful legs to get the bar where it needs to be. And Saxon Panchik now in a three-way tie for second place with Adler and Travis Mayer after hitting 337 pounds. And now here's Pat Vellner jumping up to 330. 13-pound jump, opened up at 317. Three, two, one, lift. Vellner. He's got a nice flock of seagulls thing going on in his hair. And Velder is good on his second attempt at 330. He's got more in there. I don't know how much he has, but I think for him, it's just keeping his eyes on really what Medeiros looks like on this next lift. Not necessarily how much he does, 
to influence where the jump is going to be, but 342 for Justin Medeiros. It's going to give him some room in that last lift if he hits this. And the overhead position so nice. The speed of the squats there, you can see that re-rack. And that just shows he has more in the tank. When that bar can pop off the shoulders about three or four inches coming out of the hole of that clean and the front squat, you know there's, there's a lot of power left in those legs. And with that, Medeiros is in second place in this heat. 342 pounds, good for him. And take a look at Guy Mahiros, who's got 367 on the bar right now. Bjorben Carl Gumanson second attempt at 330. Good jerk. Good speed on the front squat. So that little press out, your, your BKG's coach is just either a bit more power at the top of the drive of that jerk or drop down one or two more inches. So you can receive that bar without any elbow bend. Now Guy Mahero is just looking to add to his lead, 367. So strong. If you want to see really where the strength lies is watch his legs on the squat. There's barely any movement, any caving in of the knees whatsoever. And there's the, there's the strength part. It wasn't the cleanest lift, but he's still able to press out that weight. 367 pounds for my hero. It's his, he's putting on a show for these fans and looking to lock up an event win here to close out day number one. Lazar Zukic now at 322. Shaky clean on the first round, much better on the second. I'm just going to chalk up the first round of just being cold. And Juke is its second attempt, much better than the first. And his second jerk looked better than the first one. And now Jeffrey Adler is going to maybe try to put a little pressure on Mahiros at 355 pounds to close out round number two. If, if Adler can hit this, it makes it very interesting to see what Guy should actually do for his third attempt. Jeff's second jerk after this front squat. He's going to have to get a little bit lower when he received that, receives that bar. And a little press out on the first one. Much better on the second one. Now with the split, you can either split longer. That'll drop you down as far as the re receiving position or bend those knees a little bit more. 355 puts Adler in second place. As we begin the third and final round, Cole Sager, his last lift at 337 pounds here. It's a big attempt for Sager. 10 pound jump from round two. Talk about something that's at only eight pounds underneath his one rep max clean and jerk. This format is essentially a double without putting the bar down. And the final jerk will not go for Cole Sager. <laughs> Almost had that one, but 327 will be his final score. And Travis Mayer will be up next. 352 for Mayer, looking to move into third place here in this heat. 352 is what we saw Uday lift in heat one. Looking to match that. Mayer making a 15-pound jump. You see that what that re-rack is doing to these athletes when you have that much weight on the bar. Wow, what Mayer a save. able to fight through it. You saw his right arm bend a little bit, but he stabilizes it, and 352 is good for Travis Mayer. Hey, great job, guys. Great job. Now Alex Vino, who chooses to stay right where he was in round number two. He's just trying to get 315 pounds on the board. He failed this earlier. I mean, it's a safe play. I think he definitely has it. But when you're when you're using weights this heavy, which they don't make it look like this heavy, 
one little thing out of position, a half inch either the direction, that bar is coming down. 315 good for Alex Vino. Now Saxon Panchik. Okay. Making a jump up to 355. Good overhead. Quick re rack. And oh. Saxon can't lock that out, so his third and final lift is no good. He'll have to settle for no 337. Way. He's trying to do it again, and he's just out of gas. But 337 pounds for Saxon Panchik as his third and final attempt is no good. I was saying, as long as the lift comes up before. <laughs> The buzzer, you can continue, but if he were to finish that, that would have been <laughs> a miracle. Third and final lift. lift now for Pat Vellner, 342 pounds, looking to move into a tie for fourth with Medeiros. And Vellner nice. will hit that final Very jerk. Very nice. A great result for him at 342 pounds. Well, Justin Medeiros is going to go 10 pounds better than that on his final attempt. 352 for the current fittest man on earth. Now this would be the third 352 that we've had. We have by Andre Uday and Travis Mayer. You see that bar fly up. That nice free rack. Beautiful overhead position. He's still got plenty of power in the legs. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh, that oh, one. But able to save it, and that wow. is big as he moves into a tie for third with Travis Mayer at 352 pounds. And the big part there is if that bar comes down, he's tied with Vellner at 342, so that was a huge save by Medeiros. Bjorven Carl Gumason at 337 pounds. Okay, get more upright on that front squat than we did on the clean. That's much better. He's gonna get that arm locked out. Gumason can't hit the jerk, and he fails his third and final attempt. If you're watching at home, and what to look for is what the second may look like, is watch the first rep. If there's any shakiness in the elbow on the first jerk, you can almost guarantee that, that if they don't change anything, that they're going to have some trouble with the second. And honestly, I think that's a great call. And I was going to say it after the second lift, but there's no need to chance another lift because. He's thrown up the most weight. They've been tough lifts. They haven't been the cleanest lifts that he's done. But he's going to force Adler to make a 12-pound jump just to tie him. Gima Hero is passing on his third and final attempt. He is still the leader at 367 pounds. Lager Jukic up next. Third and final lift here at 330 pounds. Three, two, one, lift. Right there on platform number two. Second attempt now for Zhukic. Final jerk for Zhukic, oh. and he just loses it behind. <laughs> and Gima Heros is doing his best to cheer Lazar through that one, but it just wasn't enough, but a great effort by Jukic there on his final lift. Now Jeffrey Adler, the final man to go here, 360 pounds. He's already in second place. But this lift, while it would be nice to get, is not gonna help his result at all in this event right now. It's an interesting choice of weight. Now watch his right elbow. Stage left if you're touching it on the screen. And a little bend in the first rep, and his second rep is always better. 
Adler hits 360, locks up second place in the event. Guy Mahieros only needed two attempts to win the whole thing at 367 pounds and making that smart choice to just it not expend any more effort. Get the 100 points and move on to tomorrow. I'm curious, based off how that looked, why not try 368? You already had second locked up. Give it a shot. He's a great lifter. He's not really in danger of a possible injury because Adler is such a, a, a nice technical lifter. Give yourself an opportunity for the win. I mean, he already had second locked up with what he hit before. Guy Mahieros and Justin Medeiros really look solid in both of their lifts. This is going to be one of those moments for Justin, maybe at the end of the weekend, that could save him when you're looking at the final. This save on the second attempt a normal human being well can't lift this but would have that would have hit the ground and that save that 10 pound jump that broke the tie between him and Vellner could end up very important when we look at this all said and done but he Maheros 367 on his second attempt and you saw that re-rack was tough the squat is no problem but that overhead position a little pressed out a little bend in the right elbow it wasn't necessary for him to take a third attempt. And being so young, I thought he showed a lot of maturity not going for that third attempt. Here are the results from heat number two. Guy Mahiros wins the heat and the event. Adler will take second in the heat and the event. And then Justin Medeiros, Travis Mayer, and Andre Uday, who is in heat number one, they will all tie for third. And Pat Vellner finishes fifth in the heat with 342 pounds. Let's go down to Kiki Dixon with Guy Mahieros. Guy, you won this event with your second lift and put on one heck of a show. How much of that was for you and how much of that was for the fans? Um, like, when I was at the school, I always watch my... Oh, this the sound. But I always, always watch my, my friends passing the year like in the third uh, trimester and I was like how it feels like to pass in the already in the third like before the year finished so I, I just like feel how it is like in the second lift so it was very nice it's been awesome to be here under the lights of Rogue Invitational with this amazing crowd um, the, ma the energy is massive um, like I always like to lift with a crowd like yelling and yeah, let's go, because like it makes me stronger, you know? I, I receive this energy, so it's pretty awesome. Thanks, Guy. Thank you so much, guys. Guy Mahieros, always fun to watch and becoming a crowd favorite here at the Rogue Invitational. He will win event number two for the men and lock up 100 points in the process more action still to come we're going to take a quick break when we return the women take on the bella complex here at the 2021 rogue invitational
final event of the opening day of competition here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational in Round Rock, Texas on the infield of Dell Diamond. Thanks for being with us today, everybody, and spending your time here. My name is Sean Woodland alongside Chase Ingram. We are set for the second and final event of the day for the women. The overall standings coming into this event. Have Annie Thoris' daughter on top of the overall leaderboard with 100 points. Gabriella Magala finished second in event one. She sits in second place. Tia Toomey, Haley Adams, and Laura Horvath all rounding out the top five. Event number two is presented by Ram Trucks. Built to serve, it is the Bella Complex, a challenge that we have seen before. Oh, Sean, the, the bars at night are anything but light deep in the heart of Texas. As we got the Bella Barbell Complex, one clean anyway, ground to shoulder, squat, split, or power. One shoulder overhead, one front squat, one shoulder to overhead. As we saw on the men's side, it's all going to come down to that last shoulder to overhead movement. Ten women will be on the field here. For more on this event, let's go down to Kiki Dixon. Guys, I spoke with several of the athletes, and the strategy is pretty similar across the board. That first lift is the safety lift something they could get any under under any circumstance. Then you're gonna bump it up a little bit to the expected weight. After that, that's when the fun really begins and the risks start coming. Who you guys have your money on? Ooh, I, I think at the end of this event, you might see Gabriella Magala on top of the leaderboard. That is a real, very real possibility is she has certainly been impressive over the past few months especially given what she did at the CrossFit Games. But 10 women now on the field. Sam Briggs will be one of them. Carrie Pierce will open things up, and then we'll proceed through the order. Carolyn Prevo, who is in lane number one, will be the last athlete to lift. Emma McQuaid is in lane number six. McQuaid comes in. If we look at 21.4 like we did for the men, that barbell complex at the end of the open, she had a 224-pound lift. But Emma Carey, what a performance in event number one. She is one of those athletes I feel like doesn't get enough credit as far as her overall strength is concerned, and I think just because she's so young. Here's Carrie Pierce opening up at 200 pounds. The Kiki report is that this is a weight that's expected. No doubt in my mind, roll out of bed, hit this lift in my sleep. But it's a little bit different. 10, 15 minutes out of the warm-up area. And it's not warm. I know we're in Texas, but it is getting cold outside. And that has a massive impact on how well you move with these Olympic movements. Three, two, Carolyn Prevo one. will be next as they have rearranged the order from what was on our sheet. So Prevo will be next as Danielle Brandon who will be last. So Prevo. No problem with the squat. Opening up at 202 and she will make that. I like Prevo for the complexes. She's one of those, she's just an athlete. And we said that before with her background in all those different sports, is she's just an athlete. And so when you throw a complex at them, they don't have to be the strongest because this is a very gritty Three, style test. Two, one, lift. Sam Briggs up next, opening up at 165 pounds. I know this isn't gonna be Briggs event, but she's gonna get hers. We know it's been something she's worked on over the years that becomes more damage control than anything else, but she's gotten better as the year has gone on with controlling that. But this is gonna be one for Sam to just, you know, get herself a good lift, not overdo it, not get ourselves hurt in an event that we're just trying to keep our head above water on. Three, Jacqueline two, Dahlstrom one, lift. up next. She's gonna open at 205. Final 
short dip on that first shoulder overhead. It's not necessarily a bad thing. 205, no problem for her. And that little dip does is it, it, it adds a bit more to that stretch, stretch reflex. If you think of that stretch reflex being like a basketball bouncing off the floor, that quick little rebound or that recoil of the muscles. And that short dip allows her to have a nice, tight, quick dip position. 227 pounds on the bar okay. for Emma Carey. <laughs> Is he missing the opening clean? Now again, you don't put that weight on the bar unless you've done it with ease in the warm-up area. But as you said before, they've been standing around quite a while. It's a wide grip for her. And I tell you what, we saw something very similar to her doing that at the Granite Games earlier this year in Egan, Minnesota, is that she missed one of her early lifts and then went on a bit of a tear on the next few. Well, she will stick that, making her second attempt count. She is your early leader here in the opening heat. 227 pounds for her opening lift. Maybe that's a little wake up call. Some people use smelling salts, other miss their first clean. Emily Rolf at 195. Rolf, another one of those athletes that have been slowly improving her strength over the years, known more for endurance tall, long-limbed athlete. Usually complexes don't favor that athlete. But the 195 looked like a good starting weight for her. Ariel Lowen in lane four with 220 on the bar. Lowen also at the Granite Games with Emma Carey. That was one of those that on paper not a lot of attention was given to it, but once you saw these athletes compete by the end of the weekend, the women coming out of that division were very strong. Mal O'Brien being one of the other athletes who will be coming up in heat number two. 220 good for Lowen. She moves into second place behind Emma Carey. Where Lowen accidentally PR'd her snatch by 10 pounds because she didn't know what she loaded on her bar. Turi Helgadotter up next, 205 pounds on the barbell for her. Now Turi, definitely she's not the strongest athlete, but she has done a lot of competing on the international scene for Iceland, specifically in Olympic weightlifting. And for her, is that her biggest strength is actually her technique that she has on the lifts. Turi, stand up with it. Final jerk, no problem for Turi. Now for Turi, as we said, it, it strength isn't her strength, and she has to have near flawless technique to hit these lifts. You'll see something as simple as that, 10 pound difference and almost like a light switch turns off. It has to be perfect for Turi. Here's Emma McQuaid at 207. McQuaid, if we're looking at 21.4, that complex we did after 21.3 in the open, earlier this year is McQuaid actually had the third heaviest of all the women here for the road invitation. 207 will count for Emma McQuaid and that leaves Danielle Brandon as the only woman who has yet to lift in the first of these three rounds and Brandon's going to open at 205. Three, two, one, lift. Brandon in the zone and she just a very strong athlete. A lot, her overhead position so good, so strong. Had a little bit of a shoulder thing. She's been working on shooting that up post games. That will bring us to round two, the second of three rounds here in this first of two heats. And it's Back to Kerry Pierce making a 12 pound jump up to 212 pounds. And that second round is the lift that we want to hit. So these are goal weights. And what that means is it's not necessarily a sure thing. These are you know, about 90 percenters. And that 10 percent, it becomes a big 10 percent when you have a complex. And that clean was a little forward. That front squat is actually much better than the clean was. And that shoulder overhead position, obviously we know how strong Carrie Pierce's shoulders are.
And for her, it's just going to come down to the clean. So it's not often you see that being the issue for the athletes. It's usually quite the opposite. Carolyn Crevo is going to jump up 10 pounds. She moves to 212 here on her second attempt. So Pierce has already put up 212. Crevo, you see that narrow grip for an overhead position. And it's going to be harder on the second time around. And you Fighting gotta through press it. Press it out. And she will make it. 212 good for Carolyn Crevo. That's two things that can help her. She can either spread her hands out for the jerk or opt for that split, which will help get around that overhead position for her. Here's Sam Briggs. She adds 15 pounds from her first attempt. She's now at 180. Again, for, for Briggs, we know what her strengths are. And as far as her strengths are concerned is that there's not many people that can match what she does. And to hit the second jerk after a failed attempt by itself is an impressive feat. And Briggs just can't get under it. She fails at 180 pounds. And honestly, for Sam, as you're, you know, you, you don't hit 185, so you're gonna you're gonna have to give that another shot. You have 165 to your name. You got to make sure that you have a little bit of self-preservation going into that third lift. Jacqueline Dahlstrom, her second of three lifts, 215 pounds on the barbell. Dahlstrom has that really nice tight dip. An athlete who had that as well is actually Camille LeBlanc Bassinet. She had a very shallow dip where that bar whipped hard at the bottom, and that really does help get it off the shoulders. Here's Emma Carey, who has added five pounds, now moving up to 232. I said about hand position for a lot of athletes. She has a very wide grip. Look how wide her hands are. Now, that's not unnatural for most Olympic weightlifters. In fact, that's a, that's a very savvy position to be in because it just limits how far that bar has to go overhead. You're going to have a quicker lockout of the elbow, and that looks much better than 227 did. 232 pounds for 17-year-old oh, yeah. Emma Carey. I <laughs> forgot to put that part in there. And it's amazing. It's like she is 17. She's just Three, a child. Two, but she carries one, herself so well for a 17-year-old. If I was out there, I, I mean, heaven forbid anybody sees me when I was 17. <laughs> Def look up the definition of dumpster fire in the dictionary. <laughs> it's a picture of me at 17. Here's Emily Rolf at 205. She's made a 10-pound jump for her from her first attempt. Yes. That's a great lift for Emily Rolf. And that for her is that she dropped much lower than she did on the first one. We've been saying that for a few athletes now. The only thing that she needs to clean up is that back foot. Her back foot laid flat, and that could cause a problem as those weights go up for her next set. Here's Ariel Lowen at 225, trying to stay in second place in Lowen. this heat. Whoa. And we said that re-rack, that re-rack as you get to those upper echelon weights is something that can really screw up your complex. And Lowen has it. Oh. Holding it down for the moms. Turi Helgadotter up next. You oh. see when Turi, when these bars get heavier, she'll actually do a double bounce on the clean. 212 pounds for her. Still looks very good. Nice, strong lockout. She's got to make sure she just keeps her chest up on this front squat. And she is two for two. Strong. Good lift. Not a lot of knees caving in on the squats. No real elbow Three, bend on the lockouts. Two, Just good. One. And now to Emma McQuaid at 217 pounds. 10-pound jump from round one. 
Wade still opting for that power position. Nice, tight, short dip on the split jerk. As her hands come out a little bit after the front squat, it looks very good overhead. It, it, it's the squat, and that's why you see her power the first one, and why that squat's a little shaky on the front squat, front squat position. So overhead, McQuaid is actually much more confident than she is going below parallel. Danielle Brandon to close out the second of three rounds, 217 on the barbell for her as well. See that re-racking of the bar is something that seems to be bothering Danielle Brandon just a little bit. She's making a little bit of a face after the game and after the game. But still a good lift. I mean, she looks strong. She looks comfortable. We see that on that, we see on the third round, just looks like that receiving position is giving her a little bit of fits. Third and final round, and we open with Carrie Pierce, who jumps up eight pounds to 220. It's going to be the clean for Pierce. We saw it, her struggle on the earlier one. But again, the overheads aren't much of an issue for her. Her shoulders are just so strong. She's going to have to really keep those knees out on the front squat. Again, the front squat's better than the clean. That bar is not crashing on her. And 220 is good for Carrie Pierce. This is her final competition as she will retire after the Rogue Invitational. Trying to make it a memorable experience, and that lift will go a long way towards that. And it was supposed to happen at the games this year in Madison, but those athletes that unfortunately had a positive COVID test, and it took, her, took it away from her. So that's why she's here at the Rogue Invitational. Carolyn Prevo, her third and final lift, 217 pounds. That overhead position, again, is the struggle there. Now she is opting for the split that should help. It's not often to see a re-rack and then a make. That bar shot out way far in front, but good effort. And you saw her look to her judge for confirmation that she could continue. She didn't have to start all over again. And now here's Sam Briggs, another attempt at 180 pounds. And here for Briggs, it's just, listen, get a lift in if you want it. You don't really need it. You're, you're, you're going to get what you're going to get as far as placing is concerned. You just got to make sure is that you get out of here unscathed because there are some events waiting in days two and three that will play well to her strong seats. Seven total events here at the Rogue Invitational. We know six of them. We do not know the seventh and final event that awaits on Sunday. And Sam Briggs will make that. And some of that too is like you're going to get 20th no matter what you hit in here, but some of that is confidence leading in. Just because Three, you didn't two, have one, the biggest lift, lift, having a successful one helps. Here's Jacqueline Dahlstrom at 222. Dahlstrom's looked very good over the last two rounds. And I like her over at position. She has a nice quick split. One of those things you look for on the split is also the back leg. Watch the back knee. I'm gonna make sure that bends and allows an athlete to, to brace the bar, a lot like a shock absorber. Emma Carey making another five pound jump, 237 pounds on the bar. Looking at the rest of the field, no one has anything heavier than this on her barbell right now. Jimmy caught that clean very far back on the heel. So that was a good save on the clean. Just have a nice, solid re-rack. Flat foot position on the front squat. Again, she still goes wide. I mean, this is some great, great, just technical lifting from Emma Carey. 237 as she looks to win the opening heat here. And other than a brief struggle with the opening barbell, she was about perfect the rest of the way. Now here's Emily Rolf at 215. Now it was hard for her there as that bar crashed on her pretty hard. That took her out of a good receiving position. We said, watch her back foot. See how it sits flat? Now what that's going to do to her, she should have a better front squat than she did a clean on this. Just because you won't have the bar hit her too hard. But that back leg 
We talked Dahlstrom bending it. If you don't bend the leg, you don't have a lot of room, and usually that bar will shoot out forward because you've locked the back leg. Wow. And Roth is able to <laughs> save it, so 215 is good for her. Now here's Ariel Lone at 230. Now she had a rough re-rack on round two. Better for her third one. She's got to get her good grip on the bar. Get underneath it a bit more on the second attempt. Lowen uh, cannot make that. And a lot of this, Sean, is time under tension. You see some of these athletes move quick because just sitting there with Three, that bar, 230 two, pounds on one, your body, is going to take lift. some energy out of you. There's Terry Helgerdotter, her Anderson, final two, attempt at 220 20. pounds. Decent speed coming out of the hole on that clean. Good receiving position on the jerk. Now she's just got to make sure she stays nice and upright on this front squat. Drive her hips under the bar to support it. And then get nice and low, good bracing. Very nice. 220, good for Turi Helgadotter. She's had a solid day one. Not just that, that'll get you three white, white lights at a weightlifting competition. Something you don't often see in a CrossFit version of, of Olympic lifting. Emma McQuaid jumping up 10 pounds from round two, 227 on the bar for her. Now for her, it's the squat. Overhead, no problem, power clean. It's just this, it's this one front squat. That's been giving her some trouble. It's actually been her best one so far after two rounds. Ooh, and 227. <laughs> that's, the, that's the same face I was making. <laughs> On the board for Emma McQuaid. I, I, I like it when the athletes know what they do. You know. <laughs> you know you got away with one. Now Danielle Brandon to close out this first heat. 227 pounds looking to match Emma McQuaid. That's the first time we've seen Danielle Brandon squat clean the first rep. Now the re-rack to see just a little bit of a grimace. And honestly, it could just be something you just don't enjoy. <laughs> That's perfectly acceptable. Now hers, just, as long as she gets it overhead. Oh. But Danielle Brandon is not able to hit 227 pounds. She will settle for 217. And it's Emma Carey who will win the opening heat Bravo. at 237 pounds. And it looked Good. That's the great part, and that's what you want to see with these young athletes is that not only are they getting stronger, but they're doing it with wonderful technique. And that is that is what you want to see. If you're a new athlete on the sport, look, you're going to get stronger just based off maturing alone. So you might as well just focus on your technique and let nature run its course, right? You're going to get stronger, so don't overdo it. Don't jump. Don't skip steps. Focus on your technique, and, and you know you see Emma Carey, 237 at 17 years old. Well, 237 on the women's side of the competition for a clean and jerk is a weight that not that long ago for the best in the field was really, really good. Uh, if this is the ladder back in 2013 at the CrossFit Games, she wins it by 10 pounds. That's the crazy thing. Let's take one more look here. This is the last lift from Emma McQuaid that she knew she uh, she sneaked one out here. <laughs> she did, right? We said earlier before, is it's the leg strength that's not there, but she has a good power in that dip position. Nice lockout on the first rep. But as you said before, is that what this squat's going to do is take away some of that power for the second one. And watch her, watch her left elbow buckle and then regain it. She looks back and is like. <laughs> Sneak, sneaked one in there <laughs> for that for that second rep. But Emma Carey, see how far back she received that bar? That was a good save, and that usually takes a lot out of your legs. What I loved here is she has a nice wide position, but the elbows are still up enough that you need. But watch this split jerk. Watch her elbows. Good dip, solid lockout. That'll count on any platform. And to do that at 17, as you said, you know, Emma, Emma Carey might get the third most attention of our, our young phenoms coming up between Mal O'Brien and Haley Adams, but she 
is deserving of more attention on the spotlight. And she's deserving of an interview with Kiki Dixon. Emma, the Bella Complex combines several lifts into one. What was your approach for this? Are you training complexes often at home? I do a lot of complexes. Strength used to be my absolute biggest weakness, which makes this moment so special that hard work has paid off. And it's not just my hard work, it's the hard work of my team and my coach, my family. Um, on the 237, I saw my mom jumping up and down in front of me, and I was like, I can't miss this. Uh, so it is just the best feeling to see hard work pay off like this and has me excited for how far I can go. Well done. Back to you guys. Chase, I'm going to guess at 17 years old, you were not that eloquent. <laughs> no. It's like, <laughs> what other things are you going to make me feel bad about? I'm not that eloquent now. What are we talking about at 17? <laughs> I can't even get through a broadcast of stumbling over my words. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with a second and final heat for the women in the Bella Complex here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Stick around, everybody. Time for the second and final heat of the Bella Complex here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational, the second event for the individuals. As they close out day one of competition, we just watched Emma Carey take the first heat with a top lift of 237 pounds. Bella Complex, one clean power split or squat of your choosing, one shoulder ahead followed by a front squat and another shoulder to overhead and the show we got in heat one from Emma Carey. I'm very curious to see how that stacks up with these 10 ladies coming in and one of them is going to be Amanda Barnhart. Now I, I want to see what she does because her actually her one of her biggest weaknesses isn't the clean itself it's actually the technique on the jerk which is hopefully something she's been working on over the last year and a half to two years wow. with Ben Bergeron and comp train. So I'm curious to see that on display here in event number two. But one athlete that I think you may see at the top of the leaderboard at the end of day number one is Gabria Magala. At one of the early CrossFit teens that doesn't really get talked about too much as being some of that generation coming in. Just 23 years old, but she is a very strong athlete and so where she's sitting currently on the leaderboard in second overall i think depending on what she hits here you Very might see nice. her name at the top well katrin david's daughter will be up first and she has 205 pounds on the barbell now if you look at katrin david's daughter if there was a lift she didn't want to come up in this format this is probably the Very one that it's nice. going to be because what Davis Otter is great at is actually snatches. Yeah. Cleans is one of her Three, weaker movements. Two, and then you couple that one, with another front yeah. squat. This is actually going to be a damage control event for Katrin Davis Otter. Katrin 
Now for her, she's good overhead. Again, it's just that front racked squat and clean position. And it's not a bad position. It's just not her strongest move. That one will count for Katherine David Zotter making her third appearance here at the Rogue Invitational. She was fourth the last time this competition was held in person back in 2019 in Columbus, Ohio. And that brings us to Amanda Barnhart opening up at 227 pounds. Barnhart getting underneath it. Barnhart <laughs> just so powerful in the squat. And now that's a much better shoulder to overhead position that we've seen in the past for her. But look how we talked about Justin Medeiros and that bar popping up. She's hopping up out of the bottom of that clean. Now for her, she's got to slow it down just a little bit on those jerks. Christy Aramo O'Connell is next. Her opening lift at 207 pounds. Now what a year she's had. Didn't qualify out of the Granite Games and then dominated in the last chance qualifier, then sitting in a top 10 finish at the CrossFit Games. is Aramo O'Connell, one of those athletes, you never really know what you're gonna get but has been super consistent over the years. Obviously a barbell has been one of her weaker points. She has been working on that. And O'Connell is just another solid athlete in the field. 207 is good for Aramo O'Connell. And out of Mal O'Brien, who's gonna open up at 222 pounds. Here's the thing for Mal O'Brien, she is incredibly strong, but she has some deficiencies in the technique as far as the clean is concerned. You know, we saw Emma Carey with that very strong movement. And what we see from Mal, she has a little hitch above the knee. Now it's not as prominent as it has been in the past. So it looks like she is cleaning that up. The front squat is not gonna be an issue. The overhead itself, again, a little shaky, but that's because it's the first one. It's just on that first clean, yeah, right. see it in the second round, that little bit of a hitch. Here's Gabriella Magala at 215. Magala's a good lifter. She has a lot of experience in this. Three, two, one, lift. Fourth best in the field, 21.4. Fourth heaviest listed clean and jerk. You see that smooth bar path, different than we saw from Mal O'Brien. This is definitely one of those weights for her where it's a sure nice no doubt in my mind. And 215, that's 22 pounds out from what Emma Carey hit. That's well in reach in two more sets. In this first round lift, you know what Emma Carey does? She only jumped five pounds per from her opening lift. Haley Adams, 195 for her first of three attempts. And th this is one of those events for Haley where steel points where you can. And what I mean by that is like, you're, you're probably gonna be in the bottom five just based off your lifts and max versus the other athletes. But can you steal some points? Can you snag five points from Sam Briggs, which she's already done with 195? Can you possibly pass Emily Rolfe's weight and get yourself five or 10 points that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise? Here's Kristen Holta at 207. She's a, another athlete who has been in the sport for quite a while. She has announced her retirement as well. We're trying to get a couple more competitions under her belt before that happens. Making her third appearance here at the Rogue Invitational. And just one of the most consistent athletes that we've seen on the women's side over the past 10 years. One of those athletes that you didn't talk about her until she got on the podium at the end of the weekend. But Holta and O'Connell, to me, are very similar skill set of athletes with Holta has had a little bit more success over the years than O'Connell, but both very, very consistent and always up there in the top 10 and 15. Danny Thorstadter opening up at 210 pounds. Your overall leader after one event, after picking up the win in event number one earlier today. And one thing for Annie is that if she can, if she can clean it, more often than not, she's gonna jerk it. She already has the smile <laughs> over her head before she even got to it. And she said it herself, is like her, her biggest weakness in this movement 
is going to be the clean and the front squat. But if she can get it to the shoulders, more often than not, she's always going to nail that split. Here's Laura Horvath at 235 pounds. Tia Toomey also with 235 pounds on her barbell. She'll lift last. Horvath is very good with a barbell, but one of the best out here is Tia Toomey. Has the second heaviest clean trick in competition, but Laura Horvath very comfortable with the barbell. Now the clean, not so much, but again, that could just be a product of standing ground. Like this event started and she still had five more minutes to wait than the other athletes. And now Tia Toomey to close out round one, trying to match Laura Horvath at 235 pounds. Talking about technique, strength, power. You don't make the Summer Olympics for Australia in weightlifting if you don't have all those. 235 is good for Toomey, so she and Horvath with the two best lifts in round number one. As we move to round number two, three total rounds here in the Bella Complex. Katrin Davidsotter will kick things off as she moves up 10 pounds to 215. Katrin, it's all about the opening clean. The front squat's going to be better than the clean. And that's a lot of just positioning. So you're able to put yourself in a better position just from that front rack position. Get that bar a little bit further back and see how far back it is on our collarbone. Again, overhead, she's so good. 215 is good for Katrin Davis' daughter. Amanda Barnhart up next. Barnhart looking to go two pounds better than Toomey and Horvath at 237. For Barnhart, it's always interesting to watch her lift because I feel like no matter when we've ever seen her, it's been effortless, 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 and then the lights turn. You see her, she's hopping out of the bottom. And there it is. No. That's what we said coming in. It's just the overhead, the jerk has always been an issue for her. It has nothing to do with strength and everything to do with positioning. Oftentimes when it gets a little heavy, she shortens up her split jerk as far as her feet, and then it doesn't allow her to drop underneath the bar enough to get her elbows locked out. Christy Aramo O'Connell, eight pound jump to 215. See that left elbow, a little shaky on the first attempt. She's gonna have less power in the legs on this one. So she needs to, she needs to bend that back leg more and brace a bit better. And that was better. 215 is good for Christy Aramo O'Connell and now Mal O'Brien jumping up to 232. I said last time about the hitch, so watch this bar come up as it gets right above her knees to do almost this little bit of a hitch or a little bit of an extra jerk right there as she does the clean. Now remember that, and then let's see what Gabriella Magala does. And then for Emma Carey, or for Mal O'Brien, she's so strong for just 17. So much power. Wow. She's going to be very dangerous as that hit. Now, I'll say this. It's a little hitch. It used to be very prominent. So she has worked on that. But that's it's something that's tough to get away. Annie Thor's daughter used to do the same thing back when she was in her early years. Gabriella Magala jumping up to 225. You saw the mark to beat earlier. It belongs to Emma Carey at 237 pounds. See that smooth bar path right above the knee, no hitch. It just speeds up from that position. Good upright position on the squat, so she has the strength. Now it's the speed under. And a little shaky in the elbows. I think she, she has more in her. I almost feel like she can be a bit more aggressive on the drive portion of the shoulder overhead. She's being very smooth, which is a good thing, right? Smooth is fast, and that's what we want with Olympic lifting. You don't want to be out of control, but I feel like Gabriella can put a little bit more into the drive portion of that jerk. Haley Adams now at 2.05. 
for Haley. I believe 205 is going to match what Rolf put up. He's already above Sam Briggs, so that'll match. So she's evened up. And, you know, the coach should be doing the math, knowing what was done, what's to come. How can we get you five points that you currently don't have in this position? That's what the coach is trying to work with Haley on this third and final round. Kristen Holta at 217. She looks way better on the second attempt. Now she's warm, right? You get the first one out of the way. Oftentimes, it's actually the first one that's tougher than the second one. Moving very quick, too, limiting how much time. Good fight there. Yeah. She's able to stabilize it. So 217, good for Kristen Holta. Good little save. Bar a little out front. Annie Thorostadter making a 15-pound jump as she goes up to 225. Three, two, one, Annie having one of the more memorable moments we've seen at the games, and I would say in her storied career, aside from that muscle-up in 2009 that we saw in the snatch event, going head-to-head -head with Tia Toomey, and she looks very good on that overhead, and again, it's just it's just the squats and the cleans. Her show overhead is so strong. And that is good for Annie Thoris' daughter. So two lifters remain here in round two, Laura Horvath and Tia Toomey. Horvath with 247 pounds on the bar. This would make her the new leader in the event. It's a big jump, because you know, 235, it looked much different than Tia's 235, but as we said before, that clean actually looked much better than her first round. That's more like it. Laura looked off on the first set, but like we said, she's been standing out here much longer than the other athletes, along with Tia Toomey. And that's the lifting I'm used to seeing from Laura Horvath. Laura Horvath is your new leader at 247. And while she was completing the last part of that complex, the fireworks are going off for Laura Horvath, although we're not done yet. But <laughs> I guess that lift was worthy of something like that. Tia Toomey loaded her bar to 250. And here's the game within the game. It was at that weight. She decided no matter what, I'm going to go into the third round with a lead. And if she can get this, that also means if she gets jumped by Laura, she's going to have to lift less to beat her. And Tia Toomey hits 250. And she takes the lead, and that is a new record on the Bella Complex, hence the fireworks. That makes sense. Records dropping round to round. Third and final round, Tia Toomey, your leader at 250 pounds. Katrin Davis' daughter, meanwhile, at 225, and she's going to dump that after the clean. Still plenty of time for her to make another attempt. Catching a lot like Annie is if she can get it to the shoulders. She has a very good shot of hitting it, but this is at the top end of her ability. Katrin Davis' daughter won't get that to go. She will settle for a final lift of 220 pardon me, 215 pounds. And Chrissy Aramo O'Connell now is up after Amanda Barnhart. Amanda Barnhart, Barnhart went 240. Up. She went up. Now as the last jerk, she's just a little out of control. Secure that rack position. Make sure your position is solid. And what it's going to be, it's, it's her left arm and it's her back right leg. She needs to bend that much more to allow herself to brace that weight. Now it's much better, but if she wants to maximize her strength, which she's not doing, is that she's got to bend that back leg. That is really blunting her ability to put more weight overhead. And she's fully capable of doing it. Chrissy Aramo O'Connell is making some adjustments to her bar. She goes to 217 pounds now for her final lift. Just going up by two from round two. And that's good because that would have, if it, she went with 215, that puts her in a tie with David's daughter. And this is what I was hoping to see a bit more from other athletes is making little pound adjustments to separate from the rest of those that are getting bunched up into these numbers. 217 is good for Aramo O'Connell. 
And now Mal O'Brien at 237. Again, an interesting weight because we've already seen 237. Good. Tough dig. Just can't hit the jerk. This is only a five pound jump from round two, but. Now she can go again, but the effort that she had to use to get out of the hole on that first clean, I mean, that's, it was almost like three reps worth to get out of the bottom. It doesn't look like O'Brien's gonna make another attempt. So she'll settle for 232. Now here's Gabriella Magala at 235. She's made some conservative jumps. It's all looked so good. I say we wanted more out of the drive of that. She's still got more in the tank. And 235 will count for Gabriella Magala. And it's a great lift. I just feel like she was being a bit too conservative, honestly. And with the field that you're playing in, I mean, you, <laughs> when you have Horvast, Toomey's, Barnhart's, like you, you can't be too conserved. Now for Adams, she actually needs to get 215, though she's going for 12, because Rolf got, actually got 215. So he said chasing points. So 12 isn't going to separate herself too much from the other athletes at the bottom. Adams will fight through that. Final jerk to make this count. And Haley Adams will hit it. And that's good for Haley. Kristen Holta at 222, adding five pounds from round number two. Holta has 217 already. Her strength in the legs is there, but it's just getting underneath the bar to be able to receive that locked out, not pressed out. Oh, just can't hit the jerk. And that's where that, that second front squat's in there. You can't do the same thing from first split jerk to second. You have to, you have to put way more into it. Here's Annie Thoris out, her final lift, 235 pounds. Here goes Annie Thor's daughter. Annie Thor's daughter sitting up for 235. For her third Based off of 225, attempt. look like I'm surprised she went 235 with a chance to break the tie with Gabriella, who she's only five points ahead of. So she could have gotten five pounds if she gets this lift. And that smile says that she thinks she's have it. She has it already. And she does indeed. 235 good for Annie Thoris' daughter. There's, there's more there. Now to Laura Horvath, who has 257 pounds on the barbell. Tia Toomey has already loaded her bar to 260. Good. Horvath is another athlete has a great overhead position when it comes to the jerk. She's able to get that bar so far back, secure it with almost the back of the shoulders instead of the front of the shoulders. Now you got to get a good grip. You got to get a good drive. Very 257 nice. is good for Laura Horvath, and that is a new record. <laughs> Fireworks. You don't want to take your finger off that button just yet because we got 260 pounds on the bar for Tia Toomey. Final lift of this event. Okay. Next front squat's going to be huge to determine how much she's got left in that second jerk. And wow. 260, a new record and an event win for Tia Toomey. And maybe the fireworks ran out of ammo. I say, we're going to run out of fireworks <laughs> with this crowd. But it is a record for the Bella Complex for the women. It is an event win. And Tia Toomey will earn 100 points. And she looks to be the overall leader 
heading into day number two, a spot on the leaderboard she is very accustomed to occupying. I thought, I thought Magala had a chance based off what her numbers were. I think she was being very conservative for, for what she did, but I'm not surprised Toomey did what she did. Magala didn't need to win to get into the top position because she was ahead, but I really like what Toomey did there, fighting for it at the end, but I also like Laura not backing off either. Magala and Thor's daughter, I think, were a bit conservative, and if that's the game we're going to play as the weekend, that's that's not the game that these two athletes are playing. If you saw, I mean, we, we talked about last night on Horvath's Instagram, is that she is here to not just be like, hey, you know, I want to be able to do well. Like, she's bringing it this weekend. Well, there are a lot of people over the past couple of years that thought maybe Laura Horvath just didn't have it anymore. She certainly proved those people wrong by finishing second at the games and is continuing to do that here at the Rogue Invitational. Very solid day one for Laura Horvath as she goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the champ here in event number two. Let's take one last look at Tia Toomey's final record-breaking lift here. Just strong overhead. She has one of the highest clean and jerks in live competition that we've seen. And that complex was just 10 pounds less than she's done for a single clean and jerk. And her second lift looked better than the first one. Tia Toomey setting a record, grabbing 100 points and getting another event win. And the two-time Rogue Invitational Champion is with Kiki Dixon. Tia, several lifts combined into one for this event. What's the most challenging aspect of this? Is it time under tension, receiving the jerk, something else? I definitely think a few things play into factor. Obviously, time under tension isn't ideal, but it's, it's probably just staying focused. You're the two-time champ for this event. What do you love most about the Rogue Invitational? Uh, just every year gets better and better. And some fireworks? Yeah, that was really nice. Um, it allowed us to push a little bit, dig, dig, dig a deep bit. Oh, sorry. This is really killing me right now. Dig a bit deeper and, uh, you know, try and work it for those fireworks for sure. Thanks, Tia. That's a wrap for us down here on the floor. It's been a great day down here, guys. Thank you, Kiki, and thank you, Tia Toomey, for once again reminding us just how dominant you truly are. Another event win for her here at the Rogue Invitational. As she looks to defend her title for the second straight time and become the three-time Rogue Invitational champion. But still plenty of competition to go. And there are some women here who look like they're serious about taking her down. I mean, and that's what you want to see. What you want to see is that, we've said it before, is that ultimate power breeds ultimate challengers. And that's what you see with Tia Toomey. And now you have the young athletes in the sport, like the Emma Carey's throwing up 237. After that not being her strength in quotes, Or Horvath looks like a completely different athlete that we've seen over the last three years. I can't wait to see what happens tomorrow. Stick around, the Rogue Iron Game is coming up next. We'll recap the entire day of competition. We'll see you then here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational.
One day down, two to go here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. Thanks for sticking with us, everybody, here on the Rogue Iron Game. I'm Sean Woodland with China Cho. It was an exciting day, number one. Jam-packed with some great events for the Strongmen. We had some exciting moments there, really fun moments that we just saw play out uh, in the Bella Complex. I mean, we ran out of fireworks. We set so many records with the women's heat. Seriously, I mean, being under the lights is unlike any other, and getting to do a strength component in this setting is incredible. It kind of came down to what we thought. That second mm -hmm. jerk was a bit sticky for a lot of people, but so many more people made it than I expected. Yeah, there were a lot of great moments in that event. We'll recap that in just a second, but first let's look at the results for event two for the men. Guy Mahiros only needed two lifts to win event number two and lock up 100 points. His score of 367 pounds beats Jeffrey Adler by seven pounds. And then Justin Medeiros ties Travis Mayer and Andre Houdé, a little bit of a surprise there. They both, they all three get 352 pounds. But Guy Mahieros, I mean, every time that kid touches a barbell, it's like you're watching an instructional video. It's near perfect. Seriously. and. I expected him to do well. Mm -hmm. He had the highest listed clean and jerk at 390. Um, and in an event like this, when all eyes are on you and people thrive in this situation, he is one of those people that the more energy there is, the more the crowd gets into it, the more he's going to lift, which is means the roof doesn't exist. He has no ceiling. He can just keep going forever and ever. He won the event in two attempts. He gets three. He won in two. He was like, all right, cool. I'm going to cheer for all y'all <laughs> to get more, but I already won. Yeah, and, you know, given how energetic he can be, I'm surprised that maybe he didn't try to make, you know, a big lift there just to have a crowd-pleasing moment. To. Didn't need it. Mature decision there. Gets yes. 100 points, and right now he sits uh, in third place overall. Meanwhile, Jeffrey Adler, always great with a barbell. You know, when you have an event in your wheelhouse, you got to do well, and he did, did just that. Absolutely that. No stranger to competition. Three times CrossFit Games competitor. First time at the Rogue Invitational. Knew that this needed to be his moment. Steal some big points, and he did just that. Making it look beautiful effortless textbook. Adler and Mahiros, two guys that I think you expect to do well in an event like that. I thought we that Justin Medeiros would be there, but maybe not finish as highly as he did. That's a great result for him. That was incredible. I honestly, I mean, I obviously expect him to do semi-well, but with the confidence and the poise and the technique, I was blown away. He looked like Man, give me one more month and I'll be challenging Guy for that top spot. It is scary for his competitors that he did so well in the strength event. He continues to improve just 22 years old. And you mentioned ceilings with Guy Mahiros. Mm -hmm. so you got to wonder where the ceiling is with Justin Medeiros. Here are the standings now. After one day of competition, we are through two events uh, on the individual CrossFit side. We have five more remaining. Justin Medeiros by 20 points over Pat Vellner. And Guy Mahieros is only 
five points back of Eleanor. And Heinrich Hapalainen and Jason Hopper just 10 points back of second place. So it's jammed there in spots one through five. But Guillaume Mahiros, do you think he has a legitimate chance here over the next couple of days to maybe push to one of those top two spots? I really think he does. I mean, especially coming into tomorrow, they have the Echo Burner, Echo Burner workout. Um, it's shorter. It's more powerful. He's obviously powerful. So I think that he's going to start off tomorrow in a really good spot. Well, let's go over to the women's side as there were some great moments for them in this event as well. Gima Heroes, of course, providing plenty of, I guess, figurative fireworks on the competition floor. We had literal fireworks out there as record after record got broken as Laura Horvath and Tia Toomey traded it back and forth and Tia Toomey winds up with the event win. 260 pounds, three pounds better than Laura Horvath. Amanda Barnhart at 240 will finish in third, followed by 17-year-old Emma Carey. Wow, was she impressive. And then Gabriella Magala will finish in fifth place. But Tia Toomey and Laura Horvath, I mean, they're picking up right where they left off. Yes, Laura is known for her strength. I mean, she's obviously known for being well round. She's the second fittest woman on earth. And I expected her to do well in this event, and she did just that. Going right before the champ on every single lift isn't easy. You gotta know your limits, but you gotta push the pace, push the envelope a little bit, because you know you have Tia going after you. She pushed herself, she broke the record. You know, there's nothing she could do about it going first. Yeah, third place and then a first place finish for Tia Toomey to close out day number one of competition. And this was her final lift at 360 pounds to give her that event win. And we expected the fireworks. We didn't get them because I think they were just out because they had been fired, I think, three rounds off before that. But here are your overall standings after two events. Tia Toomey, Annie Thoris' daughter, Laura Horvath, and then Gabriella Magala. The three of them tied at 175 points. And these standings look, you know, very familiar, but you look at you know, Annie Thorstadter, here she is again contending for a spot on the podium. Still five events to go, but that's an impressive start. Uh, not only was it an impressive start, she won the first event. She's in the mix, top three in the second event, but then she does every single lift with a freaking smile. She does the clean, smiles, does the jerk, smiles. I mean, if she doesn't make you happy and want to be a part of this community and part of this sport, I don't know what does. Yeah, Laura Horvath, we mentioned her. She's right there. Gabriella Magala right there as well. So this is going to be a fun battle to watch play out here over the next couple of days. Meanwhile, we saw the youngsters on display tonight under the lights. Emma Carey and Mal O'Brien just continue to show why that they have a very bright future in this sport. Absolutely. I know that Emma went in the first heat. She actually missed her first clean, and I got a little bit worried. I was like, oh, man, maybe... maybe Maybe she started too heavy. I don't know what's going to happen. And then every single lift, every attempt got better and better and better. And her jerks were on point. Same with Mal, just jerks on point, looks so poised, looks so confident. I just can't wait to see what they do in the future. Yeah, we had a lot of great moments tonight in that Bella complex. Courtesy of athletes like Mal O'Brien, Laura Horvath, Gima Heroes, and, and Tia Toomey. But one of the most impressive performances that we saw today came in the Strongman competition in their second event, the Sear Ladder. And it was Alexei Novikov who went out and cleared the whole thing in one minute, five seconds. Alexei Novikov from Kiev, Ukraine. He's getting bigger, he's getting stronger, and he's getting smarter. For me, as a main opponent, it's myself. I must be powerful. That is a massive, wow. massive win for Alexei Novikov. And he wow. goes all the way around. Fantastic. up to the lap, he looks strong, and look at that. And he's done it! What an athlete. Jumping to 300 pounds, he'll be our first man to lift 300, and he sticks it. Awesome. You can see why he's the world record holder in 2020. The strongest man in the world with ease. Alexei Novikov, who rules here on World Ultimate Strongman. 
joined on the set now by Dr. Bill Crawford. We saw a lot of highlights there of Alexei Novikov with that dumbbell. He provided another one, 300 pounds with one arm over his head to win event number two. One of the most impressive things I saw all day today. Absolutely. He's, his consistency kept him in the fight, and he's back into the top three here. I did hear that he had a 350-pound dumbbell press and warm-up. 350 and warm up. 350 and warm up. So he came out and really made it happen. <laughs> I mean, that is so absurd, it should be criminal. And <laughs> people who saw the strongman competition for the first time today, they were really uh, treated to a great performance courtesy of Alexei Novikov. But here are the overall standings now uh, after two events. Three events remain tomorrow, and it's Martins Leitzis who is in the lead by two points over Tom Stoltman. Alexei Novikov, courtesy of that great performance in event number two, is also tied for second place with 50 points. Brian Shaw just one point back at JF Corone rounding out the top five. Now Martins Leitzis has not won an event but he has been consistent through two. He is your overall leader. What impressed you about him? Well his consistency obviously but he just doesn't fall back. He doesn't let the other guys get too far ahead of him and then he can stalk him his way back into a position where he can be on the podium or win. And I say this is classic Martins. Tomorrow's events line up really well for him. He's got a really big engine, and these are great events. These are great strongman events for him. And then the other thing is that he holds the record in the Wheel of Pain, so he's going to have a great start with the lead tonight. So this really puts him in the driver's seat. Yeah, and the Wheel of Pain is what kicks off day number two, and you mentioned how good Martins Lietzis has been on that implement. He's faced it two times. He finished first and second. But here's a look at the schedule for Saturday, the final day of competition for the Strongmen at 11 a.m. Central Time. We'll get the Wheel of Pain going. If you've never seen that, you're going to want to tune in. That thing is a treat to watch, one of the, the most impressive pieces of equipment ever built for Strongmen. And then event four, the yoke carry and the overhead log lift medley. That'll be at 2 p.m. And then at 7.50 Central Time, the fifth and final event, the stone over the hitching post. Martins Leitzis looking to protect that lead over those final three events. Who do you think has a chance to catch him tomorrow? Well, uh, Novikov could. Uh, and I think that he's really shown some momentum coming in that last event and knocking it out of the park with a really great dumbbell performance. The Wheel of Pain is going to be really important for him because there's a little bit of a style change for him since the last time that he had a, a good uh, performance on that. So that's going to kind of uh, set the pace for him for the rest of the day. And and I think that overall it's just going to again be consistency. He's great with the uh, yoke and he's a very good stone lifter. What about Tom Stolpen? He was quietly, I think, if you could use that word for him, impressive today as well. Absolutely. I mean, he plays second in the deadlift. He had a he had a you know pretty good performance to keep him in the top in the top of the leaderboard. And also, too, I think everybody knows he's a very good yoke uh, performer, but no one wants to come into the finals against him in the Stones because he is the best stone lifter by performance who's ever lived. Yeah, the defending and current world's strongest man is Tom Stolman. So Martins Leitzis has his work cut out for him tomorrow. Just three events remain for the strongmen, and then we will crown our rogue invitational champion tomorrow night. We have two days left for CrossFit competition, so a lot still needs to be decided and a lot of great moments that will still be had here at Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas. Thank you for joining us, everybody, today. Come back tomorrow. It's going to be even better here at the 2021 Rogue Invitational. For Dr. Bill Crawford, China Cho, Pat Sherwood, Chase Ingram, and Lawrence Chalet, I'm Sean Woodland. We'll see you guys here on day number two of the 2021 Rogue Invitational.